operators in Oregon. It depends how you want to play. If you want to play aggressive, you can take Maru, Ying. Of course, it's not banned, it's Dokkabi, because if some people roam, so you can like call for your team and your open triggers will get info faster. In my opinion, Ose is so good because she is really good on almost every plant on Oregon. It will be so easier to plant with her shields. If you want to play slow, you can just wink as usual the hard witcher like Tamai or Ace. The best pick for me on Oregon would be actually Twitch because people play a lot Fenrir, Goyo, Mira. I think it's a, a good operator to deny all that stuff. All equipment you need on Oregon actually has one set of claymores, flashes, smokes, or grenades. Flash are really, really strong. The MPs, you you have to bring them to open the world. You can flash pit, you can flash top right, you can flash close trophy. It's easy, like, except if they have warden, but it's the game. <laughs> the main spawn is actually pretty fast to enter the map. Spawn uh, street, but watch out, a lot of players are spawn peeking, garage, main door, and master door. If you like attack the basement, for me, two guys need to spawn on main and then go through the master bedroom. Two guys spawn from small tower, so they will work together in pair. One will drone for, for, for his teammate. Easiest spawn, I think, would be to spawn small tower. To get three people rushing into the green window with someone waiting on the kids to put pressure on the on the vert. The last one could uh, cut white or push Zulu to get the cover from server. Those are my first century chips on Oregon. Mm. <laughs> In pack grenade, I'm gonna go for Melusi. Um, Rook. Impact, impact, impact. Goyo. Uh, no, Goyo has no more impacts. <laughs> ah, no, please. Uh... Maestro. Oh, Echo. 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 Uh... Let's go. Ash. Uh, IQ? <laughs> oh, nice. Let's go! Go you? Mm. Uh, Dutch? Uh, Fender? Melusi. <laughs> oh la 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 la. Let's go. No. <laughs> uh, IQ? No, IQ is very early on, maybe. Uh, sledge? <laughs> oh la 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 la. <laughs> J'ai pas de propos là. <laughs> Warden. Oh la 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 la. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go, guys. I was playing a lot on Counter-Strike and I was studying in university and they came to us and said maybe you want to try to compete in our first Moscow tournament of Rainbow Six Siege with your Counter-Strike roster. I met a group of people on DayZ who switched over to Siege and were like, you should get Siege, you should get Siege. I was playing only for, for fun at the beginning and then uh, my friend uh, Blaz and he said, hey, I'm being paid to play Rainbow Six Siege. I was like, no, you're kidding. He sent me the proof and I was like, how? And uh, there is the confinement because of the COVID. So I start playing more uh, Rainbow Six as a, like the co competitive part. And then uh, I played the French League. I was inspired to play in the top level 
when I used to watch uh, the Brazilian league back in the days. There was players like Nesk, Gohan, Astro. These guys motivated me to like buy a PC and just like play Siege on PC. There is not one thing that made me became a, a pro player. It's like a, an everything. The atmosphere, the game as well. Like just everything made me, made me feel like I need to be a pro player. I think my big moment before becoming pro was uh, Challenger League. We beat uh, Mkurs and in Challenger League we beat them. Like that was a big, big, big opponent. And I was so happy to beat them. Like it was really a big, big moment. I wanted so much to be pro at this moment. Uh, I think right now there's a lot of stuff for new players to like training their map knowledge. I think if you want to become a pro these days, you have to watch a lot of VODs. Rewatching and rewatching the same VOD, you're gonna understand like how how the meta is being played. Don't be able to like give in so easily. I was in Challenger League for like five seasons, right? Like I failed a lot. Never stop the grind. Always like uh, watching VODs of pro team, watching your VOD to see your mistakes. Grind the game first of all, get good people around you, always have a good uh, mentality in a team or work ethic. As long as you have like the determination and the passion to carry on, you should always trust your gut and back yourself in those situations. If I remember correctly, it's uh, Skyzu who's telling to Jack to run out because he was uh, playing in uh, the second floor of the big tower. He was just baiting them for, for Jack to run out and uh, he could get both of them, but he got only one. And actually now they're f***ed, like they, they lost a breacher. They have to rotate, so now we have like the advantage. We still have the top and stuff, so... Like we knew that they had like lost one, lost one breacher and we knew that like they like they can't open anything just like they, they opened the main at the beginning with the, the ace. So we knew that they had or like to come on the top or to come like tiny. So like that's why we were waiting there. They just pushed with the Osa, the Osa was like kind of like shit against us since we can't really kill the guy. And I think I, I just shook the, the 1v2. I like I just picked and I should I should not have picked. We choked the map. It's okay. There is like uh, three or uh, three maps remaining. So let's just focus on the next map, and we will talk about it uh, after the match. Mm, like we knew that, like every time on attack, they were like baiting outside with like Brava and stuff like Twitch and stuff like this. So we knew that we just had to wait them and like. We know that we are better in gunfights, so we just wait them and play together like in cross and stuff like this. Yeah, we wanted to make them waste their time. We knew that they love to, to take CC control when they push uh, on border. So I just I was just there wasting time. And then we fall back when we get a kill or, or one minute and stuff. Like if we see like one minute, I just drop from T1, like just to waste time. Ah, I got killed like a... <laughs> 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 the wrong timing. So now they have top, but like we still have C4s. And they have only like 50 minutes, 50 sec. But it's kind of like free for us. Yeah, we just, we just gave them space. I think we, we had the uh, like we had the Valkycam like on the I oh, know we had, yeah we had the Valkycam I think on like office that's why like we we asked him to flank and that's where like we win the round. Yeah, and one one of the reasons why we are uh, leaving top floor is that I can uh, I can flank with Oryx on the hatches, so it's okay if we let them have top floor control. <laughs> yeah, that was part of the like plan at the beginning. We just sounds like we know how they play, we know what to do. Just just do our basic stuff and we will win. He wants it more. These fixtures matter a lot. D2. We don't want too much to do at the moment. They are going to start to open up the floor underneath Oscar and put the pressure on him right now. C4 comes out. He's going to get two. Oh, you know, Benji. They've both been taken out. Oscar 
swings round and catches Toki. And Adi are able to fend them all off one at a time. Finally get that advantage back. A beautiful run out from Jay and I know. Can get this diffuser down. Oh, man. Kino not on the position. He's got to go on this rappel. Flashbang trying to stop. He sends it in. And he oh. kicks him in the face. An insane play from Kino. I have never in four years of Rainbow Six seen a round one by a karate kick. Benja, how long is he going to be able to sit here? Not very long. Groovy gets one. Benja goes for the retake. Reloads. Close and somehow gets a second. Is that three? He's out of footage, but he's got a knife. Oh,这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，这个我听过，
You're getting used to being called like that. I mean, last week was completely different. You just absolutely hated a term, and now you're, I guess, Things change again. quickly in this world, is the way I put it. <laughs> We're kind of vibing with Fresh Bean, I'll be honest. Cool, that's good to hear. Well, I mean, of course, I'd like to hear you guys' thoughts about our standings as well, because as we said, teams can start confirming themselves for that top six. Now, BDS have already locked themselves in due to the fact that Fnatic can no longer overtake them, but also for Secret and Into the Breach, they have an opportunity to, to lock in that top six as well today. Yeah, absolutely. I think most of the fixtures today and we'll come on to them hinge on those bottom three teams losing. If that happens, we'll have a pretty much locked top six. But especially for Secret and ITB, they need to win their games and hope the other games go their way and they can lock in playoffs today. Obviously, for most of the league, they'll still be looking at making those top two. And that second place with Secret, Ents, ITB, Wolves, G2, uh, I'm not going to say for now, but those teams are certainly still in the hunt for second place. It's kind of crazy, though, that Team Secret and Into the Breach are the second team after BDS to be able to lock in their spots. That is not something I imagined before the season started, that's for sure. And it's just, yeah. it goes to show how far EU have taken the step of making the league more even by having smart recruitment and just overall perfecting the rosters that they have and taking in the players they have available to them. Now, if you're wondering why Secret and Interbreach can confirm, but Enz, who's in the middle of those two, can't confirm today, that is because they have an off day today. We'll have a look at our schedule and see what teams are playing. Also, Enz are currently in third, but due to them not playing today, they can drop four spots in total, and that all has to do with the teams that are surrounding them and the teams that are playing. For example, Interbreach and Wild, currently fourth and ninth, and this might be do or die for Wild, even though they did win their game last week. We'll have Fnatic versus Secret after that. Secret, as we said, can confirm top six today but it has to of course maybe also depend on the result that's coming after between bds and virtus pro bds of course already confirmed and they're playing against a currently weakened virtus pro looking to even get some more points maybe from that game our final game of the day will then be g2 versus wolves currently fifth and sixth on the same amount of points but who can jump away further from that middle pack now what game are we looking forward to I always like look forward to the G2 games, but one more, more though for me is Wild into the Breach. I think that Wild has a lot to prove to themselves now. They had a good game in the last play day. Can they do more than that? And also for Into the Breach, do they have the cool and calm within them to actually close out and secure that top spot? All up to both teams to answer. For me, it's that last one. I think that last one of G2 against, uh, against Wolves is two teams that are used to going to events that could knock the other one out of the running for an event. And it's two teams that love hero plays, so I'm expecting loads of them. For our pre-show today, we have a, a segment that I'm really excited about because if you've watched any other kinds of sports, you've maybe seen something like a power ranking before. You have seen our standings, which is where teams currently are, but we have made a power ranking as well for our nine teams where we currently put the teams regarding their performance and how we rate them currently as well. So we've given them a great, like we're school teachers, and we've put them in a specific spot as well. We'll roll up the very bottom three ones, because we'll start from the bottom. We haven't actually seen each other's power rankings. So looking at this, looking at the very bottom, it looks like we have a very similar one, but then I'm seeing Fnatic all the way at the bottom. Fabian, what happened? Yeah, I think Fnatic has been so, so much up and down that I can't rate them any higher. They, they look really great sometimes, but then they look absolutely pathetic others. It's very disappointing to see the up and down because they, I think they have the potential to be much better. But currently, they're just not. You're just a fanatic hater and a G2 shell pass. Of like, course, Fabian, of course. You, know, you think you put, G2 will be, you know, number one, of course. Me and Anna are clearly both quite disappointed in how G2 are performing. Yep. Uh, and you've put them clearly higher than the top, you know, the, the bottom three. That's uh, obvious. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I think I went really low on Virtus Pro, yeah. by the way. What's that score about? What am I doing? I was going to say, because we both graded not lower than like a 5 or a 5.4. You went for a 1.8. Can you explain that? Because the results, the performances for Virtus Pro haven't been that bad. But the results have been that like horrible that they they potentially go into a probably go into open qualifier playoffs yeah. for a team that has won the last two EULs. So for me, power rankings are more about like form and where the teams yeah. are actually mm -hmm. at than where they are in the standings. And I think Virtus Pro at the minute is the team that's in the most trouble. Okay, you've been really harsh on them for that point there, but we'll put in the next three, so spots four to six to see what's going on there as well, because maybe we'll have some changes for each other there. You've already put into the breach low yeah so i think that they have more again i think they have more to grab onto like they are a young team so my expectations on them aren't that much higher than fifth i think that if they achieve anything above that i think that they have overperformed for the position that they're currently in they're a good team yeah sure they're high up on the scoreboard right now but as a team overall 
I think that's where I would rate them. Even if like form and all of that stuff you talk into that, I look at the more whole picture of things, and I just don't think that they're higher than that. Do level. you understand power rankings? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Because that's about rating them on form and where they're at currently, not the whole picture. Yeah, but I you want, realize that, right? I want to rate them as a what I think that they are in the league in comparison to everybody else. Okay. Okay. But you might be wrong. Well, you are wrong. Wow. <laughs> you can think so. There's only one of us who has been relegated. That's what oh, I'll I say. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great to that, yeah. There is a significant difference between your grade for Ents, Fabian, and your grade for Ents Fresh. You've put them way higher. Could you explain why? Yeah, because I think Ents are a, a team in progress um, in terms of that are actually solving their issues. I think they had very, very clear issues. They were bottom of the league, and then the last two or three times we've seen them, they've solved their issues, and they're the only team that beat BDS, and I think that's got to count for something. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that they, again, I put them pretty much next to into the breach, right? And they're developing. That's what I see. Like, I think that they are overperforming and they're doing really good. But should they do this good against the teams that they're played? Should they have beaten BDS? Probably not looking at how BDS have played so far the stage. I just think that, yeah, I'd rate them a little bit lower because I don't think the depth is as high. I will say, I'm seeing quite some similarities between our power rankings. However, I've not seen Inter Breach on ours yet, but I haven't also seen G2 on yours yet, Fabian. We'll roll in the third one to see if maybe... Okay, then we find G2. <laughs> no why, why third? We both, no we both put G2 on seven. Yeah, okay, therefore might be poor, but they're, they're going to activate themselves. We know how they work. They're going to make it to the major one way or another. And they have had rough individual performances that have led to the position that they're in right now, but also those individual performances have kept them at the level they're at at the same time. So I think that if they just shape up their team play a little bit, we all know how much D2 can perform. I'm just waiting for it to happen. I'm gobsmacked. I'm actually gobsmacked. You, you put G2 it. in your top three. The fresh just shaking his head here. What? Yeah, Why are you gobsmacked? So, so look, right, G, G2 are a team that essentially created or was a very early adopter of this matter. You was there, Fabian. Yeah. You know, you won the World Championship, yada, 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 yada. There might be a bit biased. The, yeah, it's a bias for you. But the thing is, is when a team isn't functioning as a team, they're only getting points because individuals can shoot hard. I've not seen a complete team performance out of them yet, so I, 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 can't, I can't have them it, third it, in the power It right will here. come. It will come. And maybe, really? Maybe today's that day. Okay. Maybe you, you dye in your hair red if it doesn't. No, I'm not going to wow. do that. There's not a chance. Okay, so you don't actually believe in G2. No, gotcha. of course not. There we go. I just okay, love well, <laughs> I mean, I knew this was going to lead to at least some kind of discussion on here, but I think when we look at the top two ones of ours, I mean, there's two teams that were missing. There is a lot of similarity in this, but where the main difference lies is the fact that we've graded them very differently. I mean, Fabian, you've given BDS, for example, an 8.5. Yeah. You've given them a 9.5 fresh. That's really good. Yeah, I mean, what's the weakness? They've had one blip. Yeah, they've they, had one blip, but they also rely quite heavily on their individual fragging power. I think that there's more to get from them to get a 10. I don't think you can ever get a 10 from me. 9.5 is pretty much impossible as well to get from me because I need to see basic perfection in everything. Yep. And that's never going to be achievable. Like, I would never even give the all G2 of domination a 10. Yep. There was always room for improvement. The highest we ever achieved was a 9.5. So there's still steps to take. I think that they're definitely on their way there. Give me a few years and give me a few a longer time to look at them and I can probably rate them higher. So here's why I gave them such a high score. The the reason being is that they are, in my opinion, by far and away the best team in the region, right? Yeah. If I look more holistically and I look at if we go to a major, who out of our region right now is going to win it or even get close? Yep. There is only BDS. Yep. No other team in there is getting, in my opinion, even close to a semi-final, right? Sure. And that's why I wanted to put them there because right now they are by far and away the best team in this region. And that's where my entire rating builds on. We're playing best of ones. That's what we have to look at as well. Mm. We cannot know too much from best of ones because the map pool might be different for a best of three. You might get outpicked in, in a best of three. We have no idea what we're going to see further into the future. Yeah, sure. Your ranking might be better now, but at the end of the season, I think that this is is more of a realistic rating. And I think that best of threes is where, for example, teams like G2 will shine. Are you searching for excuses now as to why you put G2 so high? No, or? no, <laughs> definitely not. I mean, look at them as players, look at them as individuals and look at what they have achieved together. They are capable of much more. They just need to wake up and stop caring about other things on the internet and Rainbow Six Siege. Are you talking about G2 again? Yeah. I was talking about BDS. Was no, no, no. I zoned out. I was looking at the numbers and zoned out and he's talking about G2 again. Yeah, you're too... Th I just there love, was... love G2, man. <laughs> yeah. There was a lot of numbers, of course, on the, on the screen that we saw, but one thing that we had in common was Wild not really scoring all to best. They're in our very first game today, of course, going up against Into the Breach as well. So we'll start talking about Wild a little bit more because... 
they're not doing all too hot. That's no secret. But I think because they got their last win last week, which was really good to see, a lot was cleared up for us in the interview as to why things have been so crazy. Yeah, they cleared up a lot with the interview and tab. That, that's for sure. It's just looking at the team overall, they performed kind of to my expectations, at least when I looked at the roster to begin with. But they've had some internal problems that they've kind of had to overcome after listening to Tab in that interview. Yeah, I think that's the thing is, you know, when you're a new roster and you're in that situation where you're picking up people at the last minute, you don't necessarily know where you're at. You don't necessarily know what your identity is going to be as a team. And you've got to find it very fast. In fact, I think we've got a clip from Teb, from the interview, that we can just roll for you that shows that they know this as well. Uh, to be honest, at the moment, we are still like struggling to understand what is our uh, identity, you know? Like, what we should do, what we shouldn't do, what works, what people like, what people don't like. And if we look at this identity thing, what we were told later as well is that they've had three in-game leaders since this team came together, and it's a fresh team. Yep. So having three in-game leaders with obviously very different approaches, we've seen pack pulling game lead, it was very creative and came up with new things. Nello's been around so, so long that he's almost uh, as old as the game in, in his professional career. And that was, in my eyes, quite outdated of a style, pulling an old strats that they played with his old team against his new team or the, the, the team that those players joined. So it's like they had no surprises coming in there. Now we're seeing Teb in game lead, and maybe that is how they will come around. What you want is you want for one team to align under one vision, yeah. right? What we're saying is ultimately they've had in a short period of time to try and align under three different ones. Which like is possible. Now it's under Teb, hopefully it stays with him and they can build from here. It's a bit of trust to process maybe as well, but really exciting to see for Teb as well, a very well performing player within this roster to also be taking up that IGL role. But we're talking about their opponents as well into the breach. They've had an amazing week last week, six points versus G2 and Virtus Pro. And honestly, seeing the growth from this roster from dead last in stage one to six in stage two, and now sitting pretty comfortably in top four. It's amazing. Yeah, I mean, if, if we look at them as a team, they've had good performances, but you guys both put them above G2 and Virtus Pro in the in their power ranking. So maybe they are supposed to win those it's games. It's because they won those games. That's why I put them there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, look, look, we all know that this is a team in progress, yeah. right? This has been a team yeah. in progress for the last 15 months. If you look at timeline-wise, I think they are probably, what, 12, 15 months ahead of like where their opponents wild are. Yeah. They were going through the same trials and tribulations this time last year. They've taken much bigger steps. Like, it's such clear difference mm -hmm. in how they're playing the game versus, versus Wild. It's just night and day difference in my eyes. I think two players on that roster that we've seen shine a lot so far are definitely uh, Azur and Creed, yep. main characters maybe on this roster so far. Yeah, I think we've got a little a little graphic about Creed as well because he's been so important to this ITB roster. So what we're showing here is the results that ITB have had and Creed's is KD. Particularly pay attention to those last two games. They obviously beat Virtus Pro and G2, both top four at six invitational. And look at Creed's scoreline, plus 13, plus five on the KD. He is a player that's a rookie to yeah. this team, a rookie to this league, and he's stepping up in a massive way for them. I mean, he's had a, such a short stint in Tier 2 as well, so this guy yep. has really, like, rocketed his career up. And it's so impressive to see that, like, maybe the three first games were a bit nervy. You never know. I mean, we know him quite well personally, so we understand yep. how he thinks. But just the step up he's made, it's super, super, super impressive. It's like he got one tapped by Shaiko on border through that barricade yeah. on that hit and thought, you know what, I've had enough of this shit and just <laughs> woke up and carried on. Decided to end all the games in his favor. We need to see what kind of map we're going to be playing on as well. So let's roll up the map video and see what map is selected for this best of one. We'll be heading to Clubhouse. Yeah, I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised to see this. I think Wilder operating with a pretty limited map pool being such a new team, I think that's pretty much expected. Kangaroo Kenny to Shrewd Operator, so to take Wild to Clubhouse where they lost 7-1 to Wolves makes a lot of sense. Let's not forget that ITB did show Clubhouse by beating G2 there. However, what's interesting to me really is how impactful the bans can be on this map, yeah. Fabian. Because yep. both me and you saw it, the last time Wild played, they played Monty. Yep. And that was their win condition on attack. I'm wondering whether ITB will ban away the Monty because it is yeah. so impactful on Clubhouse. It, I don't know if it's that impactful. The one where it would be would obviously be for a garage taking yep. a CCTV de defense. But where else? Dirt tunnel Dirt maybe for tunnel, basement? Yeah. But at that point, you can clear it other ways. And if you have to rely on a Monty, you will miss your gun somewhere else. Yeah. I think the map makes sense from Into the Breach because obviously Wild had bad results on it. But yeah, Monty, I don't think, plays that big of, in, of a role into it. Even with Capital, for example. Like, if they just take a garage with Capital and Grimm mm. instead, you kind of don't need the Monty anymore 
on garage takes, which is kind of newish. Yeah. But then again, right. it would be by far the most sensical ban, it, just it's because just with of how much they were lynching onto it last week. Exactly. Yeah. Just because of how clear playstyle they had. Do you two maybe want to take the job of Des and Ace, like cast the game, work over the operator ban phase, maybe? I mean, we probably would do a better job. <laughs> okay. No, uh, no, 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 no. I'm putting you off there. That's not no. a problem. I mean, maybe Des and Ace have heard that. We'll bring them in. Oh, you two are watching us in the meantime. Did oh, you hear that no. comment? They were going to take your job. They're coming after you. Oh, honestly, Anne, just, just. <laughs> I'll tell you what, Fabian, come on, you can come and cast for me. I'll go and stand on Death with Fresh. A little trick to Copenhagen no, sounds please, fantastic. No, please, 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 please. You can do some please, casting. No, please, please, Can I have Tim? So they, they What's worse though, really, you, me or you Fabian, can Jack? Thank you, Tim. So do you want me to get rid of the desk or do you want the desk to come on it? Which one is I it that you want I don't want anything to do with desk. You know what, we'll just it leave it. doesn't matter to me whether I'm there or he's here. Whichever one, I don't want to be with. All right, all right. We'll, leave so it as, we'll leave it as it currently is, because <laughs> I believe, of course, Des and Ace will bring us all the hype this game is going to deserve between Wild and Into the Breach. We'll be heading to Cop House. Thank you, Am. I feel so bad for her being stuck in that room with those two. Like, you could see as soon as she asked the question that she was like, I am full of regret right now. She did not want to carry on that conversation. I think it's ever since they got their combined name, ever since they became Freshbian, oh. it's, it's getting out of hand. I tell you what, Fresh is a total liar, by the way, because I sent him a hoodie out the other day. He's in love with the hoodie, and he's like, you got to tell me you supplied these. I want this for the Fresh Beer merch. So he's fully in. He's bought into these hoodies, trust me. And I'll never remember that one. I'll always be like, you know what? So you wrote it to me, Fresh. I'll remember this forevermore. Anyway, Clubhouse is coming. Let's talk about some Siege. Forget about hoodies and Freshies' debts to me and all the rest of it. This is one of those games, Tim, that we were looking at a bit earlier on, and... Uh, it's a hard one to call in a way. I think on paper, many would look at it and go, oh, ITB, they'll beat Wild, Wild are down the bottom, ITB are climbing up. If not for last week, we wouldn't have seen ITB be at the level where they are. Like the guys mentioned on the desk, six points from last week, and Wild did get that first win. So two teams, you could argue, that have got a little bit of momentum, a little bit of motivation to deliver here. And this could be one of those games that you just really struggle to call. Yeah, I agree. I think they're, they're both teams that are on, on the up. Wild, after getting that result last week, I think are, um, you know, capable of, of getting a win here. For me, the big factor, we spoke about this before we came on, for me, the big factor here is probably Azur and Creed's today, I feel like, for ITB. If, if Wild don't contain them, if they don't put them in a box, I feel like Creed's and, and Azur, especially on Clubhouse, have got a real potential to just run all over them here. Um, I'd like to see those two out in the map when they're on the defence in that second half. On the first half, get them in there quickly. I want drones at their feet. Go in, find any roamers. Let them take space. Let them claim it. Uh, and honestly, I think it could be a rough day for Wild. There's going to be a lot of big gunfights that they need to be winning. Um, but one way or another, what I will say, Des, is what I've always said. If you get two teams, whether they're at the top of the form, the bottom of the form, it doesn't matter. If they're on a similar footing, you're going to have an entertaining, exciting game of Siege. And that's what I feel like we've got in front of us here. Absolutely that, Tim. Absolutely that. And our bands have flown on through, so maybe Fabian could have had a talk about it while we were nattering away about other bits and bobs. But obviously we're touching on here with the Habana going away and the two brow pairing. Sorry, Habana, sorry. Maverick going away. I was thinking about Habana in my head, clearly. Why not? Maverick and the two brow going away together. It's like bread and butter, Tim. You've got to take one away if you get rid of the other it feels here as well. On the other side, though, the most interesting of the bands, no doubt, is going to be that Deimos. Now, we haven't seen tons of Deimos. We've seen certain teams likely to bring him out in certain spots, we've seen entries playing him, we've seen support players playing him. A very much a multi-use case style operator you can afford to bring along here. So more is trying to remove that wild card, dare I say, from the game. And the Solis really needs no big introductions to why she's been banned away. One of the stronger defenders that we have in the game right now. Very good at negating away a lot of information. But it does leave things like the Ying available. And that's exactly what Ken Drew has jumped over to here in round one. And already I'm seeing the lineup, for example, the Grim and the Ying coming in together. That just screams execute base composition. So the goal now for Wild is going to be to disrupt Rub this, get up in their faces, try and remove one of those two key operators just to make it sting less when the execute comes through. We're going to be getting into the action then as we have Teb for the time being just hiding himself out on main stairs. Going to be looking to potentially pop up and spoil the party there. Um, you know, looking at that execute game that you've picked up on there, as I mentioned, I agree with you. The composition, the composition does lean in towards that. 
In fairness, ITB not one of sort of the leading plant teams. Eight in total. Um, so sort of middle of the pack, really. We've got teams um, like Virtus Pro on 12, um, sort of top in the pops. BS as well with 11, lot of plants. Um, 14 for Team Secret. So not necessarily one of the most execute heavy teams, but certainly not one of the least. So no surprise to see that being brought along. Because you say the play is going to be in behind that Ying. I'm not sure how much um, Ying will be utilised on every site on the map. Definitely true. Church and Arsenal um, can be of heavy use. I'm thinking gym and bedroom attacks potentially as well. CCTV and cash may be a little bit less so, um, but we will see how that one develops. Halfway through the round, no kills as of yet, while doing themselves well to keep themselves alive. I really thought we'd see a bit of aggression, maybe from Kanto, maybe coming out from Lolo. Heck, just throw the whole kitchen sink at them and put Teb up on the top floor with those pajamas being used to disrupt and slow things down upstairs. But it has been a turtle setup from Wild. No one playing out around the map. And the worry about that is when a team is good at attacking team, you just open the floodgates there for them to get in there, all five alive, and really make an execute happen. The one thing I remark on is both of these teams are in our bottom three teams for attacking here in the competition. It's not the easiest thing in the world. However, as he's going to drop in and find one, but he might be challenged in two different directions hit him, watching out for the mirror off towards his left, but also the player inside a church, and it's Lolo who's holding down that key position. Yeah, Asa doing well there, getting aggressive and just really taking a, a bit of key ground, getting himself into Moto, just going to prevent a bit of that play inside of Blue. Oh. Nello taking a big Jack risk, stepping the out there, and is going to lose his life for it. Taken down four versus three, Kanto manages to get the trade, 20 seconds left to go, and the gunfights start flying. Des Kanto with a second onto Noah. He has dug his feet in here, and he's having absolutely none of it lower with one of his own and all of a sudden it's Creed all alone 1v3 he's shown us so far in EUL that he's got the ability to do it but down here in church it's going to be too tough and there's going to be the final kill Wild managed to pick up round one and they stood up well to the pressure that ITB had managed to build what was really crazy was I think it looked a little bit I don't want to say elementary because that feels bad, but it was a little bit simple as an attack, I think, overall. The moto drop came in. We had the kitchen drop coming at the same time. The kill that we saw for the kitchen drop was Papal getting a long-range kill with the SMG, sat very happily at the back of Arsenal. Everything else came down to Kanto and Lolo to get things over the line with the two Ps each as well, making life all too easy for them. And I really feel for Nello. I think you'll see it on the replay in a second. That moment, the target blindness is like, God, who do I shoot? And he's jumping between the two targets, trying to catch both. Ends up getting one down before those two kills follow through not too long after. So one of those rounds where Wild didn't really have to look in too many places. It was a, a couple of points they were being pushed from. Kanto had a lot of control off screen that we didn't get to see too much of. But outside of that, they looked very unbothered by that first attack. And ITB are going to have to find a little more sting in the tail if they're going to have any success, I feel. Yeah, and I think I think that went well for Wild from what I was saying as well. You know, you've got to keep a hold of, of Azza and Creed here. They're going to be the two that are really going to do you a lot of damage in terms of man count. And by Wild not playing off into the map, in a way, by having that passive style, they've they've sort of put him in a box because, yeah, you're going to have to drop a hatch now and stand in Moto and as a manager to get a couple of kills, does really well. But it means he can just be close down at distance. They don't have to keep engaging. Whereas, you know, if they play off out on their own, maybe they lose a couple there, don't get anything back for it. And you've got a bit of a different problem then when you're coming down to try and defend sites. So, yeah, really well played from Wild. Um, a nice style. It obviously, they've looked at ITB, looked at their strengths and thought, right, how do we count? of this how do we work against this and it went really well i imagine this round we'll see a few gunfights taking place a bit earlier than the last time around it was a good you know more than two minutes past before we saw the entry come through in that last round because it was a lot of setup and a lot of control given over to the side of itv but here what you tend to see for this side at the very least is that extension out towards cash and cc so i think you'll find there are a couple of players here on the defensive side out that way but I'd expect ITB want to force away in some way, shape, or form. That's what Oscar here is looking to do. Get the wall opened up. Control site, not control site. Control inside a CC, and it stops that west window being used that covers the entirety of the south balcony for gym and bedroom. Make gives less options to the attackers to make use of. And I think like we've already seen in that previous round, ITB didn't want to overcomplicate things. They had one or two angles, and that was enough for them. They're slowly trying to work their way forwards here. They are forcing players back, and Kenny has found the entry. Two entries in two rounds for ITB. But my God, is it all going off? hit him kenny's right in and he's taken over the mirror window could reclaimed it for his own team to make use of and it's all down to pack to really try and make this recovery come through itb smashing the accelerator down to the ground to start this push on forwards and pack like i say has got it all to do here tim right sort of idea but will he find a second main stairs was the right idea but oscar gets the close
Yeah, well prepped there from ITB towards the end of the round. As soon as doing that three versus one, you just see the, the activity drop off, really. The energy's all been expended that they needed to. They've got the kills. Um, but what happened there was ITB saw some space. They saw some space and they took it. Kenny just went in. Opportunity was there. Couple of kills. And all of a sudden, you're completely in control of sight and Pat Bull's having to fight his way back in. So it was good, opportunistic play from ITB. And that, by contrast to the first round for Wild, is where they need to be careful. You can play this passive style, but if you're going to play it and you're going to let RTB play into you, look how quickly they were aggressing onto site there. They didn't feel the need to go near Cash and CCTV. They weren't using the windows. If you're going to play that style, you've got to be prepared and you've got to make sure that everything is like the, the, the you batten down the hatches, everything's nailed down and there's not going to be that opportunity for them to go in and grab some space like that. Losing a couple of gunfights really cost Wild in round two. Did. And now can they get something going here in round three? I think finding yourself in a spot, at least these days on club, I think 3-3 is always the glorious point that you aim for. You tend to assume the downstairs is going to be lost, but you do expect to come out on top on the two upstairs sides. Don't really see too much of bar and stage, admittedly. Occasionally you'll see a team get a little bit creative and bring it out and try something a little bit crazy, but often it doesn't always work out the way that they'd so hope. Either way, out and about around the map here is going to be Lolo, so at least trying to keep things again a bit more extended out. And this is something we didn't see down in the basement, but at least so far on these top floor sites, have seen a bit of work being done around the map. For the most part, I think you're going to see pretty standard defenses, though. You will have Teb here sat inside a catwalk, for example, on the Azami. The Bandit ready to do a little bit of tricking work. All kinds of things here that ITB are going to have to work through. With Azra on the Zofia, though, I can't imagine that Bandit is going to be able to stay in spot for too long. No, you wouldn't um, You wouldn't have hoped so, at least, if you wanted the hard breaches. It can be quite frustrating sometimes oh, when you're on the hard breach and they don't get dealt with. But once again, they're offering ground and Kenny's going in and taking it. But Kanzo says, not this Hello. time. This is the preparation that they needed. Managed to get a couple of kills. But Asa, he comes in with a big double. Des, these two are just absolutely wailing on each other in this game so far. It's ITV's pace, man. They start opening the breach, but it's bait the whole okay, time. They expect the a bandit feature. trick to come on through, and every single player just floods in towards sight all at once. I love the change in pace because it's so hard as a defense to get a read on this kind of play. They're in a three versus one, and Teva's got it all to do, and he's just sat here on catwalk like, guys, what the hell happened? He has got no idea what's been going on because he has been ignored as part of this attack, and ITV really testing that rule if you need to be attacking from two places at once. They say, well, do us just fine. Top red looks like the place to be. And now Tepper's got nothing to bring back off the back of this one, Tim. But ITB a field getting that second attacking round. They're already going to feel like winners after these first three rounds. Yeah, they absolutely are. And again, it's ITB doing the same thing as they did in round one. Seeing a little bit of space, seeing an opportunity and getting in there and taking it. Yes, Kenny lost his life. Kanto got a couple of kills, but the noise and the distraction that it caused was everything that they needed for Azza to step in and find two himself. And that really opened the round up for them. Um, and again, while they need to adapt here, they need to recognize quickly what's going on and they need to make sure that they're not leaving those gaps. You know, how often do you see see uh, a CCTV cache where somebody can just walk up to the top of red. You know, I'd like to go back and see, was there an FNAT on there? I didn't see Kenny get affected by one. Was there a prox alarm? Was there any barb? What was there on red to prevent that push going up red? Was there an operator at the top of red stairs? Nope. You know, yes, Kenny got taken down by Kanto, but he was able to get up and get established. And that created a bit of panic in the defenders, I think. And that's where the gaps came from, because all of a sudden, oh my God, we've got somebody at the top of red stairs. And so, yeah, I feel like Wild, um, you know, they just need to make sure that they're paying attention to those areas. The the defenses so far have, have all been turtled pretty much, um, apart from Jim Bedroom. Yes, they had the extension out, but there's not been any roam game. There's not been anything to mention in that uh, sense. All the gunfights have come down to side. So they've got to make sure it's watertight. Well, even with that, I think it was like, Attackers we did catch the castle at the strip, for example, earlier on, who was out trying to make something happen. I believe it was Lolo, but maybe that was the read that I to be caught as well. Hang on a minute. There's one player on catwalk. There's the bandit on site and someone in construction. And that is it. Guys, we should Attackers rush this. But the way they did it for me was really the special part. It wasn't just that we're going to flood in sight and go for it. It was use a distraction of the breach going off at the same time. But I've kind of half touched on it. It's the up and down pace that keeps the defensive side guessing so much. Can we afford to roam? Are they coming fast? Are they coming slow? Are they bringing the shield in this round? Is it more a guns up star bit of play from them? And Kanto chipping a night passing in front of his eyes there. But again, it looks even here like they're trying to engineer something by the looks of it. And Atta's even found a freebie in towards lounge. Kanto caught asleep here. 
Now suddenly start worrying for them, and they really want to burst in here and try and catch Stella off guard before he can fall back down through this hatch. And they might even get away with it. Forced to drop, had the right idea himself with the free fire, but at least keeps himself alive. Either way, they are down a Roma tip. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is this is kind of what I said in round one, if you remember. They, they played it much more sort of sight based in round one. They had themselves locked down. Um, ITB, yep, yeah, they took the map cleanly, but they couldn't really do too much with it. And Wild won a good round in round one. This time, as you say, they've extended out a little bit Cantonello on that mid floor they've lost a man they've not really burnt much time ITB are already drawn in sight they're already getting hatches open inside the first minute minute 15 uh, so ITB again stepping in and and just Everything they've done so far has been about that recognition of opportunity. You know, where's the space? Where can we challenge people and win fights? Where have we got the advantage? And they've just rushed to it so quickly that it's very difficult for Wild right now to react. And it's it's great play mm -hmm. from RTB on the attack. Pretty horrible because this could be good on your turtle and Ram on the turtle and nothing really happens. And you're like, okay, then maybe you've got to get on the map. You get out in the map and you just almost get your pants rushed off. It's horrible. Now that's got the right sort of idea. I think you're trying to cause a bit of bother here. The castle being relatively dispensable. Mm, maybe one Weebo in the back pocket still not the ideal place for it to be, but he's wasting a little bit of time. But look to him immediately. The ITB are just like, oh, we don't care about you. We're back to thinking about sites again. He's forced to return back in as they suspect the rush might be coming on through. They do get a couple of kills going their way. Zeb also hits the deck. It's down to a two versus two to make it a two versus one and Kenny may even yet be recovered as well this suddenly starts looking very ropey for Lolo forced to drop his way back through kitchen they'll have heard this one but he hits Creed's Creed's on the deck buddy uh, Kenny just one HP here where on earth did buddy come from <laughs> You know what it is? Easter eggs, I think. I've still got an absolute stash of Easter eggs. and They're on the mind, clearly. <laughs> bunny on the ink. Um, oh, bunny on the ink. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Good round there, Tim. <laughs> oh, great stuff. I love to see it. No, boy, look, you know, bunnies aside. Uh, <laughs> ITB, absolutely fantastic attack once again. And as I said, it's about that recognition of opportunity. Where is the space? Where can we single players out? Where can we find those kills? This time it was Kanto. Got him taken off the board quickly, forced Nello back. I like what Nello tried. I said it at the time. Get up, Boyle Pit. There was an opportunity. There was no air jab, no claymore, nothing to stop him. However, it just, again, all feeds into this, uh, you know, this game that we're seeing from ITB where they really know what's going on everywhere. You picked up on it um, for CC. TV cash, you know, they've recognized there's one garage, there's one down in strip, there's, you know, they're off site, we can get in. And again, it's just that great awareness of not just what's going on on site, what's going on all around the map. Um, and again, they were just ready for Nello to come up there. The challenge was there. They knew that they didn't need to fight him because they were going to drop onto site any second. So, yeah, great stuff from ITB, great stuff, bunny included. Bunny included. The best thing is, I got a DM immediately from our observer, Easy, with a picture of him holding up little mini Easter eggs, and he just said, Bunny on the ink. <laughs> Bunny.itv. I love it. Bunny.itv. Hey, you never know, man. I've heard about him. He's a little come play, you know. I've heard he's quite experienced, actually, but I've not heard him before. Oh, he's, you know, you know, yeah, Bunny, he's absolutely packed with experience. We know this. Christ on a bike. Let's get into this round <laughs> five then. Yeah, All right, the then. Back up on, on this top floor, Cash and CC. We spoke about this earlier on about the Rome game that was coming out and our teams Five, all so far ITB have done a really good job of identifying when a lot of these players are away from site and being able to rush them out. out I don't expect ball. you're going to see anywhere near as many players playing off site this time and almost like you said it Tim, Kanto has now found himself back at top red dropping down a couple of those FNATs to provide that assistance if a rush does come through again. Canto just um, again he, he's, he's played this game a couple of times where he's really trying to keep on top of the drones keep himself out of the way um, and, and sort of off the radar it didn't work in the last round Lolo is just going to go for the sneaky trying to avoid the sound cue of the barricade ripping down um, we've seen again you, you picked up on him in round uh, round three it was out in strip didn't really have any impact from there um, and if they're going to play out in the map like this absolutely fine but they've got to get something for it. Kanto himself has got to be careful. He's already been caught out a couple of times in this half. And on the Rome, I mean, really not the end of the world when you're playing um, 
on the Fenrir. Got those gadgets down, got them turned on. The FNATs are loaded and ready in certain spots. And you can watch another with your gun. And it's more about the intel game then that his gadgets bring to the rest of his team. He's also got the bulletproof on side. So he is oozing in information right now, Tim. But not quite enough information for the other side, I guess. As is going to be the first one to fall. He's had a great game so far as well. I was going to say some of his end of round plays have been brilliant. Started at seven and two up until now. And then finally gets shut down. And the sting in the tail, that Capital taken offline. Yeah, and that's a, that's a big one for Wild, really, because in the first four uh, rounds, they've lost the entry battle in three of those four rounds, and it's Azza that's picked it up twice. So to take him straight off the board, really big step for Wild, and it's going to slow ITV down because, uh, you know, we saw him drop the Moto Hatch. We saw him when Kenny uh, got dropped at the top of Red Stairs. We saw it was Azza who came in with the double kill. So he's the one that's been finding those kills and creating that space a lot of the time. Um, so I think Wild definitely going to be a lot more comfortable to stay in position and ITB definitely not as successful here Des when they haven't had that explosive moment no and I really thought they'd try and impact the exothermic off this right hand panel but they've let it go the whole way through and two of them in the back pocket of Nello Teb still have one as well there was more than enough available but I think was very nervous about overexposing themselves I mentioned Kanto earlier on speak of the man and you shall come to life Tim two kills for himself down here inside a garage and how on earth has he got away with that one you're normally dead to rights playing down there when the attackers are coming on through, but they've left at least one of the major panels completely soft, not bother reinforcing it often, so he's been like, okay, well, if they're not going to open it, I'm going to play my back against it. And he's found a couple of kills. Gets a little bit aggressive for the next one, but Oscar is left in a one versus four. Tim, only 25 seconds on the clock. Be a good round to close out there for Wild. Yeah, I think Cantor's having a good day so far. Um, we've seen uh, a couple of moments where he's had those big, um, impactful double kills that have, have kept Wild in this uh, a lot of the way. You know, the one round that they did have in round one was uh, it was Cantor digging his heels in and finding a few uh, from Deep Armoury. And then uh, we've seen him sort of keep him in the fight a couple of times. But this time again, uh, getting around over the line. So Wild, they managed to find themselves 3-2. And honestly, with the way things have gone, it's easy to look at ITB given that the wins they've had have been really quite aggressive straight into sight finding kills you know taking that space that's given to them um, and using it well it's easy to look i think and and have the feeling that itb are running away with this but actually i think wild are doing a really good job to keep themselves in it itb right now will not be an easy team to play against you've got azar on seven and three uh you know going really well supported by oscar as well and they're just getting aggressive and it feels like any mistake is going to be punished and wild uh, you know, sort of fronting up to that really well and could be looking at a 3-3 split, which on Clubhouse is not the end of the world. The attackers do usually have, uh, you know, a lot of joy here. So Wild could well come into the second half, you know, thinking that there's three points available for them. I mean, the big thing I came back to earlier on was really if you're coming away from this 3-3 on the half, you're feeling pretty ecstatic as ITB. It could yet prove to be 4-2 and two if things carry on this way. One thing to really note, of course, is the site that we're coming into here attacking amongst that downstairs. We said it's a little bit difficult, but made it work out the one, so I'll give them that. No reason why they can't do so again, but while showing that confidence and planning on the downstairs, will be the ones looking to course correct from last time around. Bunny is back onto the Ying once again, unsurprisingly, given the success that we saw from it last time around. If nothing else, for a few laughs to come out, and we've got that Capital here once again. Really becoming quite a, a stalwart pick here on Clubhouse for many teams, I'd argue. Bless Kendrew. He is now called Buddy for the rest of this game, and I'm dead serious <laughs> about it. <laughs> Oh, dearie me, I can't wait to speak to him after the game. Um, he would have a clue. He's busy playing the game, Tim. Oh, uh, Kanto is challenged onto Adam Window a couple of times. He's just been a little bit unfortunate with his timings. Um, not able to, to pick anybody up. RTB were definitely ready for the fight that time around, but uh, he will just keep himself in that Tim, position, Tim. try and cause a nuisance. Yes, 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 Des. I've got one for you. A great skin and an elite Easter Bunny Ying. The Candelas are Easter eggs. Honestly... UB, I'll take my commission, 15%. I've got me on the, and it could be called, the name of the elite could be called Bunny on the Ying. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be perfect. As a fun in Lolo. I'll tell you what, every single time it's come around to sniffing out Kanto or Lolo, he's had numbers a few times throughout this game. Really going well on the IQ, giving it a lot of the kills as well, coming from outside the map. Just shows maybe that Wilder overexposing themselves. A point, Nello getting one back, and the man of the moment that the death is simply good not talking about. It's Creed's taken offline.
Yep, Tab is desperately looking for Azza and he's going to find him. Azza gives himself away there. The shots have come through the barricade. He knows there's somebody in billiards. I mean, maybe best case scenario, you think that they were taking shots from, from showers, from bathroom maybe, but really dropping back down there. Oh, you were asking for trouble and Azza got it. Tab managing to find the kill. Four versus three now as Wild again um, are doing a good job to holding on to this one. ITB not finding that same space and this is what I was saying earlier. If Wild can make it watertight, if they can avoid giving them those opportunities, those little cracks to, to work their way in through, then they might have a bit more joy and they certainly are doing now. All right, and they drop as well. Bunny down main. Looking for his danger. Where are they? Trying to look for one to one. Mira, no one's actually here. He's just like, where are you guys? I can't find anyone. He's still got the diffuser in back pocket though and can make good use of that. It's down to a two versus two. Finally gets his man. Found him ratting out inside a moto. And now Teb has returned back down towards site from that exact same place. But do they know this is where the droppers come on through? The Candelas would suggest as much. Spray coming in towards the soft wall, finding absolutely no one. Even he's got no clue what's going on, Tim. Everyone's blind is the only way that I can look at it. We'll find the Candela. Still temporarily flashed out. Another flash comes on through. No, it's still got one more for good measure, if so required, and they've got the mirror window to play behind here, Tim. It's a real hard ask for Tep here, but the fact that we've got yet another round where they're having to fight their way back in towards site just shows that pace at which ITB have been playing, and the 2v1 feels a little bit out of it. Buddy with the close, a 4-2 half. That's a dream for ITB. I don't think of anybody seen. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anybody manage to do as much time and steps in. Uh, Kendrew nearly had his ten thousand steps for the day inside a site. There, <laughs> he was just like wandering round, wandering round. No, nah, there's nobody here. I can't find anybody. Uh, but ITB, as you say, um, again, just managing to get in there and just you know enough pressure, enough pressure, enough pressure um, until there is that opportunity from Wild. There is that little bit of a, a crack that lets them just get their way on in but uh, again wild it was a round that you felt like it was in their hands at a point especially after this they get the 4v3 they've got as taken out and you just feel like yes they can hold on to this but then itb just breaking them down so well I don't know if at that point Kenny was doubting his own sanity or the comms of his teammates to be honest it's like <laughs> guys you said there's someone it's in jail, nobody but here empty. <laughs> he's managed to round himself in towards motor and hide away in there but hey he holds true keeps the faith finds his man Four and two is the dream scoreline for ITB as mentioned. Sure, you can say a five one or a six zero if you really want. Five but I'd say with how things stand, Wild about a couple of rounds, they're definitely deserving that first half. They're really gonna have to buck up their ideas here though, going into this side of things, Tim. And they've got pretty steep pretty steep hill to go climbing here, and ITB are the ones on the defense. All the way down to Church Cade brought along. Going to try and protect those hatches a little bit without the Maverick on side. Uh, just having a quick look through. There is nothing. There's just the Thatcher. Um, so they need to make sure that Nello is staying in the fight here. Just uh, Otherwise, those hatches are going to be staying close. Then it's going to make a very difficult round for them. I like this from Wild. 30 seconds in. Lolo already in Master Bedroom. It looks like he's maybe got... A, I don't know if he's got a bit of intel ahead of him suggesting that there's somebody playing there or whether there's a drone race and then he's just sort of waiting for the drone to catch up um, and feed the information into him. But he's not going to find anybody in logistics. Noah is on catwalk. Lolo yeah, turns and heads in that direction. So I think he is aware of this now. Um, and Wild really need to find the kill onto that bandit. I love the support they've got the player hanging around blue, for example, to make sure lounge stays safe and that the players can, or two that are roaming at least, can dig their way back in. You have to see this pin come through. No, the bandit's there! Oh, was trying to make use of what looked like a punch hole, Tim, to get something done. But Nello, with that assistance coming in, manages to get the close out. Good bit of team play from Wild. Good roaming initially from ITB. But they have lost someone out in that process. That's it. If Nello doesn't get that kill, I think Lowell definitely does through the soft wall. And as I said, they needed to clear that bandit out because that was the uh, the one thing that was really the sort of one hindrance that they had to getting themselves full map control and making sure that they were ready to start that step two of preparing sites for an exit. Execute, which is what they're now going to do. They'll burn through these ex Kairos two by two more than likely, but Oscar will trick them out for the time being. They need to get that Thatcher over there, and they're going to need to use those EMPs to get the kitchen hatch open, and with one minute ten left to go, time could start becoming a factor. 
That's it. And again, immediately, I'm looking at the playstyle coming out from ITB. I know that we've moved past that part of the round, but having three roamers out in the map early on, and Wild were the ones immediately dug in and really trying to play Turtle in round one, just shows a little bit of a, a statement of intent, dare I say. And yes, they've lost one so far. They've still got the C4 and Oscar in back pocket. They're still digging relatively well here. And now all the effort has to turn onto the other side. It's on Wild to orchestrate this attack. They've got one more to KB call left in back pocket. The Pat will save saving for this execute, as well as the Grim, also with those bees in pocket. So they've got things to work with here, Tim, but they've got about 30 seconds in which to do it. Big problem that they've got is that they haven't managed to open Kitchen Hatch. Fantastic KE play from Oscar there, just keeping it closed despite the EMPs coming in. Took out a ton of ex Kairos pellets along the way as well. Go. So now Wild are having to adapt, they're having to flex, they're having to go elsewhere. It looks like a lot of the pressure is going to be coming from Blue and Main Stairs. That's where they're lining up at the minute. And here comes the push, but that's not ideal. Tep finds one, but then closes down Nello. Five seconds left to go. They need to think about a plan. Tep is getting it down, but as are Oscar, they clean up and close out the round. 5-2 ITB. They just look so unbothered for so much of that round, even down in a four versus five when the execute starts coming through. As you say, Tim, we saw, I believe it was, that wasn't Teb, it was someone at the bottom of the book of the main stairs. Everyone else trying to flood their way through blue, but they look so hesitant. Even when it was flooded out by the bees to be guaranteed that it was closed, the double soft walls, the shield they knew that was in Arsenal. There were just so many things staring them down. Like we even had the defenders dug inside of dirt to make use of that angle as well. Just very largely unbothered. The team kill, you'll look at and just think, well, <laughs> it sounds bad. Normally, not to blame the player that's got the team killed. It's their fault. I actually think Nello there knows full well that Teb is going to be swinging around that corner looking for a challenge in towards Arsenal. And, like, why would you run in front of him here when you know that he's stepping in for a bit of a gunfight? I think more that he was looking for his own. And there was a little bit of a mystic there on who was swinging what way. Maybe Nello expected Teb to keep on moving out towards the left, for example, and Nello just stepped in front of him. Uh, one of those moments where you look at and just think, oh, dear, it's all falling to pieces over itself. ITB with a really good convincing first defense, though. As said, Wild of really really got to book their ideas up to him. This is already starting looking like too tall a mountain to climb. Five that sort of team kill happens, there's when you don't get kitchen hatch open and when you've got to rotate and drop blue hatch with 20 seconds left to go and it's all an adaptation, it's all plan B, plan C because, you know, what you clearly wanted to do hasn't worked and you've just had to rotate and, like you said yourself, there was a bit of hesitation there and I think, you know, that's what you then start to see. Somebody think, you know, everybody kind of all thinks at once, right? Somebody's just got to go in here and try and do something and... Unfortunately, everybody goes at once and probably the comms are a little bit chaotic and there's a lot going on and Wild suffering for it. So they need to make sure, um, you know, that the fundamentals are getting done for them, not getting that hatch open. They had the Thatcher on board. I know that it's not, you know, a given, but against the Kaid with that extra lead time, it should be a little bit more possible. The Xkaros pellets do take longer to detonate, so it's still a bit risky, but it was a, it was a big, big moment in the round, really, not getting that hatch open and they need to make sure that they're, they're not having those struggles for the uh, for the future attacks rapid work being done here as well to get themselves going at least opening things up walls opened up f snaps destroyed really good progress at least to start things off from the side of wild but now they're at this sort of pause point where they've ignored all control over towards cash and cc side and i believe we saw someone sat over towards cc ready to poke the head around that window if they're not too careful they're just going straight in though tim they've identified the site is largely empty and pat Bull has got himself inside the bathroom here has also got to work his way inside of site but they've got some of the control they need pat Bull taking out the entry uh, where is everyone? The lights are on, but no one's home. I like this from Wild. This is almost sort of playing ITB at their own game. If you're going to give us the opportunity, we're going to take it. Plant was going down, but they've just had to dip off that for the time being. I think recognising that they don't quite have as much control as they need. They've tried to use the bees to prevent um, anything coming forward. Big nitro, but not from Azza. Not Azza. It's from Creed. He finds himself a double, and that puts the diffuser down cold inside a sight. So what looked like Wild Wild taking ground and an opportunity was actually ITB saying, come on in, come on in. We're going to welcome you with a nitro. Right sort of idea, Lolo here as well, holding on to Lodges, managed to do a good bit of work, but Kanto has stepped up and found himself one as well. This could be on for it, Tim. It's him versus Azza, and Azza, as we've said, has had such a brilliant game, admittedly back in that first half, was where he shone the brightest to begin with. Will it continue into the second? You're finding out now with the swing on around, and yes, he will! Finds Kanto, puts him in the dirt, and ITB move up to match points.
Azo was just going to continue doing that dance there as long as he needed to. Just go and have a little look. As soon as he hears that beeping stop as it was, he was ADS. He was ready for the fight. If he hears it a step or two sooner, he just drops his way back and he just keeps fighting those five seconds at a time to burn down the clock. Kanto really had it all to do there. You know, as we always say, if you're in that 1VX, you've got to put that diffuser down. It takes your gun off the board and it is a big, big risk. So Kanto with little else to do really other than try and bait the fight out but just couldn't win it and itb um yeah again i look at it i'd like to look at that round back a little bit closer because like you said it was a lot of space there um you know for wild and you've got to wonder this i'm sure you know on a on a different play day there's an opportunity where that diffuser does go down and all of a sudden you've got a bit of a different situation but creed's in the nick of time gets that double nitro mm. um, and that really opened the round up for itb so uh you know, they'd welcome them on in, but they had a surprise in store. It was definitely a, a high risk tactic is what I'll call it when you're relying solely on those C4s to get the job done, especially once I think, you know, to give some credit to Wild, they read the situation, they got in, plant was going down, they were like, oh, I've heard a C4 rip through the hatch. There's someone downstairs, bees go downstairs, immediately they're looking for Valk cams because they know that's where the information is coming from. And you even saw it on screen itself when we had Lolo tossing that C4, not Lolo, sorry, when we had them tossing the C4 skyward from below, there was no information, there was no yellow pings, it was very much a right. Where can we put these C4s that are very likely to get a kill? And there are two places that jump to mind. One is going to be against that single reinforced wall that separates the two sites. The second one is on the door way leading towards the west breach where someone will be tucked in and only really exposed to construction door those are the two best places to put it that's where they put the c4s they get a double off the back of it which is the craziest part and they get the close imagine if they hadn't got that double though they've got just a planter instead suddenly it's three players left up coming up against four players all fl flooding their way back up through main stairs and that turns into more of a meat grinder for the side of the attackers but great one one being one out nice ideas from both teams itb still are the ones finding themselves in full control here and come on boys this should have been sorted seconds ago. Creed with the entry onto Pat Ball. It's a nice one to start with. It's also the hard breach gone, Tim. Creed's unflappable there, really, despite the bullets oh, flying yeah. around his head. He stayed for the fight. Nello has not been able to. That is really unfortunate timing for Wild as Nello will drop, but the round will be completed. Four versus three. Uh, Creed's has been taken down. Cantor was there managing to get that trade. Again, a little bit of just tough timing there. If Cantor's a second or two ahead, then maybe Creed's doesn't find his entry, but still definitely winnable for Wild here. They've got uh, the CC window that they can start working from apply a little pressure make it difficult to play from garage teb's working into construction so they've got a couple of angles to work from the real painful thing is there you've lost the entry as your thermite and then the player that's disconnected is your ace that really renders lolo for the most part here completely ineffective like what's he going to disable like bandit batteries for a wall that you can't open congratulations there's no bulletproofs to worry about for example valkyrie cameras like don't make me laugh so really, there's not a whole lot that this team really brings on what they've got left on side. Kanto's got a single flash he can work with and a little bit of vertical play, but that really is all they can bring to the party, unfortunately. ITB up into a 4-2 and looking to close the game 7-2. and two. Yeah, it's really tough, as you say, for Wild there. Um, you know, I'm sure they would have uh, wanted to be fighting for a few more rounds, try and keep themselves in it, but... It's just not worked out that way for them. Azza and Noah will pick up those final kills. ITB, I think, you know, regardless of how things end there, Des, ITB still good for the win for me. Um, you know, they, they were very confident in their play. They took a lot of ground when it was offered to them, um, seized on opportunities that were there, and I've been impressed with ITB overall today. Yeah, me too. I think a lot of the way they've approached it is great. Like on the attacking side, we've heaped absolutely tons of praise on them for the way that they approached that game. Whether it was going slow, then going fast, the rushes, the reading in towards players being off site. Just a really good understanding of the game state, I think. Really good at getting those entries from outside the building. Uh, wild, unfortunately, it's back to the drawing board, even despite that win they had last week. Yeah, it was a tough one for them. I think I, I don't actually dislike the way they played. I think they did the right sorts of things generally. Um, they just came up against an ITB who were on it to do. Just any small sniff of an opportunity, they were in there. Uh, and I think, you know, Wild are a little bit unfortunate in some ways for that. Some work to do, no doubt. And as I'm sure there's plenty of stuff to do on the desk here to talk about this game. So let's throw over to Anne and the guys now.
Thanks so much, Des and Ace. And three points, four into the breach. We've seen them be on a pretty decent streak so far. And as you said in the green room, Fabian, this game played out exactly like you expected. Yeah, there was no surprises whatsoever. I was pretty clear that into the breach would run over wild. It made sense the map for them. Yep. And just that they don't they even won against G2. And if you have that fragging power and you can win against that fragging power, you definitely can pick apart a team that is way weaker that wild is. Yeah, I think the only thing for me, realistically, is I set the expectation, maybe Monty would be a factor. Yeah. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. Mont. Sometimes that just happens, right? And I think you did, you know, set that right with the map uh, being a big factor in that. I think ITB are a team that has been progressing, and yep. this was another challenge for them is we've seen Wild show a bit of substance now, which made Wild a little bit more dangerous than previously thought. And I think ITV just had to come in, put in a professional performance, make very few mistakes, and that's exactly what ITV did. Yeah, and they, they were also kind of smart. They, they did a lot of plays that wouldn't kind of normally make sense, but they had looked through their opponents last mm -hmm. time they played, and they used that as counter work, and it worked. I mean, just look at the CCT rock when the three guys go up red step. Yeah. That's just not something you see every day, unless you know exactly that's what's going to happen. It was really good, well thought out reactions. Yeah. Like obviously that that play was pre planned, but a lot of the other plays were well thought out reactions. Oh yeah, for sure. Based on their assumptions of where Wild would be, yeah. particularly where Night of were attacking. And I think that's one of the things is that when you're against an opponent that has a limited map pool, that is new, that has limited strategy and limited depth, you're able to make those assumptions and then get these plays off quicker and and be more ready for them. Which is good to see. I mean, of course, we saw Into Breach also get that 4-2 attacking split on a map like Clubhouse. That's impressive. It's very impressive, but then when you look at the opponent you went up against, I don't know if it's more of what it should have been. It's just kind of the standard. It's sometimes actually harder to play against these teams that are slightly weaker because they would have to figure something else out than just the conventional gameplay to try to beat you. So it can actually be harder to play teams like Wild just because they have to do something different and you're not mm. prepared for it. And it's just a weird thing to do, maybe. It might be weird, but then also when we saw Wild on their own attacks, they were pretty slow. They were really taking their time and not everything was going right for them. Yeah, I think it, it went a little bit wrong. I think that round obviously into gym where they got baited with the C4s below. I think, again, it's a, it's a team with, they maybe surprised us last week, but it's a team where we, we feel that we've got a good understanding where they're at yep. with their strategical depth, with their map pool and where they're at. And unfortunately, they're a little bit behind pretty much the rest of the league. Yeah, and it's, as you said, with that bait, if you leave a team open space, they drone it and they try to take it, and then all it is is just a bait into C4s. Yeah. That, to me, shows that, well, you know when things are clear and you know how to take them, but you don't know what it actually means that you're taking it. If there's nobody there, he's probably not there for a reason. This game is mathematical. You have the logical positions to be in. If you can count them away and you say, hey, there's not a guy here, there's not a guy here. Mm. Well, if they're not dead, where are they? Well, they were underneath waiting for them. Yeah. To get into some more maths and some more numbers, we said that Into the Breeze can qualify today for the top six. They can confirm that. Uh, they got step one right. They got the three points here. But what else did they need to do? Yeah, that's basically, they did ex exactly what they needed to. They are more or less, it would be a miracle if ITB are not in the playoffs now. But for it to be mathematical, what they are looking for is for Virtus Pro and Fnatic to both lose today. Obviously, uh, Fnatic going up against Secret, Virtus Pro going up against BDS. So it's very likely because if those two teams lose, and obviously Wild have lost, none of those three teams can overtake ITB, and therefore the minimum position they could finish is sixth, which of course would get them into the playoffs. Me neither. Is audio gone for you both? Yeah, we cannot hear anything. Oh, that's great. That's great for us. Well, we have an interview with Noah, and hopefully we can get him up on the screen so that everything is all right. Hi, Noah. How are you doing? How was that game? How do you feel after it? It was uh, it was a fun game. It's always interesting going up against like uh, teams that are a bit lower in the bracket, because just as you said, you never know what they're going to pull out. But um, we went into it like we do every other game. We had our prep, and uh, we just played as a team. It's always a fun game. Yeah, and Clubhouse, obviously, you guys played it in your last play day. You won against G2 on it. Was it a prepared yep. map for it? I'm assuming it was, but uh, a little bit more limited map pool and a lot of counter work that we saw from you. Uh, sorry, say that one more time last time. Was the map a preparation? Because we know that Wild has a bit more limited map pool, and you guys counter them quite a lot in your attacks. Was it the map you guys wanted? 
Well, we were fine with the like two of uh, diff very different maps. We were actually thinking that they were going to ban out Clubhouse from last uh, our last play day against G2. But uh, since they wanted to, it looked like they wanted to take us there. So we just went for it again. We have no audio on answer. Well, I'll keep asking questions. So Noah, yeah. last stage, I was very questioning about you as an individual. I don't know if you've seen that desk segment, but I said, you are playing for your career now. And I think, and this is me praising you, I think you've taken that step up. You've cemented yourself as a player that now belongs here. How does it feel to start so poorly in your career as a, well, tier one player, and now turning it around and showing everybody you do belong here? Well, um, obviously I saw that uh, desk from you as well. I think the, or my start of the career was like, a a lot more than just myself as an individual it, it was about the entirety of like that team that i was in but um after that phase i was obviously really disappointed with myself but learning uh learning a lot more just being like really willing to learn from the teammates that i had and the, the coaches around me uh making sure that like i was fitting into the team wherever i could and uh, just, just taking as much in as i can obviously you lit a fire under me as well after that uh, desk where i was like okay well this is the point where i gotta turn around and uh Thankfully, it worked out. Perfect. And I'm so happy for you. You know, Swedish people, we, we, there are not many of us, but the few that we have left, we need, we need to keep. Do you have anything to say to your fans sure. before we head off? Uh, just thank you guys for supporting us. I hope you guys have seen how much we're, we're really putting in this stage, and I hope you keep, keep supporting us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Noah. Thank you. And that's it. Obviously, he's very happy, and they should be. They played really well. This stage has gone amazing for them. But now that I'm the host, and I have to throw it to the next one. Well, we're heading into a break, but don't go anywhere because we have a game coming up right shortly. to come back to Brazil. Now. The Gimnasio do Ibirapuela is the home to the hammer as we get set to write the next chapter in R6 Esports history. This is the Six Invitational 2024. Vamos para Samba Ruyo!
7M respond. He wanted to find him! He can't finish it! He's no brother! Infinite overtime! It's upon us! And we get it! We get it! This is how legends are created! Is this the moment where we can crown a new champion, a new dynasty to be created? And yes, we will! Yes, we will! cement themselves as one of the greatest of all time. to Europe League. We're just about to get stuck into our second game of the day. That is Fnatic versus Secret. I'm here at Freshburn. We're going to talk about these two teams. And we're going to start about Fnatic because if they let Secret get away with the three points a day, they can no longer overtake Secret. And seeing what has happened with the recent history with Fnatic so far, there's been a few questionable things, so to say. Yeah, they've been very much up and down. Like, very much up and down. Sometimes we see them and they play really, really well and they look like a team that play coordinated and then play together. Then sometimes we see them as a team that just do things on their own completely and it makes absolutely no sense. So it's very much, will we get a good Fnatic today? Or will we get a bottom rating on my power scoreboard, whatever you call it? <laughs> that sort of Fnatic today either. Like, we don't know. Well, we're going to be seeing in a minute. Yeah, I think they've been a little bit head-scratching. In, in fact, I've been asking the question. FNC, what the... 
Say the word, Jack. What I the, love that word. What the fresh is going on what I with expecting. this team? Oh, it was not what I would imagine. I mean, look, they've looked good, but they've also looked back yeah. bad. So I've got four clips I want to show you. Now, the quick clips, so stay with me on these. So we'll roll the very first clip. Play day one, going up against G2. 5v5 scenario, 20 seconds left on the clock. The clock up there isn't right. Leon goes running up main stairs. Why? Who knows? They lose the round. They lose the game because G2 play out the five versus four. Going to the next game against Wolves. They've got a minute left. They're in a 2v5. Leon's doing vert onto the site. What's Jigs doing? He's over in admin office trying to find a kill. This desync is moments of confusion. And I say it, I've said it a few times about Fnatic. I've been pulling my hair out. It's moments like this that cause you to pull your hair out because what is going on? Third clip against Dents. Leon's full sprinting through kitchen on a basement attack. Doesn't know that there's players there. That place hasn't been drowned. This one is perhaps the most criminal of them all. The last game, Monty, top black stairs. The player on black stairs is relying on the T player, you see him at the top of your screen there, to hold his position so he doesn't die to the Monty. What happens? T player runs away. Monty pushes the black stairs, should have been a freebie. Instead, the player on the black stairs, Deepak, there is a freebie. Now, this is what I'm saying where I'm just pulling out my hair and I, when those rounds are going on, I'm just going, what the is going on with this team? I'll say it for you, what the fuck are they doing? It's very simple. They're missing out on some, some of the most basic things. Like these things don't disappear just because you're changing teams or you're making a new team with new players. These things don't disappear. These are basics for team play and they need to be there. Then some of them are obviously individual decisions like Leon pushing up mm -hmm. the stairs. But it seems to me that they are not in control of themselves during these rounds, which also leads to them not being in control of the rounds themselves. That kitchen clip. Why have we not drawn kitchen? No matter what bombsite you're attacking on that map, Kitchen is a key vital yep. po point of all of them. Why is it not drone? So it's very much basics. It's just small mistakes. They fixed those mistakes in those rounds. They actually would have yeah. accumulated more points. It's as simple as that because those were close games. If they fix those mistakes, they're well in the running to be in the top team and go to the major because there's a lot of opportunity in EU League so far. I do agree with the kind of unpredictable from Fnatic. I've given up on predicting for them because you'd expect them, for example, to beat a team like Wolves or Wild. They go and lose to them, but then they also bring G2 to overtime. They beat into the breach. Yep. It's been a bit all over the place. And to be fair, they have a pretty difficult opponent to go up against at the moment because Secret sitting comfortably in second despite having those two losses last week with a very close game against BDS. Yeah. The oh, you go ahead. Oh, It's your team. <laughs> it's my team. Okay, yeah, I it's, it's my team. Yeah, you love it. Yeah, in EU League I don't have actually so wow. maybe it's not my team um chip one to him yeah I know one thing that I do like about Team Secret is that they have improved significantly they've yeah. obviously signed some great players and we can talk about the players that all, they've day. Signed all day long mm -hmm. what's impressed me is actually been the strategical depth the counter strategy the map pool the composure between the players in this team to overcome some adversity even when they lost last week against BDS all the way to overtime it was a close game with G2 realistically that they should have won so if you're Team Secret, you're actually thinking of yourselves right now as a top two, top three team in this league. Oh yeah, without a doubt. They, they should be proud of that because the players they picked up, again, we can talk about it forever, right? Adrian is one of the most up and coming, like complete rookies. Then we have Doom who I know, I know and have looked at for a very long time as one of those up and coming players. He's been going a little bit slower, a little bit more like jumping into heroic and had a little bit of a rough time with them and taking a step up now. They have so many talented players, so many good players. And it's just beautiful to watch them play because they're looking like a team. Currently watching the players, of course, getting ready for their game. We currently we just saw Adrian as well, who to you two talked about already. It's not often that you see a support player having the highest rating of everyone in the league. So that's really exciting for him. But talking about a map for this specific matchup. Now, the only map we haven't seen yet in Europe League is Nighthaven Labs. And we were so close to seeing a Nighthaven Labs, but it's going to clap out. Yeah, Twister's going to be getting a DM from me as soon as uh, we're off this desk because I want to see a Labs. It's the only map we've not seen. Yeah. Clubhouse House. However, actually, I think for both teams, it makes a lot of sense. Secret, we saw them there twice. The first two play days of the season, what actually impressed me was play day one against Ents. Yeah. They came out of the box, they dominated Ents. Play day two against VP, the day after, played Clubhouse, completely different strats. So Secret loved this map. For Fnatic, it's a high preference map that they've not yet shown this stage. And all of the stuff we saw from Secret against Virtus Pro was kind of a lot of counters and just playing into Virtus Pro's playstyle. Mm -hmm. How the hell would they know against Fnatic? Because first of all, Fnatic needs to show which team they are of the day. Yep. And then on top of that, you haven't seen the map before. So there cannot be any counters. Now it's back to basics for Secret. We put those challenges onto them. They've proven time and time again they can clear those. Now it's another one. Well, game's ready. So it's time to bring back our casters. We welcome back Ace and Dez, of course. Guys, how excited are we feeling for this matchup? 
pretty excited for this one, to be fair. I think we've just had a clubhouse that was a bit of a speed run. Is probably the best way I'd put it. So I think seeing the anti being up to me by secret will be quite good fun. So we'll see. I'll just hope for now to get competitive. Otherwise, it's going to feel like a repeat. I'm feeling like there could be a Fnatic resurgence. I'm kind of excited for it. They've got a performance in there somewhere, and I think it might be today. We'll see. We got some hope, maybe some copium for Fnatic here, but at least <laughs> we're getting some more rounds on Clubhouse, and I'm very excited out for that. Please take us away for Fnatic and Team Secret. Thank you very much, Han. It's one of them where I'm looking at this one, and I know we were talking about Secret being Fresh's team. He was in rehearsal the whole time in a Fnatic jersey. He was. Let's not tell anyone about that one, shall we? Don't mention it. It's, it's, all, it's all rubbish for the desk. That's the only way I can think about it. Ooh, right then, here we go. We're going to be heading on to Clubhouse once again. We've just seen a little bit of a washout. Whether it's going to be a sort of longer, harder fought game this time around, we will see. Fnatic really need to start turning up. We know that... The, I, I feel like... I know the roster isn't the same. There's been plenty of changes now, but I look back through Kai, I look back through Rogue, I think about the last 12, 18 months of European play days, and I just feel like we're going through the same patterns with this team, a team that will turn up and have have a couple of bad games and look terrible and then have a couple of great ones and they just never seem to have that consistency that's exactly the problem right i think we all look back to the days of the berlin major and, and just wish that we saw that team coming back to the light again and i remember quite famously they ran around that event saying we aren't scrimming here it's all about the mentality and they really got into their zone now i'm not at all saying they should retire the scrim schedule absolutely not but the sort of things that fresh went through about the mistakes they're making those are things that we caught out when we last cast them a couple of weeks ago and so i'm looking today and just thinking boys we're well into the stage by now you've only really got two or three more chance to make a good swing of this they started out playing well but not quite getting the results and it feels like they've kind of they've reverted they've stepped back and things have looked rougher than ever arguably over the last couple of weeks so i'm hoping to see a different fanatic but coming up against secret <laughs> i tell you what i would not fancy being a team playing against secret when we're not quite playing at our best because they are the current team as we've already said that are blowing away expectations they are right near the top of the table ahead of some very well-known names and this is the team to beat that beat i think i just don't I just don't see it happening being honest with you though tim no, and I mean, it, it goes to show when BDS are playing as well as they are, that Adrian is still, I think, top in four different categories, I think it is at the minute. Um, in terms of EU League, he's uh, top rated. Cost, clutches, plants, all Adrian up there at the top at the minute. Um, mm. The plants, I'm at, the plants will need a review. Um, but yeah, seriously, seriously topping the charts at the minute is is the takeaway from that. Um, you know, and the question for Fnatic is, how are they going to stop him? Because nobody else has been able to so far. Mm, it tells you a lot when Adrian's plants are more than double the entirety of Fnatic combined. That yeah, really yeah. sets the image as to just how stark this contrast may well prove to be. But let's get ourselves underway, though, with round one. Fnatic is starting on the defensive side and... Admittedly, again, what I want to see is some of this roaming. We spoke about this on the last map. Wild, a little bit scared at points. Sat back, turtling in, giving the entire map over to ITB. At least here from Fnatic, we are seeing them get out in the map here, roaming up on this top floor with a couple of players. However, the pressure is coming in thick and fast, Tim. We're barely 10 seconds into the round, and Jigsaw's already been shot at by two separate players. Yeah, and I think that's probably a, a, a good strategy from Team Secret here. You know, Fnatic are on the ropes a little bit, given the last couple of performances. So shall we just take the fight straight to them, let them know they're in a game immediately? I think, yeah, you know, just have a look, make sure they're not on any windows, get yourself into the map quickly. Just really put them under pressure, give them a stress test to kick things off. I agree with it. It's that mentality game as well, you know. I look back against that previous map when Wall did start getting a little bit cheeky about it. Immediately we just saw the pressure building up. But for Fnatic, to give them full credit, Tim, they've wasted a bit of time. They've drawn out some utility, the exothermic being committed, for example, a few drones being thrown in, and they're backed away. Every single player down to sight and alive and can now start off in this second phase, when I imagine at least for some time here, you'll see Secret still trying to drone every corner of the map, make sure there's no one trying to be a rat, and also sniffing out things like these Valkyrie cameras. Yep, doing the work. Uh, Groovy just going to be and you go, taking out that last bit of utility, free up those drones again, and they will now, no doubt, continue on as we get towards the mid round. A couple will be sent down towards site, see exactly what's going on. Get the flank drones set up, make sure you're not going to get hit at by anybody on a, a defensive rotate, and then start getting those hatches, getting the pressure mounting onto site. Fnatic actually have not done terribly. They've only lost that initial bit of health onto Jigsaw. They've got all five left alive, back down on site now, ticking down 
down to a minute 15. So if they can again, you know, I'm looking at they've got impact nades. They've got six of them on side. They should be able to prevent the kitchen hatch for a little while. Just burn as much time as possible here. Big old should on that front, Tim. We all know how chaotic things can get as we get towards the close. Tyrant so far, slipping in that. Right sort of idea that this player on lounge. I think it's Groovy on the other side of him here. He has the right idea. Ready and waiting. And it's just like a bit of a Mexican standoff, just waiting to see what comes through next. But neither side making the first move. Tyrant giving himself away a little bit there. Now imagine wants to try and rejoin his team as best he can. Drops back down through and he's going to be safe. Maybe wants a bit of an assist coming down through Blue. So I was going to say Groovy will move across here and give him a little bit of pressure. And sure enough, there it is. Almost finds two for his trouble as well. I think that's absolutely fine from Tyrant there. He's just burnt another 20, 25 seconds out. And now Secret are going to be forced into one of these sort of last gasp executes. And the kills start coming into match. One for everybody almost on the side of Fnatic. Flawless round. Great finish from them. They took that bit of early damage onto Jigsaw. But other than that, they wasted about a minute, a minute 15 um, before we had Secret confidently inside the building. Building. And then, like I said, I like the play from Tyrant inside a garage. Didn't overcommit to it, but again, took about another 20, 25 seconds away from Grubby, who had to just keep watching that angle because otherwise they'd have lost one or two in blue. That much is for sure. Uh, just really well done. They've really, they a little bit of luck there as Tyrant goes back towards sight. If that's a headshot, poof, you've just lost your man. Um, but still, really, really well played. I like that from Fnatic. Each can be a game of fine margins. Imagine if Jigsaw gets headshot on the construction free fire and a tyrant dies in garage. Suddenly it's a 5v3. It's a very different conversation on site. But I'm with you. You can't really ask for much better round than that as the defenders. I think they've played into perfection with the extra minute and a half, two minutes being wasted on the roam. Tyrant causing a little bit of bother inside a garage. It really was the way to roam. Goes to show it's not always about the kills. Sometimes it's about time as it sets the rest of you up for a very, very good end of round execute. So a strong start then, but now we've got to rotate our way through these top floor sites. Tim, and as we always say, that downstairs tends to be one of the easiest sites to defend on this map. These top floors to are where you're really going to see Fnatic tested because it's not just about a roam game here, it's about an extended hold. They're going out towards Cash and CC, they've got reinforcements down. Normally, you'll see, sheet, you'll see shields go down, but Jex has still got his in back pocket, at least for now. So, really, what we're going to have to see Secret do is get that control of the east side of the map first and then work their way across. And teams that are really good at attacking into this side of the map are also very good at punishing those that over stay in cash cc too long so it's going to be a test for the defenders here on how long they overstay their welcome Drones will continue on through for Secret as Savage makes his way up. There you go. Pay attention to the frost mats. Uh, they are easily missed. Oh, um, especially when you... Uh, I know all about that. I'm a nightmare for going. I'm a magnet for frost mats. But especially when you're going up somewhere like Catwalk, you're going to be watching out towards Cash. They've got those holes open at the bottom and you're thinking, hmm, I don't want to get challenged from there. So it is easy to miss them. But uh, good progress so far from Secret. They've got themselves into CCTV. They're going to start opening uh, that Cash wall. That's going to force the defenders back even further. Fnatic at the minute still quite aggressively holding on to this up here with Tyrant playing those keeper barricades to keep himself in position. They've tried their best to impact trip the hell out of this as well, but haven't quite got away with it. But this point, he will now be forced to move away. Leon finds one straight into a trade. Adrian to a second, the top red as well. And this is what I mean, Tim. There is a such thing as overstaying your welcome. And so far, they've been made to pay the price, losing themselves two players out on the road. Half the round Running gone, back. make it a third as Miracle hits the cross shot there. Wasn't the man on the screen, Adrian, getting that kill. But suddenly, things look very, very ropey for the side of Fnatic. Half the round to play, and they're in a two versus four. Yeah, I think you're right there, Des. We saw Tyrant on the... Um, as army really trying everything to keep in there when that wall is breached into cash you gotta go i know you don't want to give so much time over to secret but you've got to waste it elsewhere adrian's gonna get in he's gonna be planting again um, you know just looking for more and more of those he's likely to stick it nitro goes out not gonna catch it's man diffuser is successful and deepak all to do now he's fighting from underneath but as soon as he comes up these stairs you know it's gonna be watched one got him dead, no doubt, in a second from Logi, but all equally three up to three different angles watching onto him here as well. Dead to rights to Savage and a very good round coming out from Secret. And it was tough to be fair, the Azami had really dug herself inside a cache and once Adrian had got top red, once they had control of the doorway between sites, there was just no getting out of there. He really had to play his life, but 
Sadly, that life didn't last all that long. Two players dead on the extended hold, and they paid the price. And this is what I meant about overstaying that welcome. It, it is hard to get away. There are so many ways that you can get cut off when trying to rotate back towards site, whether it's from construction window or the single VIP wall. So opted to play their life, but just ultimately couldn't get it done in the numbers reduced situation. Secret looking strong though, and this is what I said to him. I want to see how these top floor sites go. I imagine now we'll see cash and CC rather than a repeat. Yes, we will. I wonder if Deepak has taken inspiration from our friends over in the Japan League, Tim. Hmm. For those who didn't see, the the flames, we for those who on. didn't see, yeah, we had the dock. Um, we actually had it tried with Doc stimming somebody else. We had it uh, with Doc stimming a Wamai to try and just survive through the Capitano fire. Um, it wasn't successful. It was successful, however, um, when it was switched around and the Doc just stimmed himself. Um, so it is possible to outlast uh, the Capitano fire arrows by just stimming yourself up every time you get down to the point of death. Um, so it may well be, yep, yeah, with the, the ACOG potentially on site as well for Deepak, that it's going to be the perfect operator to hold on to Garage Catwalk. Might be something we see a bit more of. I hope so. It's always very, very fun to see people just standing there tanking the whole thing. The only problem is really, of course, you can't be guns up that whole time. You are there with the slim in hand. So if you are going to get pushed off the back of it, you can be in real hot water. So you've got to be very careful and very respectful that teams may well start figuring ways around that thing now that we've seen it done a few times over. Leon, as I was about to say, was playing a very risky game and he would have been straight into another fresh clip off the back of that one if he'd lost his life so soon into the round. He was playing a bit of a risky game, but equally you could say the same about the side of Secret here as well, because now that Fnatic are aware, they've got two or three players that can have a good angle on towards this hole that's been Attackers opened up. Drop the bomb yeah, one of the oldest right. angles in the book is that one. Get somebody on the rappel as you open up the Maverick line across the bottom and have a look into red. Jegs is going to take down June. That's a good opener then for Fnatic. Uh, they need to hold on to one of these top floor sites. Nitro goes off. He's going to do significant damage to Miracle as well. He's really low at this point. So five versus four and like i said fanatic need to hold one of these top two sites it doesn't matter which it is really if they can lock down church and arsenal as well but savage he finds jags levels things up at four versus four yeah, so we will be careful of here as well as running into these lines the site that are now being held secret have been in position for a while and will have several of them held down you know, sprinting around the map, you're going to find yourself caught out. We just saw, of course, Jegs discover with the wrong cross coming through out towards the north side of the map. Savage has got himself underneath here as well. They know about the man above. And this is where Adrian, you'd say, will come online. But with no fire left on sides, it's all about the smokes. You can't shoot back if you can't see us. Also a pretty viable strategy. However, you can see the shadow, Tim. Yeah, that's it, and you can play off that, and it just it shows smart game sense there, just playing off the shadow, getting the kill, and Fnatic can kind of continue like this. It's three versus three, so long as they're getting that first kill each time and giving themselves the opportunity to stay in the fights, then they're actually fine. Leon is going to find an absolute beauty onto Savage. Manages to cut down the lion with a headshot, and that gives a real power position to Fnatic here as Leon doubles down, finds Miracle as well, has the ability to just sit underneath and burn time here. And there it is. Finds the third as well. Much better stuff coming out from Fnatic. Leon especially. A big 3k in the round. But I also want to give some praise towards Secret on that. I actually thought the way they were trying to pinch onto Leon in the first case was brilliant. You know, had three players all trying to work in towards him to see him shut down and out of the round there. He just managed to bob and weave his way through while collecting kills, get himself locked up, inside, locked up inside a stock. And while you saw the outcome, they managed to get the round win on the board. So good stuff. We've seen success being shown here, Tim, across those different sites. So a good mix to come through. Fnatic could come out of this half, I'd say, in pretty good form. And then it's all about the second, in my opinion. Yeah, it's been, um, I think each round that has been won, I won't say it's, it's quite been sort of one-sided, um, but the, the rounds that have been won, whoever's won them has won them pretty emphatically. Um, you know, we've had at least three players remaining on the winning team each time. This time, Fnatic had three on the board. Last time around, Secret had four. It was flawless for Fnatic in round one. So it's very much been sort of one of those rubber band games, one extreme to the other for teams winning and losing rounds. But Fnatic, they are now able to go back down 
downstairs. It's going to be a repeat of the site that we saw in round one, which they won confidently. They managed to burn a lot of time. Tyrant able to get back onto the flank inside a garage and continue to burn those seconds away. So Team Secret, I think, really need to focus here on getting that map control, but also preventing anything like that. You know, uh, there's no Claymores on side. There's no air jabs on side. There's nothing. So again, I'm thinking, can you deal with the top of oil pit? Can you prevent that from happening? Can you prevent Fnatic being slippy in a way that's going to just burn those seconds away? Savage on this Monty, and we've got June coming along as well. I don't think it's going to be a big shield brush like we saw over... Was it in Japan we saw it the other day? With Blitz yes. fanned away, like, yeah, we're safe, we're not getting rushed because there's no Blitz. And then a team brings along both Monty and the Fuse with shields and just runs them down. It was unbelievable. But here, I'd imagine it's much more about the Fuse being brought along for the space that he creates when making use of that gadget. Drop that, for example, inside a kitchen or inside of the hallway, and anyone playing underneath it is dead to rights. Very good at denying away impact tricks, and given that we've seen Fnatic like, try and make that play happen already, yeah, why not try and do so again? They've got four impacts in that pocket. A well-placed Fuse gadget will at least see that done away with. Secret once again, uh, showing a good attention to detail, not getting too carried away, but I think they are, you know, definitely aware of the time this time around. They don't want to find themselves in that tough spot late in the round again. So they are moving pretty well. We're a minute 20 into the round. Hatches have been opened. Pressure is going to be applied into Dirt Tunnel. Needs to be careful there, getting through the rotate. Uh, make sure that those feet weren't being shown. Nitro Ooh. goes out, not going to do the job. Finds about half of the health from Savage, but having no joy getting into the <laughs> tunnel at the minute, trying to take I'll the bag with the pistol, but it's a risky oh, yeah. one, Des. I was about to say, when you've got a Kaid like stepping away and cowering away from a Monty pistol that's being wielded in ADS to charge him through dirt, it tells you a whole story about how fearful you have to be as shield players at the best of times. But a pistol is not normally the thing to be too fearful of. Now that Monty, it's like a horror game to him. It's coming forward at some pace here as well. Jay's going to find Adrian that was following him up and behind, I believe, as well. So now they can re-push here on towards this Monty as long as no one's outside, which they aren't. And they've blocked him into We've seen this on Skyscraper. Beautiful little bit of play. Jake's into a second and Savage falls. Yeah, really, really well played. It's becoming much more commonplace now. If you're maybe a little Azami main at home in right, just always consider that. If you've got the Monty there, can you block them in? Can you prevent, you know, Monty's really thrive on having support with them. And as soon as it stops, there's not much that they can do. Leon's going to find a two piece at the end of the round to close it out. And it's another confident win for Fnatic down in the basement. They are looking much, much better. Whatever work has been done since the last play day, Des, it's really showing some dividends here. And it's the fact they're collecting every single entry so far as well. It's, yeah, well, like Fresh spoke about, the mistakes you'd often see coming on through. Players dropping down seemingly for free and just being caught out was a little bit like, eh, a bit of a head scratcher. Whereas here, it's more on the other side. They're the ones getting the kills back in reverse very early in the round and not giving Secret too much room to execute as a full five. It's one thing I speak about a lot when a team is very good at attacking, when they're very good at the execute side of things. If they get towards site with all five on side, you are toast. You're absolutely going to be dead. So you have to get out around the map and look to try and contest quite early on. That's what we've seen Secret doing, so what Fnatic have been doing overall so far. And I think Secret are just kind of struggling to deal with the aggression coming out. Like when a Kaid is literally posted at the entryway in towards dirt, C four in hand, that tells you a whole lot. Well, they commit an Azami to it as well. Well, damn, it's just really good read into the game situation, I think, so far from Fnatic and a very deserved three to one that they're currently set at. Yeah, I'd agree. Uh, I think they need to definitely keep it rolling. Uh, I'm not saying that, you know, that they need a 5-1 half to be able to get a win here, um, but I'm expecting Secret to really come back at them on their defensive half. Um, so, yeah, I think they, they need to give themselves as much as they can. Um, but looking on a broader scale, the way that they are playing so far has been really good. Like I said, I praised Tyrant in the first round. Uh, the way that um, Deepak and Jegs dealt with the Monty there inside of Dirt, Jegs particularly knowing that Deepak needed that, that backup because there was support pushing down with Monty. As soon as Jegs gets that kill, you see the Monty start backing up once absolutely no part of Dirt Tunnel anymore. So again, just really good from Fnatic, recognising that, you know, this is a critical part of the push that's coming against us. If we back off, if we give them this ground, we potentially lose the round. So yeah, really, really well done from Fnatic. Much, much better. And I do have to heap some okay, praise, especially on Leon here, I feel, as well, because I've criticised him a lot historically for being, although he's the IGL and normally in a more supportive position, he is one of the most aggressive entry players I've ever seen. And there's all that question of, like, well, is it a good thing? And, you know, 
people who are like very pro Leon might turn around and argue, well, if he's dead, he can IGL better and whatever else. Or, you know, he's feeling confident, he's feeling himself, all the rest of it. He's in the front line, he can call around that. But cool, but no one else really tends to do that in the game is always the thing I've been worried about. And this game, the thing really worth noting, outside of the bandit round going nutty aggressive, he has been sat on site. You know, both basement sites, he's played on the go and the maestro so far. Very passive, very sat back, but he has really been able to shine in the mid to late round when things, you get the occasional straggler player that comes into ward site after your entries have done the job around the map. He is looking much more composed in that sense, and I think it's doing his team a world of good. Maverick going to be working. We saw the attempt at the Nitro previously. Deepak just keeping hold of it until it's a soft wall this time. Actually going to do the attacker's job for them. They're not going to have to bring the soft breach along because the Nitro is going to do the job. Nobody's still close enough to have any impact. We also see that there's a Goyo canister been popped as well. I can only imagine that that has happened by the attacker's hands, not the defender's. Um, I don't think they're in a position where they would have been so desperate to slow anything down just yet, but I could be wrong so far. Now goes Deepak as well. Jews found him a second coming in for secret here in pretty rapid time. And Groot is like, I want some of the action. At least managed to find themselves three kills elsewhere. Shot in the back as well on the march on through. And now Leon, I sang your praises, my man. But can you cut down a 1v3? Gets it down onto one. But it's still got two more. Leon into a second. But no, the close comes on through. Secret get their round. It's another one of those explosive all-in Tims. And Fnatic almost held off. But Secret after that attack timeout, they bounce back. I think there was probably a few uh, slightly worried secret fans sat there with the way that Leon's playing at the minute, finding those first two out of the 1v3 to bring it to a 1v1. But the timing was just really good from those last two. That's what you've got to do. If you're in a 2v1, push at the same time, create a situation where the last player can't possibly get both kills. And that's exactly what they managed to do. So well played secret. Like you say, a little bit of a bounce back, but I'll put an asterisk on it. Let's remember, they also won Jim and Bedroom back in in round two so that's the site they've already been successful on they've now got to go to cash and cctv where fanatic won last time around and they've got to try and get the win there and that was not an easy thing for them last time it came down to it was a 3v1 leon got the final kill three of fanatic left alive tough tough round for team secret here on cash and cctv last time 10 seconds remaining cash and cc all right Last time around, it was about that survival game Five that came on through. It didn't really come to be a thing because they were so focused on the wall itself with the bandit trick in and so on and so forth. Attackers Maybe here will be more of the same the sort of story, but no capital being brought along. Tim Adrian still back across on that hard support position here. And the wall tear, tore open will be the key one for them. No bandit to deny things away. So a little bit of a change up for both teams overall. But I imagine we're still going to see a very similar strategy. Some challenge inside or on catwalk, sorry, inside a garage. The main wall going to be a focus. Wonder if there'll be a backstab later into the round. Bomb located by attackers. We're getting that breach open nice and early inside of 30 seconds. So that's good stuff. Just need to think about garage catwalk now. Um, last time around, it was uh, a little bit difficult to deal with. They don't have the dock to go up against this time. By contrast, they haven't brought the capital along this time. So um, just looking at through the utility on the attacking side that's going to allow them to deal with that catwalk should they choose to. And there's not much there, really. They're going to be playing in behind flashes at an absolute push. No nades, uh, you know, nothing else really to deal with that so that would suggest to me strongly that we're going to see a lot of pressure coming through to construction so you'd assume but now it's about snipping, snipping out Deepak who's sat up here as you saw on the Wamai dug himself in it was the like you mentioned earlier on we saw a dock and a Wamai combo being attempted previously the Wamai always very very popular to sit on catwalk for dropping those magnets up in towards the rafters to catch any of those firebolts that would come flying in from a would-be capital out if they were on side Otherwise, it's more looking in towards the attackers having to burn things out with flashes first and then get the Capital in successfully. So really, it's much more of a, now a, a classic setup, if you would be, would say, for Catwalk. Jigsaw's going to fall down, though. First one picked off is the Fenrir. Unsurprisingly, normally one of the go-to roamers here, but Miracle found in response. And I tell you what, Tyrant really dug himself in deep. But Leon is off and flying once again, Tim. Yeah, exactly. The push coming in from the opposite side, as I suggested, but it just doesn't matter for, to, to Fnatic and more specifically to Leon. It's all the same. He can't believe it himself. Another three in the round. Leon is having a game like I haven't seen him play like this in a while. There's, don't get me wrong. He's been playing pretty well, but this is like serious stuff coming in from Leon at the minute. He can't miss right now. Good. 
because what you want to see coming out of him is really 100%. feeling himself today. But the one thing I always come back to, because we were talking before the show about, you know, what, what are the main things to talk about for these teams? And for now, the question that kept coming up was consistency, right? Like, I'm, I'm happy they're playing as well as they are. Like, a bit good for Secret, because they've also had a really good stage so far. You want to see them keep on pushing on and challenging for that top spot next to BDS, for example. But the one thing that I worry about is going into future weeks, will we see this level of play continue? And I sound like such a negative Nancy saying that, like, having a good mode. Ah, oh, Leon's at 10 and 2. Why isn't it because we're 13 and 2? Sorry, why isn't it continuing to future weeks? It's more a challenge that I want to see that carry on. And that change in play style today, being a bit more reserved in most of these rounds, really is setting them up for success. A 4 2 half is great. Now we get to see what they're really made of on the attacking side. And this is what we need to see a very different Fnatic. Yeah, 100%. This is uh, make or break. Now this is the real test that is going to come through. It is going to start off with a Church and Arsenal defense, as we would pretty much expect. Um, but there is going to be a strong top floor presence coming out of Secret there. We see a number of operators up on the top floor inside a garage. They're going to give Fnatic a lot of work to do here. Fnatic need to make sure that they're not falling behind the clock. They don't want to be pushing onto site with 15, 20 seconds left. It was something that they were able to create and benefit from, and that's not going to help matters. Savage manages to pick up the opener onto Tyrant. Oh, is the KB going down so early? <sighs> Loss. Big loss. The thing is, I don't if those kind of players are great, if the whole team is aligned and you're all, and again, Fresh spoke about this, it's almost like we're all watching the same sort of games, Tim. But they spoke about the kind of broken communication that you saw coming out of the team at different points. It feels like we're seeing more of the same here, where you've got Jigsaw trying to do his thing by himself. He can't push in and take 1v2 because the KB is dead, so there is no support on the Intel game. And everyone's kind of moving at different paces. Like, you know, you saw Tyrant trying to work his way in towards Blue, whilst we still have Baffin being pushed through there by the Iana. So already, you've seen two players picked off completely completely in isolation, away from the rest of the team, and you still got players like June looking to cause chaos around the map. Yeah, he's going to drop eye up it now. And like you said, the frustration there for Fnatic is they, they kind of, um, you know, they did the right thing. They go in, they get the kill onto Adrian, and then Jigsaw dips away into bathroom and he has the opportunity to just leave there. Consolidate, you're back to 4v4. Join up with your team. Where are we going? What's the push? Where do we need to clear? Instead, just a little weak re-peek onto main stairs that, that gives him away, really. Uh, Deepak does manage to pick up Miracle, though, so that's something. If he can get another one here out of dirt, that really does start firing Fnatic forward. Three versus three. Leon is just doing Leon things. He's inside a sight. He sees the man through the window. Can he find another? He knows that they're there to be found. 2v2 right now. Really on the hunt here with 60 seconds to play. That's so much time. And Leon is just different gravy today, Tim. A 2K for himself in the round. Deepak on the overcover as well. Where is Savage? He's inside the main hall. Is it closing out for a Leon 3? It may well be. No, it's Deepak finding him off the back of the corner. And I tell you what, given how messy that round started, they have really pulled one out the bag there. A great, a great kitchen and dirt execute to pull off the plant and really get themselves over the finish line. But again, it's Leon's name that we are singing. 15 and 2 unbelievable stuff inside seven rounds yeah really big moments coming out of Leon just to um, you know push Fnatic to that round and to many others as well we've got to remember if somebody's going to have as many kills as Leon does right now everybody else on the team isn't going to have that many because there's not very many to go around at that point so that's not a criticism I'm making but Fnatic do need to be careful because yes Leon is absolutely red hot at the minute but if he starts to cool off a little bit somebody else is going to have to have those moments because you know that was uh, around bought on the fact that he just dropped kitchen hatch I think it was got himself straight into sight got a couple of kills and, and really powered them on in so uh, you know they can't necessarily rely on that every round but I tell you what long with uh, you know long may it continue while it does and he got the plant as well yeah just any kind of stat you can give to him at this point, just throw it over towards him. Why not? Left Again, I've, I've got to say, overall. Des, um, you'll be aware, we do, um, there's a, a yeah, little um, fantasy, um, EU fantasy league with Jesse. Do you about um, to tell me you've got Leon, right? Traded him in today, didn't I? Oh, did you really? Big moves, big moves. 
What was the rationale behind that? I've got to know. Well, I had Skies um, from Ents, who did really well last week, but obviously it's their buy played here today. Um, so I thought, really, I, I could do with trade it. I kind of wanted to keep Skies because I think he's going to have a few more good games, but I wanted to... I thought, I need the points, really. I'm in third place out of five. I've got, I'm mid-table. I've got to catch up here. So I, I can't have players sort of on the bench. Um, and I said it to you, Des, before we came on, and I said it. I, I genuinely felt like Fnatic were going to have a big performance today. Um, and Leon has been one of the, the top rated players for them so I thought why not he was open I brought him in and he's paying dividends at this point ain't he just him ain't he just I'm gonna be chasing Jesse down at the top of the table <laughs> straight I mate just message him now and be like oi points I will <laughs> I've never been played eh? give it me now come on come on I want to see where you jump up to after this kind of performance absolutely mega again I always hate being the negative Nancy if Leon wasn't playing this well what happens because we saw those two early entry kills going against Fnatic yes he's, he's playing ridiculously well and really dragging them through some tough rounds but I want to see that consistency build here in the early round for the other players as well so on the entry can they come together to punish players like Savage you're out on the road he's fell back to sight here halfway into the round his job is done he's done a great bit of roaming play there and now it's about now they're all back on site what do Fnatic do how do they get themselves set up here how hard do they hit site and how long does it take to get ready for that Drones are raining in at the minute. Like you say, time could be the factor. One minute 20. We haven't yet seen breaches opened up that they will want open. And it's going to be Jacuzzi Wall that goes now. And Miracle's going to be playing in behind that mirror, which is bandited as well. So it's going to be a little bit tricky for them to deal with that potentially. Uh, they do have the Twitch drawn on side, so maybe a no number of avenues that that could be dealt with. Um, if they can get one of those shock drones in, take the batteries off, or just take the mirror straight down, whichever it is. Deepak manages to find one onto Grube, so that's going to open the account for Fnatic. And I'm a little bit worried, Des, that Team Secret could just be on the serious back foot here. They're being beaten up at the minute. Right sort of idea, but not quite the outcome they were looking for. Deepak's even found two out on breach. Like, it's getting a bit rough here. Look, Secret is still going for it. Right idea with the C4. Deepak Electric and shoots it. You are toast, my friend. Down he goes. A miracle and Adrian with it all to do here. Adrian finds one for himself, but he's over peaking. Secret maybe feeling themselves a little bit too much at points in this game, Tim, because Fnatic, even without Leon, they're hitting their shots. Yeah, then this is what I said, wasn't it, coming in? If Leon has rounds where he can't necessarily carry the team through, where he can't get those kills, then they need to step up and do it anyway, and Fnatic have. And I think that goes to show what I was talking about. Yes, they might not be the most kills everywhere else, but it's because Leon's grabbed them all. But it's not to say they're not playing well as a team. They are creating those situations, and Leon just kind of happens to be, um, you know, he's hitting his shots, don't get me wrong, he's hit some beauties, but he's right place, right time, right mentality, right aggression, and has been getting those kills. But even without him, Fnatic doing a good job there, uh, you know, making it very, very difficult for uh, Team Secret inside a site. Adrian and Miracle, they dug their heels in. They, they did a good job. They had a good effort. They got it back to a point where it was kind of winnable for them. But uh, Fnatic, I just feel like they, they've, they've found a different gear today, Des. They've found a different gear and Secret uh, a trailing behind. They're in the rear view mirror at this point, And the best they can hope for now is overtime. Something really weird about casting Leon absolutely slamming Secret as well, because obviously it was a team that he was on for, God, what, two, three years? Yep. Honestly, it was two years he was on it for. Yeah, because those don't know, back on Team Secret, then he was Rogue, then Koi, then back to Rogue again for a short time. And now, of course, Fnatic, as we see them here in the European League. And just talking about him deleting Secret, it just hurts a little bit, right? It hurts a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I've been on the receiving end of, of Leon and his entry game. Um, oh, well, you really, mate? I have. Oh, and you're a pro player, yeah, yeah. Not like, well, no, it was um, it, it was Rampy droning Leon in against me, and let me tell you, it's one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever had in Siege. Believe me, there is not much getting away from him. Um, we actually played his rank stack as well the other night, and um, once again, he, uh, he proved his quality, let's say that. <laughs> Very difficult to play against. <laughs> also complimentary, proved his quality or your... No, no, his, you know, his quality, his quality. Yeah, I think he'd, I think he'd be nice about saying that you were crap, mate. But I know. Okay. <laughs> it was definitely his quality, not my lack of ability. Uh, <laughs> oh, here we go. Press, then. 
Uh, go on. Oh, yours, mate. You take it. Why not? 6-2. It better. is for Fnatic. They are absolutely firing through Team Secret at the minute. Uh, we've come from one sort of speed run on Clubhouse with a 7-2 a result already. ITB over Wild. And we're coming potentially into another one here as Team Secret really struggling to hold on. And they've not been able to get a defense yet. They've tried basement. They've tried gym and bedroom. It just hasn't happened for them. And they're going to give uh, what could potentially be a last throw of the dice here onto Cash and CCTV. Now, I like this position from Jigsaw, just holding that angle all the way through Lounge. How often do we see defenders rotating through Lounge into lower garage and trying to pressure anybody looking to clear catwalk? And they're going to have absolutely none of that. Tell you what, they are going Roma hunting, Tim. Jesus. Yeah. Jigsaw's full centre down main stairs. They've got the right sort of idea. They know that he's inside of blue. But can they catch their man? No, not quite just yet. He's dug himself in towards oil here. Surely the swing comes on through, but Tyrant's found him first. I love that. When teams pull together and find these individual players and crush them in rapid time, it is so satisfying to watch. Doom and Adrian offline, 5v3. Fnatic in the driving seat to close and win 7-2. Yeah, it really does look like that is likely to be the case now, but don't count this secret team out just yet. Savage manages to pick Deepak up. Not the easiest kill to get in Siege. Finding the man on Rappel with a beautiful headshot. Does take a little bit of damage oh, there. No. Closed out by Jigsaw from the breach. Four versus two now. Miracle looking to get something doing? going. It's not going to happen, Miracle. You can't just wander up to the breach like that. You're going to get taken down. It's all up to Grubby. He's on the dock. He's looking for his man. Just gets one as he sprints across, but can't find the kill. Tyrant closes it out. And Fnatic does. They have a big resurgence here with an important win against Secret. And they keep themselves in the fight in EUL. A massive result for them. And, and nearly the last couple of rounds, it wasn't even the Leo show. The rest of the boys stood up and made themselves heard as well. And I mentioned it in that last round, that ability to identify isolated players and crush them before they can get back towards site is absolutely beautiful. But there will be questions of Team Secret there. There was a lot of overconfidence. There was overpeaking, overswinging. Not even just in that last round. I'm not really sure what Miracle was looking for on the breach step out, but they paid the price for it. But Alec fully deserved that win. Yeah, they did. Uh, you know, we can't not talk about Leon there. He's absolutely run away with the game. He could have been on for a 20 bomb if it had carried on, but he just didn't have enough time, I don't think, to close it out. Fantastic performance all round, though. Even when he was taken out early, Fnatic getting the job done. Great stuff from them, and I'm sure Fnatic fans will be looking on very, very happy with that performance. I think we'll all be looking forward to seeing how their next few games go as well, to see if they can keep up that consistency like we mentioned earlier on. But for now, it's all celebration for the boys in Orange. Let's go over to the desk and get their thoughts on this game. A 7-2 for Fnatic, a very convincing scoreline, so convincing that Fresh decided to change his shirt. It was so <laughs> never in doubt. I never for one second doubted this Fnatic team, apart from when I criticized them in the pregame, but we don't talk about that, Fabian. I mean, it is a Joyo team. That's what we've seen so far. I want to see more strung, like, strung after one another in terms of good performances, because it's up and down, up and down. Look at that last round. They're roam chasing a guy in clubhouse basement. You don't do that very often. But then when we saw them play consulate, yeah. they don't even roam clear at all. It made no sense to me. They played really, really good today, though, and I want to highlight that they've made very, very few mistakes that we used to see. Yeah, I think that's the one big thing is, you know, for the longest time, but even inside of this league, we've seen a team that can take the ball by the horns, that can win a game, that can be strategically good and make the right plays in some rounds. Yeah. And then we've seen the team that just gives it away in other rounds. And I think Fnatic, this is probably their second complete performance after the ITB game, because obviously they won that quite convincingly as well. And this is what we want to see. This is the Fnatic that gives their fans, that gives their supporters so much hope that this team can break into the upper echelon in this league. In case you were here and watched our pre-show earlier today, you may have seen that Fabian put Fnatic on the very last spot of his power yeah. ranking. Would you change that now? No, yes and no at the same time, because I still think that they're a yo-yo team. Like, I can't rate a yo-yo team high because I haven't seen them string up good performances one after another. And I want to see that before I put them higher. What do they need to do? They need to play like they did today, for the rest of the stage, and I'll be more than happy to move them up way higher. But if they don't play like they did today, and they go back tomorrow to the same old one, well, then they're going to stay down there. We're going to see the standings again after, of course, the scoreboard that we're seeing. Currently, we're seeing all the players, of course, on the side of Fnatic really getting active into that game. Really exciting to see that not being very much top-heavy or one player really carrying the boat here. But when we're looking at the standings, and they're really going to be important on these final few playdays, we have seen Fnatic coming in on 
number seven on this play day, now showing their way up to top four. That's great. Yeah, it's put themselves right in contention in terms of breaching that top four. It does mean ITB are not confirmed until, you know, later on, probably tomorrow. And Secret are now back in the mix after being, you know, miles in the way. They were, remember, they were on nine points after yeah. three games. They're now on 10 and after And they look six. really good after yeah. those three games. So it, 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 it goes to show how close this league is. I mean, it's jumping positions and jumping down depending on one game, and everybody's still so close to each other. It's incredible. It's really exciting to see yeah. now. Of course, it has a good perspective for our next few games, but still talking about this one, one player that we particularly really saw pop off was Leon. Yeah, people love to hate on Leon. He's had a mad game today. I think he's had a great day. And what Leon gives you, and I've said it a couple of times actually, is Leon is an entry that's masquerading as a support player, which means he's always going to take gunfights. He's always going to have that aggression within him. However, when it comes off, Leon can open up around, and today was one of those days where it came off for him. Nearly everything worked, apart from obviously that 1v3. He was hitting some of the shots, but he is so important for this Fnatic team because obviously he's not just, you know, a, a, an entry player masquerading as a sport. He's not just an aggressive player, he's also the IGL. So when he's doing well, the whole Fnatic team is doing well. And he had his haters as well. He had his haters, you know, probably at the start of the stage, maybe even me, maybe even Fabian, calling him out for the entry deaths, you know, certainly on socials. And I think today he's proved a lot of people wrong. I think we can pretty much consider him the MVP maybe of, um, of this game, definitely showing up there. But we also have him on the line to ask him a few questions about that game. So good evening, Leon. Uh, first off, Hello. you had an amazing performance today. What on earth did you have for breakfast? Uh, what did I have? I had a Greg's actually. Um, big up, so yeah, maybe that's the difference from today. With uh, Greg's in the belly, the prep in your brain, however, this map clubhouse, was that something you guys wanted to take them on today? Yeah, we wanted to play Night or Sky today, and it was literally those last two maps on the bat band phase, so it worked out perfectly for us, uh, either way. Yeah, so you guys got exactly what you wanted. There was one more thing I have to ask you, Leon. Why have you guys been a yo-yo team this season? Why are we seeing some uh, mind-blowing performances in terms of they are great? Like today, you guys made almost no mistakes. And in other days, we see a performance that, you know, they, it's not really good enough at this level, right? <clears throat> yeah, definitely. I think um, coming into the start of the season, like, um, we had some really good practice. Everyone was like level headed, you know, just keeping it real and stuff. And then I'd say like the last like two weeks, not from like other teams, but ourselves have been quite poor in the way we've been practicing and we've been approaching the game. Um, just, you know, not really being as like, I'm not professional, but like not having a good mindset um, when coming into these, not caring as much. Um, and that showed last week against Wild where we didn't go in um, wanting to win or like playing to win. We played to not lose uh, and we were scared. And that showed obviously, like you said, um, seeing those poor performances coming from us. So. After that game, we had a massive talk to each other, talking about setting all like the standards that we need to have for the season. You know, why we originally started this team and how we approached it. And we need to be back into those like like the next step of the team after like getting through the first phase. Now we're in like the second phase of growing. That's really exciting. I mean, of course, we know that the core of this roster really was depending on those vibes. And of course, all having the same kind of motivation what we're thinking years ago with this roster. But you're now currently in step two. You're saying, what can we expect for the future of Fnatic in this stage? Because you're currently fourth. <laughs> Yeah, I think, um, like Fabian was talking about, I think you're just going to see some more consistency from us from now on. Um, we're going to be just, you know, really screwed on of our heads, making sure we're just playing to win all the time, no matter where we are in officials, practice, all that stuff outside of game, in-game. Uh, and just making sure that we're bringing each other up as a team, because at the end of the day, like, we're not going to win without each other. Um, it doesn't rely just on the back of one person. We need everyone to be the best they can be. And if we're not all in the same mindset and in the same playing field, then we're not going to be able to win these games. One more question I have is, I'm not sure if you caught our pre-show, we did a power ranking where we predict our teams and we uh, put the teams currently. Um, if you saw Fabians, he put you at the very bottom. you have anything to say about that? I mean, that's fair enough. I mean, I don't blame him for putting us low. Like, we lost to Wild, like, you know, like, no offense to them, but, you know, I mean, we shouldn't be losing these games where we're uh, so, like you said, so yo-yo. We're beating some teams, losing to others. We should be consistently beating these, top, uh, these teams in the league, so. Yeah, I'm just going to let them sit there, let the haters talk as well and wherever they are on social media. And we're just going to keep trying to do our best and bring them back, um, you know, the good old wins. I'm going to I'm, I'm troll you in all my Smurf Reddit accounts, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, I've already read about four posts you've put up. So. <laughs> it's a great mindset, though. Really good to see that, of course. Congratulations with the win, and I'm sure we'll speak to you again. Yeah, thank you very much for the interview. Uh, that was just a difference today from me. Uh, you know, these guys are literally losing to a dad. Uh, I've got to go change a nappy after this, so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, great. Awesome. Awesome. It's, the, it's a dead buff, I guess, coming in for this game then for Leon specifically, but really exciting, of course. Yeah, I mean, he and I are both dads. I'll have to change Jack's nappy later. <laughs> so it's uh, we're basically at the same level. 
All right, of course, we'll give you some time to do that, though. In the break, of course, we got coming up. But after the break, we have a really exciting game. We've got BDS versus Furnace Pro. Don't go anywhere. Four years of impeccable service, she applied for Legada's Elite Tactical Branch, the Emergency Response Unit. Only 5% of applicants pass the grueling two-week entrance exam. Is that a twitch? When we discussed her decision to join the police force, Shuri counted with some reservation an incident involving her youngest brother, Liam. Finca! Is it alibi? Fawn. I would never guess that. After high school, he enlisted with the US Army and rose in rank over a short period of time. He learned Dari and became an intelligence officer. This is harder than it seems at first. <laughs> I have no clue. Can I get an another clue? He was a legend among intelligence collectors as the spook who went native. He's often difficult to engage with since he's incredibly intelligent. I'm pulling blanks of operators now. Grim. I think it's Blackbird. Powering is also from US. He's US, yeah. Boxed in the rigid rules of her household, she found outlets for self-expression through fashion and physical combat. I have no clue to be honest. <laughs> Alibi. I'm still trying to determine if her dedication to Bushido teachings was encouraged by or in spite of her relationship with her father. Could be, I don't know, could be everyone. Maybe Twitch. Yeah, I'd say Twitch. Is it Caviera? See, that's what I, I looked at the box thing and it, and it seemed like a Cav thing. After under, undergoing that rigorous 22 month training for the elite Air Force unit, Shaldak, she served five years. Thunderbird. <laughs> what? Extracting anything personal from the tangle is difficult. Cohen is cautious and doesn't cultivate many close relationships. Mirror? Could be Ash. What? I wouldn't expect that even I would get one point, like, to be honest, I never read the bio of the operator, maybe last time when I was actually reading that was when I started playing the game. I, I can't lose again. Especially not to grubby again. Two times <laughs> now. Wait, so do we just have to speed run this? Should I go? Now do IGO or another entry. Yeah, mate. You want to do now Team BDS IGO? Like you, fuck. Alright, now do support and flex. Uh, print. Oh, 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 I see, I see, I see. Oh, so I'll do IGO now. Or. of, of BDS. <laughs> um. Lucky fuck. Oh, is it? I was already gonna say that, mate. Come on. Um, G G two. Is it my turn? G two. I G O. My turn. G two. I G L. Uno. G two. Esports. I G O. L M L. The wild I G L. Uh, backball. G two. Support. Uh, slash flex. Virtue. Uh, G two. Entry. Doki. Team BDS, uh, support slash flex, breed A, breed? Wild entry, uh, at the racket. Yep, see, now the problem is I don't know the wild roster. I already won, mate. Oh, sh Yeah, I didn't even say that. Yeah, he's cheating. You're so confusing, man. It wasn't really confusing, we're just stupid. Where in there? Where, where do I want to start? Matic IGL, Leon Gids. <laughs> Matic entry, it checks. Yeah, you're on that entry, mate. Yeah, I'm so screwed. Virtus entry, Pasha. I don't even know. He just went. Virtus Pro entry, joystick. Into the breach, IGL, uh, Noah. Into the breach, entry, uh, Noah. <laughs> Bro, he IGLs in FPL. I've never heard someone... He talks more than Leon. Yeah, I'm just gonna get ITB, IG, IGL, Kendrick. Now you're gonna... Now, go on, get the entry, mate. 
you got a breach and treat us. Oh. There's no way you butchered that. Pasha IGL Virtus Pro. Pasha IGLs. That guy does everything. against Virtus Pro is up next and due to of course these two teams and organizations you can expect this matchup to be pretty close however I think with the recent history of these two teams it might be a little bit more of a stomp BDS coming in at first Virtus Pro currently dangling on the eighth spot BDS are the only team that's confirmed so far for those playoffs it's looking really good for them they are absolutely dominating I mean they had a small hiccup but other than that They've been incredible. Like, I love what I'm seeing from them because we're seeing so much firepower and we're seeing a depth of strategy that you don't expect of new teams. I'm super happy with them. And I think that for the future, they just have so much brightness coming out of it because we see timings that are great. They play off each other really well. And then, of course, they have some of the absolute best fraggers in Europe. We all had them number one in our power rankings yeah. for a reason, right? They, And I think the, the sentiment is there, I think, from the whole community, you know, not just us on this desk, but the wider international community as well, is that if anybody is going to challenge, I suppose, the current Fury at XW7M teams, it's very likely that it will be BDS at an international event and that they are probably the team from Europe with the best chance of winning an international event. Yeah, I mean, so as, as they've been looking, like, who is to stop them? Yeah, sure, they lost to Enz, but they themselves said that that was a hiccup in the day. Yeah. And then they had an even game against Secret. Sure, it went to full overtime, but that was Secret in their second place. Like, they were the next team behind them. They, it should be close first and second. But other than that, they've just been running everybody over. That's something I wanted to talk about because, of course, their start from the stage was really strong. However, the last week we saw a bit of a blip. Yeah, so we've got a tail of the tape graphic that we're going to show you. Now, this is a little bit unusual, so stay with me. So it's BDS from we, uh, Play Days 1 to 4 against BDS from Play Days 5 and 6. Now, the two key stats for me are the team KPR and the team DPR, which I, I don't really think is a graphic we've ever really shown before. It stands for kills per round and team deaths per round. So in the first four play days, you can see on average, they're achieving 4.3 kills around and dying 2.8 times around. The last two play days, however, that kill, kills per round has dropped significantly down to 3.1 3 and the deaths per round has increased significantly up to 3.7, showing that even though they achieved points and they beat Secret, they also lost and had a close game. Things have got a lot closer recently. They haven't been BDSing people. They haven't been BDSing people, but one thing that we want to look at as well, and something we actually highlighted after Dance Game, so before Secret, is that they struggled immensely with entry frags. They had like one entry kill, I think, in the entire game against Ants, and that's just not something we expect of a roster of this quality. I think that week was just, forget it, we move on. 
and we're going to just come back and dominate everybody again. We're expecting that week one to four, yeah. or play day one to four, BDS, to be back basically now in this present moment. I mean, there's no surprise why we made up the word BDSing, of course. They've been showing very strong on those very first play days. Now, for the future of BDS as well, they've got only one more game after this. Yes, they're confirmed for that top six, but ideally, as a team, you want to make it into the top two. They've got an Arte after this, and then they got Fnatic after that. Yeah, exactly. That's what they want. You know, they're going to want to get this wrapped up as soon as possible. I think Secret Losing has been very good for their chances. Obviously, a clean win today would put them in prime position. Yeah, I don't know if it really matters to them. Brutally honest. I don't know if the top two spots really matter that much. Because the one thing that matters is that you first of all make it to playoffs. Then if you make it into the first or in the first two spots, yeah, sure, you get the first game free. But the other team that you're playing up against, they've got to play a best of three. They've gotten into the groove of things. Yeah. I think top six is just the goal, no matter which position you end up in. So I think people are happy no matter where. But BDS is just so good that they should be taking one of those two spots. They might be back to BDS again today, yeah. especially because their opponent, I think we've got a lot of question marks around them right now. What is going on with Virtus Pro? Especially if you look at their accomplishments from last year and you compare it to what's going on with them this stage. Yeah, with Virtus Pro, we're used to seeing them dominate EUL stages. They actually won both EUL stages last year, Fabian, beating out your old team when you were coach. That. Just wanted to dunk on you there. Um, so they won both EUL stages online, made to, to both majors and got themselves a third place finish at SI. So I, I suppose my question and everyone's question is why the hell are they even in eighth place? Why are they at risk of not even making the play? Let's start from the beginning. Yeah, okay, they beat me, but at least I was in the final and they didn't yeah. get relegated. That's the go biggest that. difference. Yep. 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 And then, <laughs> then other than Carried that, ben, it's just a dokey. Yeah, I mean, I don't care who I get carried by as long as I win. There's okay. only one person with three hammers. However, Virtus Pro have just lost their basics. That's what I think. Like, we don't see that they don't adapt at all. Like, we, I highlighted a clip on Clubhouse that they played, or Oregon, sorry, that they played earlier. They had free reign of the entire map, and they just didn't do anything with that. And then we were also seeing that they're making the individual mistakes that are just questioning a lot. Because we are seeing so many things from this team, and we're like, oh yeah, they always do the same thing. They have the basics, the best in the world, and then they make a ton of mistakes. I don't know what's happened to them, but something's changed. I don't know if you just saw the cams there just before this graphic came up. They all looked very stressed and we've not even loaded into the lobby yet. I don't know if it's just the reality of their situation, but like, you know, as you say, it's simple mistakes. It, it's small things that's costing them rounds because their games have been close. You know, they've not necessarily been well-winded by many teams, um, but they have looked a little bit stressed on the player cams before the game, which is, isn't something we're used to seeing from them. Yeah, these camps are in fact live. We're seeing, of course, the players prepare for their matchup that is ahead of them. But then, of course, we talked about, you know, their performances from last year going into this year. What we're currently also seeing is that all these players, and this is the only team that's got that, all the players on the team are rated negatively. Yeah, I mean, I don't think you can look too much into the individual ratings when the team is doing so poorly, right? Because the, the in mistakes that they're making leads into individual poor performances, which when every individual is having poor performances, so will the team, which then drags down everybody around them. So by one person having a rough game, people around them get worse. And then when everybody has a rough game, well, things get very, very bad. I don't know if I buy the idea that they're stressed, I'll be honest and say, because they're so experienced that, yeah, they've been in this position before. Things will happen. Mm -hmm. It's okay to not be in the best position at all times. They know what they need to do. It's just a game in front of them, just like any other. And they're the Russian cyborgs. They, 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 they don't have emotions there. I was trying to spy maybe on the monitors of the players to see what kind of map we'll be going to because we've seen Clubhouse, of course, twice already today. So let's see what kind of map we'll be going to again. But it seems yes. like we'll be heading back to another Clubhouse. And you know what? I think if there was any game that was going to be Clubhouse, it was always yeah. going to be these two, to be honest. You know, Clubhouse has long been a favorite of Vertus Pro. Long, long, long been a favorite of this team. They will always play it if it's left open. But that's also the same historically for BDS in terms of the old BDS roster one of the best clubhouse teams in yep. the world, genuinely. So if clubhouse was open, I think both of these teams were always going to be happy to go there. In terms of recent history, we haven't really seen BDS on it. We have, however, seen VP on it, and they've not looked the best. It's been a lot of close games, and I don't think that we maybe buy that they're one of the best clubhouse teams in the world right now. No, I, I, I would not say that they're one of the better ones. But I mean, they, they lost very, they looked very lost the last two times they played them. They won it against G2, but G2 said they felt lost themselves. So I don't know how much we can buy into that. Overall, though, I think that the BDS map pool is just so massive that they can dictate every single ban phase that they want to and get whatever map that they want. 
And that's just such a perk to have that they, you can just dictate everything, and that's probably what they did today. Gives you a lot of confidence for best of threes. I yeah. know we've, we we spoke in the power rankings about BDS in best of threes at the minute, because obviously, with us playing a best of one league, we've not yet seen them in a best of three. However, the fact that they've played so many different maps across these best of ones gives you a lot of confidence that should we get to a best of three, there will be teams literally cowering about where to take them. I was just going to ask, what map do you take them to? Park? <laughs> Tower? <laughs> Favela? <laughs> or, I don't know. Yeah, you start playing plane. Yeah. <laughs> just a few entrances, so you can hold them all one person by one. Yeah, it's it, it's just nothing you can do against them. Yeah, no, that would be a bit silly uh, if, we, if we go and play on plane or something like that. But thinking back about the last time these two teams played against each other, obviously for BDS it was a bit of a different lineup because it was during the Atlanta Major. But back then it was a bit of a spicy affair because I remember it was playoffs. BDS beat Virtus Pro 2-0 for BDS to qualify to main stage, but for Virtus Pro to be eliminated from, from the entire tournament. Yeah. Are we feeling similar predictions for today that BDS might take this? Well, do you know what was interesting actually in Atlanta was actually that that was both close games. It was both get both maps of that were in overtime. I think the expectations today is that BDS might get this done a little bit more in regulation and be a little bit more dominant. Very different roster for BDS, of course. I think they'll run over Virtus Pro with, because of Virtus Pro's current form. But yeah, it's not going to be pretty for Virtus Pro. I wonder if Virtus Pro will have a Fnatic moment. You know, I've, we, I digged into Fnatic in the pregame. They won. I, I don't know how long I can go along this stage and saying it's just a blip for Virtus Pro, because at, at some point the stage will be over and I'll still be saying it, right? Yeah. Because we know they've got the quality, we know they can fix it up, we know it's small things. Yeah. Because when you look at this roster, and this is what I keep saying, they've been together for the longest time, right? You played against the core of this roster in Rally, and that's when you was playing. Yeah. You've won an invitational coaching since then. That's how long they've been together. So if you look at it over the longer time, is it just a blip? I'm still still quite there saying i think it is and they can sort it out they can scrape playoffs and still recover this season but we're getting close yeah it's getting close they can still recover but also having that one rough stage in what six years seven years or, like, or however long they've been around does that really matter not in my eyes you can have those times next time they'll recover yeah i mean they've been together for so long that they know what's happening they got a good, really, really good history, and we do have faith. Of course, it's a difficult team they're going up against, but surely it'll be a good matchup. Our game is not fully ready yet, but it's time to bring our casters back in so we can ask them a few questions as well. We welcome back, of course, Ace and Dez. How are we feeling about this one? Are we agreeing that it might lean the way of BDS? Uh, yeah, but I really feel someone's testing my patience for three clubhouse casts in a row. Not going to lie to you, Anne. Yeah, it was me, Dez. It's because I hate you. <laughs> Cheers, mate. Screw you. <laughs> I know there's one person that's going to be very happy, and this this is a throwback to a long time ago. Hicks. He's going to be so happy because for the first time in a very long time, he's not the lonely dancer in the club. Everybody's going to the club. <laughs> Des isn't going to understand terrible. that reference. Does, that's terrible. Does he? Just it's don't terrible. get close to a PlayStation. That's we'll you know. be fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> It has to be in a mirrored room. Do you, do you know what? Do you, do you know the, uh, you, the viewers at home might have seen me dunking on Des a little bit, but it's because I heard Derry in the warm up when he was testing his audio. He was really rude to Ace when he was testing his audio today. And I thought, no, I'm not, I'm not having any of that. So I'm, I'm standing up for my good friend Ace. It's, it's, my, it's my, okay, ranked, fine. my ranked hero, Ace of Pyro. I was going to say, so I had no idea that this was happening. And it's also something I don't really expect from you, Des. I, I mean, I think we need an apology video with tears right now to Ace. No, no, you see, the actual thing that happened... <laughs> I've been waiting for about... years for one of them. <laughs> <laughs> They'll never have one. It's never going to happen, let's be honest. I, was, I, was, I don't know why. We get made to talk. They're trying to like, lip sync, so I had to just talk like a stream of crap for about 30 seconds. You said you could cook an egg on his head, topic. Derry. Exactly, I mean, that's is what I mean. Wrong? Gets him outside on a nice hot day, get some sunburn on, and that egg will be cooked to perfection. Could have yeah. said anything. Could have said anything. Exactly. That's what he Flat went with. surface. Yeah, that, yeah. He, it goes he, off. He, he could have talked about how the sky was blue and there was clouds and the weather, but no, he said, I can yeah, cook an boring. egg on Ace's head. And, but, but think about it. You don't nah, even need to boring. add salt. Because it's going to be salt from his head oh, on that egg. It's going to be the greatest salt tasting. Salt from where? The well, games or from his head? So, no, 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 no just saltiness in ranked. That much oh. has to be said. It's pure vibes when I'm in the stack. That's true. Yeah, don't, don't As opposed to anything to else. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> Here I am getting it. Okay. Well, there's a difference between you and me, Jack. Do you know it? No. I win stuff. You don't. Oh, okay. I win wow. ranked because I've got Tim Ponton. <laughs> wow. Congratulations. <laughs> it's hit just gold like a, four for the last time. It's a bit like a real pass around relationship here where like Fresh goes for me, Fabian goes for Fresh all the time, I go for Tim. Like, Tim, you've got to start really laying into Fabian now, I think, to really complete this just, square. Just give me something here. Just say something very aggressive or rude Say the to first me. nasty yeah. thing in your entire life. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to do that, Des. 
<laughs> I'm saving it for something really big. I'm saying one day I'm just gonna uh, drop something and everybody's gonna be like, what? No, I'm just saving it for that moment. Jesus. This isn't it. Atrocious. It's very silly because I feel like, you know, everyone's been catching strays here. I feel like so far, I mean, Ace got a stray. I Death catch a lot of strays, strays, to be fair. It's so usually a team kill, to be fair. <laughs> 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 Happens all the time. It's Repeatedly. Yeah. Repeatedly. There's a repeat Weird offender that. in our stack for team killing. To be fair, Fresh hasn't killed me in about a year, I don't think. Nope. But no, the, the Fresh reason, hasn't. The reason he ages. does that is just because he never goes first. He's a baiter. You know what, if you guys want to sort this argument out, I'll let you do that uh, later on though, because unfortunately I would have loved to toss it to you for the game and the players aren't fully ready yet. So we'll toss it to you a quick break. Of course, we'll remind you what we're all playing for, that Manchester Major, and then we should be back in a few minutes. Hey guys, it's used from BDS and these are my quick tips for cafe. Tip number one is shoot the glass on every window, no matter what the site is. Second tip is do not spawn Christmas market, you will be spawn peak probably. I don't know if you saw my other segment, good good. Where even is that? I still don't even know where that is. I don't even spawn here, that's unfair. I didn't get the thing right because it was Christmas market spawn, I don't spawn there, I'm not a rookie. Third tip, when you're on defense, play mute, open the red hatch, get a C4 at the ready and then C4 out their roof hatch when they repel it. That's a genius one, that's my favorite one. Hi guys, it's Leon Kids from Fnatic and these are my quick tips for the map border. So tip number one for border on attack, if you throw your drone onto the roof, there's a massive skylight that looks open, open area. You can put it on top of a little ledge and you can see east edge, you can see long, you can see the flank from also in waiting room as well. Nice easy drone that is hard to find um, with loads of information. Tip number two, if you spawn east side with zero, you can shoot your cam into archives. A little dome on top of office and into tellers as well gives you loads of information early for places that you want to push into the map and then tip number three uh, if you go into customs just to the right of the jail door you can vault your drone underneath the table at a point where they can't see it when they're crouched or stood up so they have to prone to see this drone but you can also see a lot of customs as well and towards main door i don't think i have anything else <laughs> i think that's it really for border hey guys it's una from g2 these are my attacking tips for night haven so I think when you're attacking Night Haven, you need to first obviously see where the site is. But if it's top floor, I think you should always try to open the external walls and then attack it from at least two different sides at the same time. If you want to take carriage, take Agua with carriage. If you want to take office, take box streets with office. If it's middle floor, then always use vertical as your advantage. In Night Haven, there is a lot of vertical you can do. Same for basement. Always take the whole map, then start doing vertical. There's so much vertical you can do, so you push them out of the positions, and then it's easier to attack the site because they don't have many positions where they can defend themselves. Hey guys, Chinka from Wolf, and uh, well, I'm gonna give you a quick tip on bank. First one is spawn jewelry. From this point, you can shoot uh, pretty easily three cams on the map: the outside main cam, the inside main cam from the window, and you just move to Atrium and you can shoot the cam from outside. I have two drone spots for you. The first one is in main. You have to put it in the plants. There are some plants close to the windows. You can see pretty much all the main and it's hard to, to see it. The second one is in top atrium. Kind of same place because you put it in the plants as well, close to the stairs. And you can see very much what you want and it's really hard to spot.
We saw some exciting uh, things about the Manchester Major, of course, what we're all playing for here right now. Qualifying teams sending them off to Manchester to that Major. BDS arguably looking very good for that if we pull up the standings as well and see where they're currently at. They could shoot up to 17 points today. They're the only team that is currently qualified and confirmed for that top six. And we mentioned that Into the Breach and Secret could do that today, but Secret lost, so they're not confirming themselves. And then ITB needed to bank on the win from Secret to qualify themselves into that as well. That didn't happen, so it's still very much up for grabs for everyone. Yeah, it's still very much up for grabs. And I think the one thing uh, looking all the way from G2 up to ITB, there's four points separating all of those places. All of those teams still have even second in sight because a lot of those teams obviously play today yeah. and play the next two days so it can get a maximum of nine points. Yeah, and it's, it's just crazy how close everything is, you know? And if we look at BDS super shortly again, I don't think it's about like maybe, okay, they want to get top two. But what it is about is sending a message for the entire playoffs that, hey, we are that team that you guys should be afraid yeah. of. It's about building that mental momentum against everybody else that they go up against, where they feel, oh no, we're going up against BDS. That's not the feeling you want to have before you go on the server. And that's what they need to cement now because they've locked Rocky. Just make sure that they have it for the playoffs. Well, the good news is, is that the players are all ready. The game is ready to go off as well. So we'll send it back to Ace and Des for our third clubhouse of the day. Thank you very much, Anne. We're not talking any more smack this time around. I'm glad we can just get ourselves focused on Clubhouse team instead of talking well into the game about everything else we've been speaking about in the pregame. But here we are, ready to go. Third Clubhouse of the day. Will we make it a fourth one in game number four? That remains to be seen. But first, we've got to see Virtus Pro, who feel like David in this situation, facing off against Goliath in the form of BDS. This is going to be a potential stingy one, I think, for Virtus Pro, Tim. However, Things have been getting a little bit crazy today. Fnatic has shown themselves up to be pretty big. ITB smashing their way through wild, but maybe not quite to the level expected. This could be one of those games. You just never know. Yeah, I, well, I, I always want to be the positive voice. I always want to be the one that says, you know, maybe this can happen. I think Virtus Pro have just got Two, like, they've got other problems at the minute without playing BDS, you know? Um, uh, even the game style so far, B, uh, Versus Pro are our leading team in terms of plants. They've planted more than any other team so far, not including today's games prior to today. And I just think, is that a style that's going to work against BDS? And the answer is, I don't think it is. Um, you know, because the plant, you need control, you need um, a man advantage generally because you're losing somebody to the plant, uh, and you need to create space. And I think doing any of those things against this BDS team is so, so difficult because as soon as you take your focus away from fighting them and onto holding an angle and putting a diffuser down, they just come at you even harder and start finding more kills because you're not focused on the gunfights as much. And so, yeah, I think potentially very tough day for Virtus Pro coming up. But often when we all expect that, it's not what ends up happening. So who knows? It's also worth celebrating a little bit how the stats have been going overall for BDS, to be fair. I mean, one thing I'll look at and probably pull oh, up to a little bit here is where there is a little bit of success to be shown for Virtus Pro. They, at least coming up against a team like BDS, have been extremely good on the entry so far. Very positive. In fact, our best entry percentage rate so far we've got in the whole competition. This will shock you. BDS somehow are right down there at the bottom as well. And I look back over a couple of games. We had Shaco going nuts and going 6-1, and one, for example, in this game. I think it was against Ents a couple of weeks ago. But you look at the rest of the team, uh, things have not looked good. Solotov being at 3-9. and nine, Leak it back is at 6-11. and 11. It has been difficult for them. So if anything else, Virtus Pro are going to find some success, you'd hope, on the entry in these early rounds. But converting it into round wins may then prove to be their downfall. So keep an eye on those early round engagements. That's where the action to find out. Here we go though, round one, gym bedroom, BDS on defense. Let's see how Virtus Pro do. I think that's the big problem against BDS at the minute. Like you said, their entry isn't great, but does it need to be? <laughs> you know, it's like, BDS. Hello. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't need to be. Yeah, the 4v5 and two seconds later, <laughs> somebody's going to use, is going to get a double or a triple and all of a sudden they've got mana. You know, they just don't, they just, I don't think have too much of a concern playing from a numbers disadvantage. And with the firepower they've got, it's no surprise that that's how they feel. It must give them all as individual players so much confidence. If user stars, oh, it's okay, Sharko's still there. Oh, it's okay, Solotov's still there. Like, but, you know, there's just so much to, to be confident in with this team. 
All right, they've got the idea here that Solotov is at least holding himself out on towards Catwalk. Nothing too unsurprising there. And to begin with, it feels almost like you're setting up for a cash and CC. Sort of push coming in here, Tim. Look how many outlines we've got on this side of the map. I don't expect that's going to last forever. And VP made us turn around and say, you know what? We don't actually really need to get full control of cash CC itself. Just enough to make sure someone can't plan the window. We see some teams instead opt to stick players, for example. Oh, no way. League of Facts really trying to trick this this close. Okay. This is a different one. Like I said, normally you see this, you're trying to play instead out towards the other side. But as long as Leaky Fack is quick about it, no, he simply can't get away with it. Dan has done his work. There is homework to stun him out, force him away, and that wall will not be tricked off. Yeah, essential stun coming in there, as we can see. Otherwise, that bandit battery goes down. Um, Leaky Fack needs to be careful. He's going to get himself found from bottom garage, potentially, here. Um, we can just see the potential for the oil flank being denied but a lot of work could still be done from oil pit they can't just forget about it Virtus pro here because we are attacking onto that top floor so if you're up on catwalk or anything else it could be a danger still they don't have to come up the ladder what a wall rate big time here is look how much time they've, they've docked off the clock, uh, the clock yeah. there and how many players in Virtus pro until five ten seconds ago were still stuck out here on the east side of the map yeah, they've wasted a minute and a half if not onwards towards two minutes here really with very little effort, like Leaky Fat was having to play Bandit Trick, sure, and a little bit of his army support coming in as well in terms of the keeper barriers to cover his retreat back towards site. And they're still causing bodies underneath with Solotov on the Solus. So, so much work being done to take away the intel from Virtus Pro, who historically, I think back to the many times they've said, you know, we're, we're very guilty of over-droning sometimes and doubting ourselves instead of just going for it. They're full of doubt right now. They've only got three drones left on side. It's a very slow push across the map. BDS is probably licking their lips here with only 30 seconds to go. All five alive and Virtus Pro still getting set up for the site. Solotov still underneath on the Solus as well. That's something Virtus Pro have not been able to deal with. So how did they get the diffuser down? He's going to get the opener as Joystick tries to deal with that. And that is the worst entry death they could have taken. Oh, but no, the trade is there. Will it be too little too late though? Dan's done really well to recognize that. Shepard goes in, tries to get into a position to put this diffuser down, but the challenges keep on coming from BDS. They can't find the man though, as the cover is there. Dan gets it done. Are they going to be able to hold on to this too? Versus three as Leakerfight manages to find Dan, but this should really be an opening round for Virtus Pro. It should, unless we can see some magic come out here, but it's not going to happen. Shepard from range finds one more. Leakerfight's in full white flash as well. You've got a player out on the breach to deal with for one, and one still inside the building. It is not looking too easy for them. Straight up on the repel as well. They're going to dance around here, Tim. There's only about 10 seconds still to go, and it looks like through smash and grab, Virtus Pro are going to find round one, and that's a surprise not many expected. No, absolutely, and, you know, I've got to hold my hands up there. I said that coming in and trying to play the plant game, trying to play the objective against this BDS side might be difficult, but Virtus Pro have managed to do it. There was an important step that enabled them, though, and that was the kill from Dan onto Solotov. He managed to pick up Joystick, who was hunting him, but Dan knew that it was essential that that Solus was taken out, so he backed up his teammate and got the trade, and that really was the round-winning moment because Shepard then able to get it down. Dan again on the cover for the plant as well. Big, big round from him. Massive overall. And that, this has always been the thing that frustrates about me about Virtus Pro and equally about the old Team Empire at times as well is they had this real habit of being outplayed through most of the round. You've had a minute and a half wasted by the Romers. There's still a Solus on the downstairs, for example. There's a player underneath you whilst you're going in for the plant. Like everything is working against you. Yet they still manage to hit the shots when it counts. They still manage to get the diffuser down. They still have great cover. So even though they aren't playing Siege the way that most of the teams would, where it's all about tons of map control and so on and so forth, they take the smallest that they need and still manage to get these seemingly impossible rounds over the finish line. And it goes to show as well that we spoke about their struggles so far. They are so low down the table, as well as being shit hot at the entry. They're also exactly the same when it comes around to plants. They've got the most in the whole competition so far. So a very objective focused team, even with their struggles, and I still think for BDS, this is a game they should be rolling over you know, every day of the week, realistically. But for Virtus Pro, they do have this infuriating habit for some teams of being able to turn games on their head entirely. Leaky Fight not going to be putting the Bandit Battery down there. I'm not sure exactly what stopped him, um, but he was certainly heading in that direction before backing off. Instead, he's going to let the breach get opened, and he's going to pop a headshot onto Joystick from the rappel. So that's going to be a slightly different approach from Leaky Fight, but he's going to take his opportunity to drop away and get himself back down to the basement. 
Yeah, getting rid of the Capital is massive as well. Yeah, whenever I look for the first entry kills in a round, I'm always looking at those operators on the other side that are really critical to the round. So when you're looking on the defenders, it might be C4 wielders, those with recharging gadgets, you know, looking at things like the Legion there, although you do tend to see Legion out on their own quite a lot, things like the Wamai. Whereas on the other side, you might look more in towards these entry-focused operators. Uh, are you too bothered about catching a Jackal, for example, knowing that he ain't going to give you too much on the execute? Sure. Are you going to be ecstatic about catching out a Capital whose smoke and fire is really going to benefit the attackers in the execute? Absolutely. Especially if he was the one, for example, as a secondary hard breach being on the tin openers. In this round, I don't believe he was. But that's the kind of stuff that you don't start saying, well, that would have been critical to an execute, and now they simply can't use it. So a great first kill to find. And as you said, Tim, back to site alive and well. They've wasted a lot of time. Another beautiful round start from BDS. But I cannot ignore what I said about Virtus Pro at the end of that last round. Yeah, as you say, you know, a very good foundation defensively for BDS here, but still a lot of time that needs to be absorbed. Um, and despite the loss of the Capito, Virtus Pro have still got a lot of utility on side that they will need. They can get all the hatches open, they can get to tunnel. They've got always on the ram, going to be able to do a lot of vertical. We're going to see an impact nade come out and just take down one of those boogie drones, but always will continue battling from above, just trying to prevent the impact trick coming onto the hatch. That will be the hatch open so it's looking pretty good for Virtus Pro on the attack overall despite having that one man down they've got a lot of what they need here and look at the split they've got as well. Main stairs probably coming in from Shepard. You've got always hovering inside a kitchen. They've got two or three angles they can maybe push at the same time here if they want to. Or just Hail Mary it through the kitchen hatch if you really feel like that's the play, boys. But I wouldn't quite recommend it. Always has also worked its way in the back. Here we go. Actually joined up by Pasha on the move through together with the Fuser in hand as well. And Bride has got to get out of danger. But with that shotgun in hand, Tim... This is Murder Alley trying to push against him. Yeah, this is it. Bride knows that as well. If he can just keep that angle tight, even with the flashes coming in. Look at that. He knows that a second piece of utility is coming in. It doesn't stop him getting a double. One and two. Kiss, kiss, bang, bang. Leaves them in a 1v3. And that is Bride and BDS taking Church and Arsenal. And that really is how round one should have played out. Lots of time wasted by BDS, really forcing Virtus Pro into you know, what I described on a previous broadcast as forced errors. There's no time on the clock. You haven't got a choice about pushing into a shotgun. You have to push the shotgun and hope for the very best. But when it's a player of three days caliber sat there waiting, yeah, good luck. So again, well played in terms of time management, I think coming out from BDS, Virtus Pro had some of the right ideas. But fundamentally, that's a little bit too late to really get much done. And went a little bit limp there, I think, towards the very end of the execute. And it all started out realistically with this execute onto joystick from uh, from Leak back there on the Bandit. And then that really starts taking away a lot of the ideas they had for that Capital and able to make use of the smoke to cover off lines of sight. And to have to kind of stitch an attack together off the back of that. Bride has absolutely no right coming away with two kills there. Full white flash and still managing to find them on the tight angle with the shotgun. Uh, and it just goes to show the experience of the player really, knowing his angles around Dirt Tunnel, knowing the distances that he'd be engaging at and knowing that all he needed to do was press mouse one. And it was likely to be at least one, if not two. So well played from him, well played from BDS. And we've got what could be, uh, you know, more of a fight than maybe we first expected on our hands here. Virtus Pro with a very nice round one, great execute, created space well, and the cover was fantastic. And then BDS coming out with a very solid defense in round two. So both of them taking um, a share of the spoils at the minute here in the first two rounds. And we're going to have a CCTV and cash hold this time around. Solitov is out there on the balcony, on the garage catwalk with the Azami. Um, so it's, I'm looking to see how they're going to deal with him. Always does have have the Capito on side, so it should be relatively straightforward for Virtus Pro. Classic, I feel like we don't see it enough anymore. And we actually have sometimes seen things like clashes used and shields used as well. He's realized he ain't got time to get away with it as well. Wall open once again. It feels like a real throwback to the old days, doesn't it? A bandit tripping that we haven't seen that much truthfully for a long, long time. Whereas previously, it would be every single round on this site, there was some kind of tricking on the go. Honestly, I love bandit tricking. It's one of my favorite things. I think there's nothing more satisfying when you're playing on the wall, you're putting your battery down and you just hear that. 
as the exothermic gets taken off the wall. It's absolutely beautiful. And you walk beautiful. away like, cool as all hell. I don't worry, yeah, boys, got it. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's and what? Yeah. Especially if you get two. You're just like, yeah, no big deal. played them. Played them like a fiddle. Um, this arm construction wall is going to get opened by Shepard. Um, so that's going to be all of the breaching work done. Again, something that Virtus Pro do well, and it's no surprise with uh, with Shepard on side. He's one of the best really support players, um, you know, that we've seen consistently over the last few years. Uh, so... The fact that all that work is done, um, even with, you know, the Tuberau on side, the Bandit on side, they've got that denial, but still, the walls are open. Virtus Pro also starting to work from Master side as well. So BDS, are gonna be put under some pressure. And largely not paying any attention to Wolves Garage, instead of just going for this. I would say you need two sides really to make a push happen here. You could argue there's no north side to this side, but maybe you look at top red for that kind of push. But construction, platform, and then garage are one of the main three that you get, or two of the main three that you've got to pick from. And here they're really focused on trying to get the west side control as well as opening up that breach from the east. Joystick, we saw him down in the basement earlier, sniffing around. Here he's still down on that ground floor, just trying to make sure any rats that are lurking, leaky back in this case, are being sniffed out and exterminated. Going to have that utility thrown in over the top. Dan manages to pick up Solotov, so that's Garage cleared out as well. Shaco super low health here. He's going to take one bullet, and it's going to be always that finds it. Five versus two, and surely this is going to be another successful attack for Virtus Pro. BDS currently only able to hold on to that basement. They've got users, they've got Reading, who are going to try to keep a hold of it, but no, Dan moves in, finds a kill, and ultimately it's a flawless round for Virtus Pro, and they go two on it's just so carefully manufactured together these rounds i love it starting from that first kill from joystick dealing with the roma to take away any of the kind of upset from below that might come in the denial on the plant for example and even when these small windows of opportunity open like yuzu's getting himself onto the bomb chassis i was like how on earth has he got here where main breach is open he should not be here and i thought that he would find the man playing on west window but just the way timing works out with the c4 coming to hand finds himself shut down and just kill by kill by kill Virtus pro managed to work their way through each individual player on bds and make out a very very comfortable round three start to get a little bit nervous now for bds and i thought after that second round i was like you know what they've shown here they can defend they can waste time they can hang up they can trade things out no problem at all but Virtus Pro now having two on the board, starting to feel a bit nervous. This is it, BDS. We've seen it already. Uh, you know, we saw in the, the result against Ends where a couple of rounds started going here and there and you look at it and you think, yeah, it's BDS. They've been playing brilliantly. Surely they're going to come back. Um, and they just, you know, never really were able to get it done. And you just wonder if Virtus Pro can get themselves maybe a 4-2 half here. We know, you know, not maybe recently, but at least over a, a longer period of history, this is a team that knows this map inside and out. Um, and, you know, get them on the defense with an opportunity to get some points on the board, which could be really important. Let's not forget, Virtus Pro currently sit in eighth place out of nine. They're on four points. A win isn't enough to get them into the playoff places, but it's enough to get them close. It could potentially bring them within one point, and then you're looking at the last couple of play days thinking, yeah, you know, there's an opportunity to fight for one of those spots here. So as Fresh said, you know, they're not out of it yet. There is a possibility still for them to make it, and if there's any team capable of it, surely it's them. Here we go again. He's going to try and stick it this time around. He's really going for it. I think he might actually get it this time. Tim Wall stays closed. So they dealt with them so well before. This time around, no such joy. Concussions are gone from Dan as well. But it's just about wasting that time. Remember, it's not all about holding onto the site, straight all the room, sorry, straight the whole time. It's just about wasting time. And with that wall remaining closed now, Virtus Pro are going to have to figure out a new way through this BDS hold. Yeah, that's really big from BDS. They've tried it previously. They've iterated on it. They've managed to get the job done this time. And it is going to make life a lot more difficult because we saw last time, if you remember, Dan got a kill from Billiard's window, got a kill from gym window without that wall open he's unable to play that position so they have to double down they have to get it opened up that's now going to leave them reliant on pasha on the habana to get any other breaching done such as the jacuzzi wall but in all honesty it's likely to stay closed and that just allows bds a lot more freedom to play around that corner of the site at least for now they've got themselves cleared on through not clearly 100 percent sure that everything is actually fully cleared out here just even with six drones up on the field, a little bit nervous about careering their way through or slowing things down. Probably aware that the clock is becoming the end. Oh, no! It's almost like the reverse Shiko from a couple of weeks ago with that two tap onto the border barricades. Wonderful stuff to see. And I'm going to see a leaky patch just like, how? What? Why? How? Siege moment. 
It happens. It happens. It's, you know, always always take a few shots at each barricade that you see. You never know what's behind it, and you're never usually that short of bullets. Dan is going to take out utility from that gym window. They are using that same side of aggression again from the balcony, just trying to pressure the defenders. But BDS, they just feel a little bit more comfortable. And why is that? It's because this wall is closed. Shaco now able to play on this corner around Jacuzzi wall because of that exothermic being tricked early on. Asha hasn't gone over, over and opened it up. So now it's going to be difficult for Virtus Pro to get themselves in here. 15 seconds, they've got to get a diffuser down. Flash train towards Bathroom as well, opens them up to start their march on the floor, but Bride's got the sidestep here. Shaco into a second as well, and suddenly Virtus Pro starting to beat out members, but have found themselves one more back. They can't hit their shots, Tim. Solotov might find one more, but a two versus two with two seconds to go. It's all on joystick to do the lot here as well, but he can't hold off against both. Up on the bed is not going to be enough. Use with the close in 2k and once again the clock works against Virtus Pro. Yeah BDS having to fight really hard it's tooth and nail stuff here to try and get every single round on the board but the big moment there that I think won the round pretty much much like I said about Dan um, killing Solotov underneath in round one there was another one of those key moments and it was that bandit trick out on CCTV wall it came early in the round but it just depleted that hard breach utility and as you could see at the end of the round there BDS just far more comfortable by Shaiko sitting by Jacuzzi Wall. There was they were trying to build pressure towards Jim again, but as you saw, Dan had to dip away. He had to take the fight on Master Window instead. They had to try and plant on the bed, and it just wasn't ideal for them in any way, shape, or form. Whew. All right, two and two. We casters love a little saying, Tim. Uh, saying for this one is we've got, got a game, a game on, our on our hands. Really starting to build into one. We get that 3 3 half. Like, you can already feel with the way that the game has played out so far that overtime is on that horizon. It feels so early to say it, but the back and forth nature, unless we see a drastic change when BDS get on the attack, which I'm not expecting, they are no slouches at attacking. It does suggest we're going to have ourselves a very close game the longer this one wears on. Still, something quite interesting coming in this round, Tim. We've got the Ossa on side for Shepard. Now, the key thing to note is that actually, yes, guys, we are down in the basement. However, once again, BDS just cannot let Garage or Cash and CC go. Still got players playing up there and looking to waste time on the side of Virtus Pro. Yep, going to be Solitov this time. Leap get back in support as well. Going for potentially the same play again, but you're not going to catch anybody. You can see Leak just knows that the time is so short. He just has to go through the motions. It doesn't matter the fact that there's not an exothermic on the wall. It's like, no, I've got a barricade. I've got a battery. I've got to do it because there is so little time to get from one job to the other. But as it is, he's going to hold on to that wall for the time being. Versus Pro deciding they don't want to be burning any of that hard breach mm -hmm. utility this time and always has got himself inside probably going to be undetected here there might be an opportunity for him to catch out bds depending which way they choose to rotate back to site i like it it's the same as your remark back in round one bp take control of what parts of the map they need and nothing else and the reason why you've got always set up here around top main stairs hovering around bedroom is one to try and catch these players who might retreat through the side of this, this side of the map thinking it's safe but two to also protect pasha downstairs so he can still get busy inside a kitchen opening up the hatch playing that tricking game that we've seen them sometimes employ really looking at solitov when i say that but they can start thinking already about what the execute looks like later whilst always is just there as a little bit of security up on top floor and that is the problem with Dirt Tunnel being left soft. Of course, Breedy able to just spray through and take out a few of those Xkairos pellets because the wall was soft. I don't know how many detonated ultimately, but it may well be that it's not a uh, passable breach. There you go. It's not going to be. So more work is going to have to be done there. They do have the sledge on hand. They've got other operators that can get the job done. But again, it's all about time. It's just burning those seconds away to prevent. Oh, we're still back up to the top floor, still aware that there is somebody up there that needs dealing with. And it is Solitov. Just being a nuisance, right? It was Joystick who historically has been the player hunting him down. But for this site, as we saw previously, Capitao is what he stepped on. He was the entry death last time around when Likafax swung out onto main breach and got rid of him. So really trying to keep things nice and simple here. Probably playing in behind the smokes, which is why instead it's always playing off on that upstairs. He's done his work. Got themselves firing off in towards dirt so no one can swing in from there. And then making the play from here. But Likafax has got him behind. He slipped through the net and there is a fox in the coop, Tim. They've got the down there so sorely need. And Shiko into another as well. A BDS masterclass once again. Just dancing around this bird as pro sets up. So worth 
worried were they about Solotov on the top floor? They didn't pay attention to Lika back in the basement. And he gets the job done in a big way to set off a chain of events that becomes a flawless round for BDS. And that was a great defense of Church and Arsenal. Absolutely love watching that from BDS there. Just brilliant. Solotov on top floor never dealt with. Um, you know, enabling him to stay up there by playing that bandit on the CCTV wall again. Just never let Inverters Pro feel comfortable. As you said, they're happy to say, you know, we've got the bit of the map that we need, so we're just going to play with that. But they didn't have everything they needed. They didn't have control of bottom main. They didn't have control of Leakifac. And it was really well played from BDS. Great round. 2-2. Two, two. It's always been my concern, really, overall, for Virtus Pro again, is that things become a little bit readable. Like, they keep things nice and simple, which is nice to see sometimes. But the lack of cover here really just stung them. And the fact that it's crossed down, as you say, through main hall without anyone watching it is the real sting in the tail, I think. That would have really you know, upset Virtus Pro there. A good idea, a good execute with BDS and just like, we've seen this movie before. We know how to respond and fair play to leak it back. He's done exactly what was required of him. Up to our last round of the half then, Virtus Pro, one more chance to make this one work. And Tim, do my eyes deceive me? I believe we're on a bar stage defense, are we? Attackers must locate and we are. Yeah. There you go. There you have it. It's 3 2 as well. I was getting um, a little behind myself. I thought we'd only uh, tied up round four, but it is going to be round five. That's just been now, now, old man. It certainly is. It's, it's just been, honestly, such a, a fascinating and interesting game. It's just been, it's been easy to get lost in it, essentially, um, because it's, it's more about the individual battles, really. It's more about, um, you know, fighting over little corners of the map and who clears out the road who doesn't and um, everything else that's gone along the way the bigger picture has uh, slipped past me but Solotov he's going to be up on the top of garage once again we've seen this a few times knows that somebody's run past but the Nitro is going to be way behind where it needs to be and um, BDS will continue trying to hold on to this top floor though Likafak is there he's going to be trying for the trick again they've done a great job of keeping this wall closed so far and he's going back he's in back. for a little bit more he wants some afters Des to do what he can we'll keep it closed off here as well but still just the amount of time that he's wasting doing this round after round i really thought we'd see people start posting up for example on the west window will he get away with this no he won't uh, run buddy run. <laughs> no <laughs> i really thought he might die to the exothermic going off there but no just keep himself out and alive which is always good stuff but again that key thing for me is no one's really looking to play on the west window for Virtus pro of the, of, of the site or the room even not really the site in this case but it's one of those where a capital fiber over the top you can have some impacts coming in from that side from the zofia that can prove to be enough yeah every single time they've kept it pretty plain jane to be honest with you trying to make use of the drone hold to get the concussions in from the zofia instead of relying on emps coming out so they've got their own approach but i thought they might try and change things up once or twice just to upset the apple cart and catch out a player on bds or two you're just seeing the importance of the top floor here as well three bds players playing basically on top of each other at the minute it's because they really want to keep a hold of those verticals they've opened up they know that that is the route to a victory when defending at this site if you can just keep that locked down it's very difficult to get and get a plant but versus pro are doing well here the pressure's mounting now that they've got the windows you can see bds are dropping deeper and deeper if versus pro can continue this push get a couple of kills up on top floor they can start thinking about a plant but once again, as always, time is going to become the factor for Virtus Pro here. 40 seconds left to go. Still not in confident control of top floor. Still not in a push position to put the diffuser down. And still got players underneath that can impact on this round as well. Ash is really looking for something here as well. But I don't think he's going to find it. I was about to say, I'm pretty sure it's the bout that he's fighting off against here. But where have we seen this before, Tim? Just disruption all around the map. BDS trying to waste time. And here it comes again. Oh! Hughes is not going to lose that one out. Finds his man, Shoko, into a second as well. Really unlocking himself across these last couple of rounds. And with 10 seconds on the clock, yet again, Virtus Pro are forced to push in with nothing left to really work for them. No chance for mistakes. And unfortunately, Tim, they've made a good few of them. BDS will clean up and take the 4 to half. Yeah, and I just feel like those last two rounds, round five and six, um, uh, have not been good for Virtus Pro in that BDS have really come through and started to uh, to find their feet, it feels. They're winning gunfight after gunfight, flawless round in round five, of course, um, you know, and you just saw it there, just picking up kill after kill, user Shaiko, two dangerous players to be finding the confidence and hitting their shots like this. And 
Ooh, I'm a little bit worried for Virtus Pro at the switch of the half. I feel like now we go into that area whereby BDS can take the initiative. It's down to them how quick the game is played. As the attackers now, they can just get in there, get aggressive if they want to. If Versus Pro choose to play with anybody on the roam, they're going to be getting chased down quickly by players like Shaiko, I would imagine. And it's potentially going to be a tough one for Versus Pro to hold on to now. It is, but Tim, like I always say, two halves to a game of siege. This could be a very different outcome that we're expecting. And yeah, for all I was saying about like the time-wasting efforts from BD uh, BDS and Virtus Pro really letting the clock be their main driver in that first half, their executes were good. So I think you're seeing them a bit more on point today than what we've seen from them historically. Is it going to be enough to break them down EU's number one team? Probably not. But I wouldn't be surprised seeing them taking a few rounds here and BDS really being a bit out of options at points as well. Could be completely wrong. Could be an absolute rollover from BDS. But I do feel with how that first half went, we are seeing better quality today from Virtus Pro than what we've seen historically. Round seven is underway. 15 seconds in then. And we're going to have immediate attention probably towards dirt, I would imagine. We've got a ram on side, so we'd expect to see some kitchen control, a lot of verticals being opened up on and into site. And um, the question is, are BDS happy that they've got control of the map and able to move on in? It certainly looks that way. Um, but in goes the boogie drone to kick things off as Solotov manages to find down with a headshot for the entry. I'll give it some as well. For all I was saying about the entry battles earlier on and how BDS haven't exactly been the most mm, fortunate in it so far, should we say. They are 5-2 and two on the entry in this game, so going real strong so far. And Virtus Pro, I said they were the number one entry team that we've got in the whole competition. Definitely not looking like that, at least in this game. BDS just seems to be a few steps ahead, always got the pace ahead of them and seems to be catching them out with it. Yeah, and they can use the clock now um, as the attackers. It's not too often uh, that we say that, really. It's usually, all oh, the timing for Pasha there. So unfortunate, but that just again shows the great team play from BDS. Just getting in there at exactly the right moment, opening up that vertical and preventing the man being able to play the angle up onto the window. So really well done from them. Otherwise, they'd have been in danger of losing Breedy. As it is, the kitchen hatch gets open. Um, and again, BDS is another tick in a box for what is a very very check mark attack inside. There's certain steps that you have to complete. BDS now have a majority of them and can start thinking about how and where they will deliver this diffuser. Got the time to do it though, right? That's yeah, the most important part. 100%. They've got the entry. They've got the time. They've got all the utility in the world. They could possibly need to get it done. Shaiko and Capital, admittedly not something I thought I'd see all that much of in my lifetime, but here we are. Still have that available. I spoke about it quite a bit in the first half. He uses with the Grim as well. You know, lots of work they can do. Arguably, maybe a bit too much in terms of vertical destruction of both the sledge and the ram on side, but it gets the job done. As you can see, the ceiling basically completely opened up, and Lika back is in. Will he get away with it? Yes, just about slipping on through, but the round comes on through. Pasha's there and finds his man. The drop in C4 over the top. Pasha not going to find his man. Finally shut down, and Bride is dancing around smoke and fire and brimstone and everything else you can possibly throw at him, but he's still in one piece. Just got to be careful about this long angle, though. Going back towards the full, has always looked away. We'll round through. Find Shaiko. Find the second as well always is going absolutely nuclear makes it a 4k dancing around blue and church here and gets that first round on the board for Virtus pro you've got to feel that bds have, have let that one slip away a little bit and Vert and always particularly Virtus pro in general were more than happy to mop it up given the opportunity um you just feel like bds maybe didn't have enough information about what was going on inside a site shark or just shot from the side as always wanders into blue just didn't really have their angles locked down i think you know at first i thought the cover was good because shepherd sends out a nitro and I didn't he triggered it but I didn't hear it explode so I can only assume that that was shot out from the hatch maybe um, to protect the planter but BDS just didn't really get that final step done they'd done everything they needed to but Versus Pro stood up tall can't rely on a 4k from always every round but they'll certainly take them when it happens Woo. I do agree like, I had no idea across all of these kills exactly where always was totally out of sorts but up until that point in a good position, I thought. So hopefully it rolls over into this round. We see more of that promise coming out from BDS. It's not every single round that you're going to see a player going nuclear and picking up a 4K to clutch things out without having a single shot fired in his direction. Really good stuff. Change sites, of course, this time around. Going to find ourselves up on the top floor in gym and bedroom, Tim. 
Again, it's going to be a push across from the CCTV side that I would expect from BDS. We saw a great example of what can happen when you don't get that jacuzzi wall open, though. This is a site that needs multiple sides of pressure, and BDS need to make sure they pay attention to that. Yes, I do. I mean, admittedly, one thing I'm curious about we haven't seen too much of, I guess with it being banned away, actually, it's not the end of the world, but we spoke about the Tuberau earlier on, for example, in our earlier game, saying that often if you see the Maverick taken away, you'll see the Tuberau follow the same with the Kai pairing coming on through. And this is a spot now where with the Kai taken away, it's not seen as too much of a bother. It's why you're getting so much of this kind of old school bandit tricking gameplay coming on out. VIP at least being opened up and beat pre by the way. I saw this on his camera earlier on. I was like, the man likes playing in darkness. Everyone else? Place a relatively lit room for pre -day. Look at him. Man's a man of the night. I love it. The mood. <laughs> we see more of his glasses than him. Absolutely brilliant stuff. Um, Solitov then, he's going to be getting himself quickly on into Garage, just being cautious over any potential uh, presence inside of Oil Pit. Not going to be anybody down there that's going to be looking to challenge. I think Leakerfax just crouching around down there as well, maybe on the mid-level. Uh, yes, he is. He's just inside of stock. Um, so that's going to give them a lot of control here. Virtus Pro have had to fall back, but look at the area they're sitting in. Jacuzzi wall not open yet, and therefore Virtus Pro can feel safe playing in that area for now i would like to see bds get themselves open get that opened up but there is no exothermic charge it's going to be down to solotov on the ace to get that job done just got to make sure they can work through this side of the map relatively unscathed as well a lot of their drones slowly disappearing away here so that from Virtus pro back in the first half so it'd be un unfair to not mention for bds as well but a decent job being done of whittling down that information game where Virtus pro would often be down to three and about 75 seconds left here, it's only three out on the field with about 60 left on the side of BDS. So a similar sort of story, but now with themselves in some good positions, really looking towards a bit of logic control, I imagine. But they've got the south windows. They've got construction door in, in their favor as well. Lots of stuff coming together for the French side here. And now it's about the execute already with the scrim on side. It's going to help things out. Yeah, the plant is going to have to come on the master side because Jacuzzi Wall hasn't been open. They're going to have to go in behind kills. And that's exactly what they do as Shaco finds one, but always stands up users for the trade. This is a back and forth at the minute Virtus Pro managing to hang on in for the time being but Dan and Shepard find themselves in a two versus three diffuser is down cold at the minute and it's going to need to be collected by BDS so Virtus Pro with this little safe corner can the maybe play for a little bit of time Real danger is these keeper barriers are kind of working against them here, Tim. They're giving BDS something to play with. But Dan's on a full round here. One on towards main stairs. If he gets a shot in the back as well, this could be all they need. Finds one. Can he get a second? Yes, he can. Dan going completely unchecked. Undroned on the flank. And Virtus Pro will take another round, Tim. Things are all square. And look at the foundation. Look at where Virtus Pro were able to build that from. It was a brilliant flank out through logistics. But guess what? He went across the top of main stairs to get there. It was then a great kill onto the player trying to work up main stairs. But again, able to challenge that angle because Jacuzzi Wall hadn't been opened. It just provided too much safety, too much sanctuary for Virtus Pro. And they were able to build a great round from there really good defense from Virtus pro in the end it's one of those to look at again and always 4k in the previous round that probably shouldn't have happened a flank there that you'd really hope a team of bds's caliber would be able to capture given they had construction control they had the south balconies and that really was their go to execute yes including a backstab coming up main stairs but you hope at least there'd be something watching that one out and instead they just get stung and shot in the back as mentioned for Virtus Pro, they are not going to be complaining, Tim. Things are all square at four apiece. They're the ones on the defensive clubhouse here. Are we about to see them upset the current kings of Europe? Certainly a possibility at the moment, like you say, some uncharacteristic, uh, you know, mistakes essentially coming out of BDS. Not, um, I, I have to say, I, I'm sure that there's reasons for it and time's always a factor and other elements, but with that jacuzzi wall open it's not a guarantee you know maybe if Virtus pro feel that there's nobody on that breach then yeah you can sort of risk playing in that area you do get comfortable with it after a little while you think nobody's there um but there's a good chance that maybe they're not playing in that area they don't have the freedom to go for the flank to challenge onto me um and bds might just rue that decision come the end of this one as they find themselves now 4-4 they're going to be attacking on to cctv and cash my question is do they keep 
keep it simple? Is it just purely breaching garage? Or do they try to separate themselves, split up a bit, and get some construction pressure on the go as well? Well, obviously, back in that first half, we saw the main focus from Verdus Pro being that split more horizontally, getting the main breach opened up, and then construction control being on their side, and that was really their game plan. That's what they did. Whereas on BDS's side, at least looking in towards what the operators they've got here, the Capital, you see that immediately. You would have seen that being a catwalk push coming on through. So look out for that, probably coming up against Joystick, given that he's sat currently on the Azami. I'll say currently, we'll be for the rest of this round, but he'll be sat in there holding him tight. So it's all down to BDS's team play here to get him removed, of which really when I think about it, BDS is one of those teams that are excellent at that style of team play. Should be able to clear their way through, but we've seen Virtus Pro hitting some pretty naughty shots this game. Drawing will continue for the time being, just making sure that nobody's playing underneath, of course, looking to get that late position inside of lounge for the uh, vertical denial, potentially. Likifak is just positioned on the knot. I mean, we've seen, uh, you know, an awful lot of knock play from Likifak over the last 18 months or so. Uh, the operator, of course, dropped off in popularity after the changes to the nades, but can still be really, really, uh, sort of really self-sufficient. Do still have nades, also has hard breach, plenty of options. Look at that from always though absolutely firm in it doesn't matter that the floor is opened underneath him and that's the kind of bravery i love to see on a bandit trick he's going in for Anders. no way he's not gonna get it no. he gets blasted <laughs> in the face by the exothermic and what a passage of play we've just seen from hero to zero you know what? I admire the balls on that man. Sticking that out, for it. thinking I love that maybe it. you've got it. Yeah, I'll, I'll always back it. I'll always back it. It's just more the fact that he could have been blown up from one more hit from below from Saltov, for example, and he still goes in for it. Good stuff, but for BDS now, that puts them in quite a commanding position. 5v3, and they've got this split up here. You can see Shaiko out towards the west side. They've got the main breach. Still got to be concerned about joystick appeal inside a garage, but you can see with two or three players converging on this side of the map, that just screams to me that they want him gone. Gonna have the flame arrows going in. Joystick looking for Beautiful. the fight, but nope, that's how you deal with garage catwalk. It's all up to Shepard, manages to find one. That's at least gonna prevent the flawless round, but he's got an awful lot ahead of him. It'd have to be a 1v5 ace clutch if he wants to close this round out. Speed. And look at his hit points. Just a little tiny flashing red sliver at the bottom there. Very little for him to go with. Taking the jump out, knows is the opportunity. He does manage to get another, but the cover is there. And that's going to be the round as we expected for BDS. But always, oh, what a... I tell you what, he pulls that off and he wins the round. It's as simple as that. But I think sometimes excitement just gets the better of us all, Des. And he thought he could get back in. He knew that he couldn't really. That was a head and heart situation. His head knew that he didn't have time, but his heart dearly wanted him to. So brilliant. It's uh, those things that tickle me. Same as the exothermic death that followed through just after. You know, the jump out at the end as well to try and deny the plant off. A really good round overall, at least in terms of entertainment value. But BDS in full control. And I spoke about it earlier on. I love seeing teams that can execute onto individual players as a team. Dare I say it, it's the word that many look at and call split theory. Can we get an overwhelming numbers advantage onto an individual player somewhere on the map and crush down onto them? And that's exactly what they did inside a garage. The double firebolts come on through. The man's forced to step up and walk away. And guess what he's running into? The waiting arms of two BDS players, and it's the one on the garage door that gets him. Really good stuff. Really good play. Virtus Pro, though, I don't think will be too bothered about it. They did take those first two rounds. They can get more. So they only need, really, to get themselves a couple on the board. They're pushing towards overtime. The BDS, though, it's only one round to get to that point. Virtus Pro, I think we'd all agree, need those points far more right now. Oh, 100%. As we already know, BDS locked into the playoff places. They have uh, got the job done, essentially. And as, as Fabian pointed out, really, as much as you want one, you know, first or second, you want to sort of assert that dominance. You want to put that image in the other people's heads. Oh, you know, God, we don't want to play BDS. And um, But at the same time, like he said, you know, not playing in that first round of the playoffs. Sometimes the other teams get into the groove with the best of three, and it can be a tricky situation. So I don't think either way will be the end of the world for BDS, but like you say, Virtus Pro, they're fighting for their lives inside of uh, stage one at the minute. They want to, uh, you know, have that opportunity to get themselves to the major. So lots of work for them to do. Next couple of rounds, particularly important, but look at this, BDS getting really aggressive towards Sight, Des. Oh, they know where he is as well. So Shaiko is just like, oh, yeah, free target practice. 
He's got to be so careful where he's holding himself in here as well. Got himself inside the motor for that exact reason. And traps him out with the fire as well. This is looking good, but the fire's on them, Tim. They're burning alive inside of there. Shepard's going to bring down Solotov. It's not super ideal. More fire comes on through. What the hell is going on? Absolutely torched by the Goyo for the most part, but Yuzu's is in. Finds one. A second down main corridor as well. It's backstab galore here, Tim. As the French side are just running over Virtus Pro. Yuzu's completely unchecked, and they'll get the close out they need. BDS up to map point. You got a feel for Virtus Pro there. It feels like BDS have just flicked a switch and said, you know what, we're going to have to hit sixth gear on this one and really start to accelerate. You saw it from the intention from the beginning of the round, straight into blue, really aggressive. And it's uh, the reason I say it's a shame for Virtus Pro, they'd set up for it. They knew they had the Goyo canisters. They were burning them out in there. They were just really preventing them moving. But Yuzus just comes on the other side and does Yuzus things, takes down one after another and closes out the round along with Leakerfax. So as you say, BDS getting themselves now onto map point. And I just feel like that might really have broken the spirit of Virtus Pro in this one. Oh, that's always been the battle for them is, you know, with how well they were playing and that first half, although again, the map control, they didn't really have on side any of their executes. I thought the gunplay was good enough that they might be able to get a few rounds over the line. And we saw that in their first round of this half with always popping off with the big 4K. But since then, it has felt like a little bit more of a battle to get things done. BDS just got that extra pace a few steps ahead. Like I said, the team play they've got is on point here. And so Virtus Pro just feeling the heat a bit too much right now. They need to hold on for two rounds. We're starting things off down in the basement once again. Totally feeling they can correct from past mistakes. And BDS have got their own game plan. They're going to show uh, Virtus Pro how to pull off an Arsenal execute, probably through the kitchen hatch again, which is exactly where they managed to get stung out by the leak back, uh, backstab, if you recall, on the bandit earlier in the game. Look at this quick work already from BDS. They're not aggressing towards site, but they are getting straight in there with the easy hard breaches. Yep, we know we want dirt open. Get it done inside 15 seconds. We can focus elsewhere. We're going to hot drop into logistics. The drone is already there. We can work through onto the verticals now. Double leveled, so the challenges are more difficult if they want to try and fight against us. Really, really good, decisive play coming in from BDS. And like I say, I don't feel like they've looked like this throughout the entire game but the last couple of rounds they really switched it on they have and i imagine it's only going to continue coming into this round here tim as mentioned keep your eyes on the also that'll be the main focal point of this round but there is going to be some setup work to do first which then puts the question back onto Virtus Pro is what are you going to do to disrupt this how can you get up and be aggressive in the faces of bds so you don't give them full time to execute i think back to bds from two or three years ago actually on this exact map and they always used to say, like, if you're not roaming against BDS, you are signing your own death warrant. They were so good at dropping into four or five different spots around the basement and just overwhelming you with gunpowder. And often they'd do it with 70 seconds still left on the clock because they'd done all they needed to. Oh, there's no roamers. We've got the vertical control we need. We're ready to go in through hatches. But why dance around for another 45 seconds when we can go literally right now? And I don't think that means BDS will go fast here. But they are very, very capable and very confident pushing into this map at the right sort of time. We've got the drone bug. That's unfortunate. There we go. And we're up and over. <laughs> Angles being used from above them. Plenty of verticality, as we know. Shepard's going to take a little bit of a crouch walk up towards the end of dirt. I think he just wants to check whether any pressure is coming from there or not. He's going to want to play the entirety of the round in there if he can do. But how about that? Nitro over the top. One of the oldest in the book. Pasha manages to find his man, drops the diffuser, uses straight in there to collect it. Going to be sending the bees on into sight. Have a little buzz around and see what they can see. But... He knows that he's being challenged from down there. Gets aggressive, goes in, finds one, but the trade is there. Pacha is finding his second in the round. But BDS, they've always got an answer, Des, especially over these last couple of rounds. Breeday in a position that he could potentially plant here. The Osa is gone, so the shields will not be there. Leakerfat can do nothing. He's going to have to stick this now, Breedy. He's managed to do just that, but now they've got to win all the gunfights coming out. Pasha, who's kind of a hero in the round, finds himself shut out. And Shaiko and Breedy in a clutch situation. <laughs> Would you rather take anyone else? Maybe you'll have to, Tim. Playing the dancing game here. Can't quite down his man and get shot from off towards the other side. Always. He's managed to work his way through. Breedy has ditched his man and said, nah, this one's all on you, mate. Oh, he's got a trample up a 1v2. Right sort of idea. And it pulls always up, but always is in for the swing. Virtus Pro, hold on. When will this game stop going so back and forth?
BDS have got to feel hard done to there. Shaco taking so much damage off players, but not finding kills in the 2v2. Just left Breeder in a very difficult situation. And again, he almost did the right thing. But I think in killing the Malusi, he actually thought he'd got the, place, the player who'd been disabling the diffuser. And maybe the cover was from boxes or from else. I think he expected the cover from elsewhere and then heard the movement but was kind of too late into his own movement. It was so tough for him, but Virtus Pro doing really, really well to hang on there. It was almost as if they weren't aware of the diffuser going down. There was, um, you know, no opportunity at least for them to get round and challenge that, but a great retake from them. And as you say, this one just keeps going. 12 rounds of, of almost madness so far. Whew. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? I joked about it earlier on that you might see it, but it was a 2-2 two -two and I was like, you know what? We're seeing enough quality today from Virtus Pro, at least in the gunfights, that I think they could drag some rounds out and get us towards overtime. But it is building yeah, up towards that point. Just one more to go. The battle being Tim, they're going to have to go and play for those other two sites, which might yet be a grave undoing. You know what? For a second, I was like, Breed you have ditched your man. You've left. dropped out of Arsenal here. You've left Shyko to get you know, shot onto completely separate and really just waited exactly. to kind of play yeah, off the diffuser itself. But it's worked out wonderfully. Breeder with a big 1v2. BDS, at least it, at six and four. Sorry, almost a 1v2, but always gets that closing kill to turn things over the way we've now seen. Jim and Bedroom going to be the last site of regulation and could be the last site of the game. And it could secure BDS those three points to really ensure they hold on to that crown at the top of the table. But as I said earlier, Tim, crazier things have happened so far already today. Yeah, Versus Pro defended it back in round eight, if you remember. They were able to lock it down with a big flank from Dan um, after BDS were forced to push on in because of a bandit trick early in the oh, round. But whoa. that is not going to help. Pasha taken down. We've said that BDS have been increasing the speed, increasing the pressure. They've gone up a gear and they just proved that point inside 38 seconds. Solotov takes down Pasha and gives BDS a big advantage in the fight for three points. The ace as well. Like, <laughs> we speak about entry players playing ace quite a lot these days. I think it was Doki who first said it. It's like, you know, once you've used your utility, you're in for it. You can do a lot yourself. You've got a great gun. Use the Selmas and away you go. I'm not quite sure what I think most had in mind when an ace is the one charging into the building, going in for a one versus one, but he caught Pasha completely unawares there. Great shutdown. And I still love that, like we've seen most of today, given it's all been on Clubhouse, a lot of respect being shown with the IQ being brought along to deal with the Valkyrie. Three days over on that jacuzzi wall this time. Last time I was critical of it not being opened. It was the position that Virtus Pro were able to turn the round from. But this time they will have no safety, no security stood inside of that corner. So what BDS have done there is just take away another spot for Virtus Pro. They've forced them out of another angle. Look, Dan's having to run into that area just to get away from the Rotero drone. And Virtus Pro are increasingly having to take risks. Some rounds, these keepers actually worked against them, if you recall as well, right? It just gave a lot of avenues for BDS to move in, planting behind them on the bed, for example. Not too much they had to worry about. Right sort of idea, though, with the green coming in over the top. Step him out, and sure enough, Users has found him on the long angle. It's a 5v3 team, and they've got to hold on here for 50 seconds, but it feels like it's going to be impossible. This is it, and look at the tiny area that Joystick is trying to play inside no, of at the minute, and gets closed down as well by Shaiko. And that happens when you open up those breaches and you take away those areas of refuge. Always looks to get aggressive onto the breach. It's not going to happen. Leak, in fact, manages to get the kill. Shepard in a 1v5 again, gets himself back to 1v3. Can't quite make it 1v2. And the problem is they know exactly exactly where he is right now. So Shaco goes in, Shaco can kill, Shaco can plant. He's going to secure the diffuser. 1v2, Des, can Shepard do this? Surely not, like surely. They're up on the repel, Tim. They're lay down outside. They're really playing this one to the absolute nth degree. Surely he doesn't have the read on it either. I doubt he gets to stick it. He might well try, but it's going to be a bit of a bait attempt onto these other two players here. In comes Leaky back. In fact, no, it's a bit of a bait on the other side, but Shaiko drops at the same time. Good bit of closing team play from BDS. It was close to going to overtime, but the French team take all three points. Yeah, good stuff from BDS there. Just locking out a difficult game. We know that Virtus Pro have got the ability inside of the server. They showed us that today, but... Unfortunately, they've come up against the top team in EUL who keep on proving game after game exactly why they are the top team.
Yeah, exactly that, right? They are the team to beat right now. They're at the top of the table. They've got things and amends they want to make after last year. Remembering they didn't end too strong last year. Didn't get themselves at SI. It was a very eerie place without them. But with how they've played so far this stage, Tim, Manchester is almost there to the taking. Yeah, it certainly looks that way. They're going to be heavy favourites, I'm sure, going in there. You know, certainly from the EU region, um, they're going to be our our top team, it would appear, at this point. If if they get there, they're not there yet, but they're certainly looking like they're cruising their way there. Uh, see, we Brits can kind of adopt them because they've got users on side. We can sort of <laughs> pretend, but it is going to be weird when the Brits are cheering on the French. Anyway, we're done with this game. Let's go over to the desk and get their thoughts on how it went. Thanks so much, Ace and Dez. Three points for BDS, kind of what we expected from this game. But let's be honest, it was probably a lot closer than we expected it to. Yeah, a lot closer. I mean, we didn't expect Virtus Pro to show up the way that they did. Let's give props to them first, because I think that they really stepped up their game. Yep. This wasn't a BDS that was poor in any way, shape or form. Or reminded us about last week. This was a BDS that we've seen from before. And then just a Virtus Pro that we've been missing. Yeah, Virtus Pro so much improved in performance, yep. but I think the big issue right now is they're running out of time. Yep. yep. You know, in, in terms of, unfortunately, they've got, what, two games left in terms of trying to save their season. You, you know, overtime felt like they would have, I feel, I feel like they deserved overtime because they put in a great performance. It was much improved. They played pretty well. You know, a couple of attacking rounds go the other way. They maybe even win it in regulation. They've lost it in regulation though. And at this point in the season, when you're at that point in the standings, the points matter so much more than the performances. It, it's rough having your first like really, really good game against BDS. Yep. At yeah. this being against any other opponent on this map, they win. I think they win, yeah. I think that the, like sure, they lost Clubhouse twice, but would they have done that? Or no, they won it once actually. Yeah. They won against V2, then they, they lost it once. Would they have lost the first one? I don't know. It is really difficult though, because like you said, this is the point where you're going to start to wonder like, oh, will we have gotten one point from this? Yeah. Maybe we would have been in a safer position. We maybe we've gotten one point from another game. It's always that woulda, coulda, shoulda, I guess, uh, in this regards. But something that we talked about in the green room when it comes to BDS and their preparation for this game is that when playing against Virtus Pro, you have to prepare way differently than when you're playing against any other team in Europe. Yeah, this is a big challenge that BDS haven't really had to face yet. Every other team, they've been able to go in and they've been quite free flowing. What's the strengths of this BDS team is that they do the process well, but actually they've got individual talent on top of that. Yep. Playing Virtus Pro as, as a team, you've got to play as a team against them because that's the kind of game they drag you into. And playing them on Clubhouse, which also facilitates that kind of play, meant that this was a whole new dynamic for BDS and they passed that challenge. Yeah, in the first game I mentioned, it's hard to play against teams that are maybe not at the level of the others in EUL. And this is a very different way of doing it, right? Because now you're playing against a team that's playing a very different play style, mm -hmm. but they're very much up there at the top of the league and being able to compete for it. Sure, in the scoreboard, they're not right now, but they are a very good team. They have all those basics. So it's, again, it's so, so different because if you challenge them, yep. they will shut you down because they're sitting there holding their angles. And if you give away something, they will never let you claw it back. It's it's a hard team to play against. And, and that's the thing is, is win conditions of rounds in Siege, when you're playing Siege at the minute, generally is gunfights and yeah. playing a man advantage situation. Against Virtus Pro, it's not a lot of the time. You've got to change that win condition yeah. and move it over to being time-based, execute-based. Yeah. And for BDS, we didn't know whether they'd do that or not playing against Virtus Pro. They did. Their defenses, yeah. they're sat in, they're roaming, they're getting themselves back to site, they're playing 5v5 executes and then collapsing on the back of it. It was the right approach and they yeah. executed a path. I mean, I said it the first round in the green room to you, that in the first round of gym defense, they're playing Asami. That will deny time for Virtus Pro, which is something mm -hmm. they run out of a lot. They played Goyo for the exact same reason. And then they played Solace to deny the drone game because basics is drone game. And that's what Virtus Pro is good at. And they countered with three operators immediately straight into it. A few things we saw as well, I think it was one round where it was a church defense. We saw someone bend it tricking the CCTV yeah. wall. It's yeah. so far spread out, really trying to make sure that they waste as much time as possible from Virtus Pro because that's where the rounds start to look really long and that's where Virtus Pro starts. Yeah, so it's, so it's the one, two, threes, right? You have that on Clubhouse. You have to play very strict and follow the strats. That's mm -hmm. what BDS had to do with this game, which is why they can't rely so much on frag power. But if we look at what Virtus Pro do, as we said, they, they repeat the same thing over and over and over, which means that BDS looked at that, okay, we can ban the trick CCTV, we yeah. play a player on catwalk as well to deny them from taking garage and then also denying them from clearing CC, which is the default for them. All of a sudden, they have to completely change their plan, make adaptations, and what have they been really bad at this season? 
adapting. Am exactly. I finishing your sentences now? You're finishing my sentences. Yes. Yeah. But that, that's the thing, right? Is It's a small investment of utility, but a constant small investment of utility all over the map to buy yourself 10 seconds extra wasted. Another 10 seconds wasted. So when that execute comes in, there's barely any time, and then that's when the defenders, defenders have the big advantage. Yep. It was a matter of discipline today, and I thought, you know, I thought BDS actually executed that really well, which we didn't know if they would or not. It's a very different test. They finished it, and they made it three points is all that matters. Three points are really important, and then, you know, because of how important these last few days are, we're bringing up the standings a lot more to discuss those and see where our teams are. We said BDS is the only team that has confirmed top six today. They will remain the only tip, a team that has confirmed that top six for today. The other teams are still too far away. They're rolling even further away. Look at that 12 point. It's a five point difference to the number two currently. Yep, it's a five point difference. It's pretty much at this point, I believe that only into the breach that could actually overtake them. And that might not be mathematically accurate based on other people, but I'm fairly sure it's close. Um, and into the breach would have to win two in regulation and BDS, you know, not be able to pick up any more points for them not to be number one. So in, in my eyes, mathematically it might not be done, but BDS are going to be a top two team coming out of EUL. Yeah, they're going to be. There's no even discussion about that. It's, it's just when you see a team that are dominating as they are, maybe, yeah, today it was almost like it was 12 rounds, but they're very dominant in their play style. Mm. They are this good. They're going to be a top two team and they're going to be at the major. Sorry, production. Can you just pull those standings back up again for a second if you've got them? Can I test you? So the one thing that just spoke out to me at the end, look at the round difference, by the way. Every team is competing in the pack and I think we'll talk about that pack. So from second down to what, seventh? Yeah. Look at the round difference. It's close to one plus minus, you know, two, three. BDS plus 18. Like, that's how far and away they are clear in this. I mean, there is a team with a higher number on that plus minus. It's wild. Negative 19. All right, all right. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing, right? They're very uh, different when it comes to the round difference, but also the difference between that. BDS is five points away from Into the Breach. That is more than Secret and Third are away from Wild all the way in ninth place. So that's been really, really close. But I think, Fabian, there's two players you really wanted to highlight that made this performance so significant. Yeah, so there's two players I wanted to highlight. We can bring up Yusus immediately because obviously he had a great, great game. He played phenomenally. And this is the thing with all these players in BDS. All of them can show up one day and be mechanically dominating the server. Yeah. Today it was Yusus. It could have been any one of them. I mean, he's the top rated player in EUL. Yeah. But the, the one thing that I consistently said, and you'll remember when he was on the desk with me ages ago before you went back to G2, that we always said about Yusus, is he's a match winner, he's yeah. a round winner, is that he provides that consistency in that kind of flex role that you want. Yep. But those late round situations, he is absolutely unflappable and will just win you rounds. I mean, there's a reason I wanted to pick him up three times during my career, both as a player and then as a coach. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. Just, yeah, he is one of the best players. He actually declined us, that's the funny part, from, from Eminem. He said no twice. Um, whatever reason he had, I don't know, but uh, he enjoyed his team. And the consistency we've seen from him since he changed over to BDS, that's my biggest like issue with him. He wasn't consistent. Now he is, and he's playing really well. There's one more player, though, and this one doesn't surprise anybody because it's Shaiko. But the reason is probably surprising to everybody. Shaiko today, he played operators we don't normally see from him, and this is something you couldn't expect from him. He played three rounds of Flores, two rounds of Capital, and one round of Deimos. Who in their right mind would have said three months ago, yeah, we're going to see Shaiko play a flex support, flex player role, and be like, yeah, that's serious. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody. And especially on this map as well, because previously when Shaiko was on old BDS, yep. he would be on an ARX operator with yep. a bit of Ayana exactly. or Nomad, and he would take the same routes because he was played on a gun and played to get kills. If it was a basement attack, he would take blue only. Yep. If it was a gym attack, he would take construction. You could basically path out his routes because the investment was put into him and kills. Now he's playing for the team with utility with those operators. Yeah. Big it, change for him, but it's good to see as well. It, it shows flexibility, and that's one of the things that you need to see with players. Usually, when you have a player that's very one-dimensional, that suffers for the entire team. Shaiko has turned out from being a very one-dimensional fragger to a multi-dimensional Superman. That is a big improvement because a bit of a trip down memory lane. I remember SI in 2023 in Montreal. There was this graphic where we showed Shaiko versus League Effect, the operators that they played. Yeah. Shaiko only played Yana. League Effect played like 23 operators or something. So seeing that from Shaiko is absolutely insane. I'm really happy to see that kind of flexibility from him specifically. But we, of course, have one more game today for Europe League. Our final game of the day will be G2 versus Wolves. We'll be back in a bit.
always eager for new experiences, she enrolled in the Bold Eagle program at 17, where she excelled in basic military training, while benefiting from the guidance of, guided, guidance of community elders and indigenous instructors. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say he bad. Had it not been for Sky's medical training, Nomad may have not survived the incident in the north. Everyone knows that uh, Dogabe and Nomad is really good friends, so it's Dogabe. Incorrect. Yeah, is it, th is it Thunderbird? Oh yeah! Following Operation Catalyst, he was handpicked to join the Special Air Service Regiment SARS so long as he passed election. I was gonna say mute because it might be like a thing about him being quiet, but I think I'm gonna say Sledge. Grew up as the middle sibling in his family, and I do believe he had to put extra effort to be heard or noticed, which explains the showman side of his personality. Has to be mute, then. Oh, so now I have a chance to steal, right? What? Okay, okay, it's it's Jaeger. It's Jaeger, it just has to be Jaeger. No! <gasps> what? Wait, but... No! 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 I forgot, you can... Be in the SES if you're Australian. Encouraged to reach the stars from an early age, she studied aerospace engineering with a view toward becoming a fighter pilot. I don't, I don't even. I know it's not Ella, but I can't like, and it's not Ibana. Who who else is a woman in the game? Her face lights up when she tells the story of watching the landing on Titan with her mum, or of her precious few days on the International Space Station. Can I steal? Yeah. I hope I'm not wrong here. Is it Ayana? Ding dong! Early persecution in sponsored computer programming. Competition lead to her joining the army. Cadets at 16. I'm gonna have a little think here. Could be Dokubi. Could be Twitch. <clears throat> I'm gonna say Dokubi. No, no, no. Okay. I think I might know who it is, I'm just saying. It's endemic of the perfection her family installed in their children. Her father told her to strive to be incredible every day and that it will be resonated out into the universe. Oh god, I don't know. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say Twitch. It's Twitch? Oh, boom. Did you know that, Benja? Yeah. Consistently the best at whatever he sets his mind to, he easily imagined himself as an admired paediatric surgeon and enrolled in medical school. Doc. Oh, come on, Story. His persona drives him to congenial and to excel in working closely with his peers, at least until the time comes to give a post-mission interview. Rook. Okay, is it zero? Because it said, like, get to give a post-mission interview. Oh. Oh, oh nah, that's an obvious one.
We're back with our final game of the day. G2 and Wolves both sitting at eight points. Who can jump up further away from that big group of teams that have all got similar amounts of points and really set themselves? I know, I know. Whichever team wins. Yeah, okay, that, that, that's a very good shout indeed. I mean, obviously three points would be ideal, but there is a scenario where we mentioned ends. They can drop very far if they're supposed to overtime. I mean, that will still be for us to unfold, of course, but looking at the first team, looking at G2, um, of course, they've attended a side. We've seen that from them. It went pretty well, despite not winning a side, of course, um, but we've seen a bit of mixed results from G2. They've only got one more game after this. They really need to step up. You know, and the mentality in a G2 team is that second place is first loser. So third pl fourth place is what? Third loser. You don't want to lose if you're in G2. You should be winning every single event because you have that backing from the organization. You have those players within the team and you have that staff backing them up. So they should be winning every event. This stage has been pretty rough, very much up and down. We're not seeing much team play from them. We're kind of relying on individual performance from players stepping up mm -hmm. and then obviously players not trolling like Benya did against Into the Breach last play day and dropped like two kills. So you can't afford those plays when the rest of your win conditions is basically individual performance. All of these players are just so disgustingly good, right? Yeah. In, in you know, in their own times, they've all been the star man and in a, in, in a, in a way a star fragger of a previous team, a, a team that a player that that team was built around. Sorry, I can't really get my words out here because all of these players shouldn't be in the predicament that they're in, no. which is mid-table mediocrity, right? This should be a top-of-the-table team, realistically, being a juggernaut alongside BDS to, to duke it out for those top two spots to be the team that is the best team in Europe. They're not there yet, but it's also G2. It's not that hard for them to get back there. I, I don't know if you say that they're not there yet. They won SI a year ago. They should never even have left that place. You can't go like a roller coaster up and down, up and down, up and down, and then expect everything to be happy dandy. That's just not how it is. The fans have bigger expectations on them. The org has bigger expectations on them. They should be better than they are. They have no excuses for why they are not. So it's only themselves they can blame. I mean, that Asai win, of course, is very good. I mean, you'll see teams often after they have a bit of a dip, but still, as you mentioned, these players have that individual star power to be able to really solidify this roster. Mm -hmm. We have a comparison as well between, of course, their performances from SI with their performances from this stage. Yeah, it was just a, a valid comparison, and I think you can see, realistically, you've got SI stage, uh, SI 2024 on the right-hand side of your screen, stage one this stage on the left-hand side of your screen. Now, statistically, SI is looking better, apart from a minute detail in attack win rate. But G2 were dominant at SI on their defense win rate. They were not allowing people to get entries on defense. They were not allowing people to get set up, get into the map. They were literally just bossing them. This stage, they're not. And I think yep. that's the big difference so far with G2. Attacks are actually decent. They're, they're somewhat decent. A 50% yep. attacking win rate, this meta, is great. Really good. It's just the defense at the minute that's letting them down. It needs to be a massive step up. And I think one of the big changes for them is actually like the ADS time change that we've seen. Because these players are so heavily reliant on that individual fragging potential that they like to play aggressive. They like to jiggle peek their corners and they like to go up in their face. They can't do that with the new ADS time because it's just too slow for them. They need to find themselves again and I don't know if they have that today. I think especially that defense win rate is really um, surprising to me, how it's dropped so much after SI. Um, talking about their opponents, we've got Wolves here. Wolves, we've only seen them once last week. That was a 7-1 that they got against Wild. And then they got a day to rest from the very tough and difficult matchup. Yeah, they did. It's, it's kind of hard to judge where Wolves are at because of the last week and the fact that obviously they did have one game off. But Wolves are, uh, are a team that have are on a similar path, I would say, to G2, where they've had to rely on individual performances. As you can yeah. see there on your screen, Mowgli and Deadshot in particular, so good in terms of those big multiple rounds, those big clutch rounds. It is those two. The rest are all negative, the rest are all low APS. And I think that's one of their, I suppose, underlying problems. Last week we saw them put in a complete performance, but it was against Wild. Yeah, they need to step up, and it just seems that their team play is very much lacking. So I think that they're pretty much in the same spot, these two teams, because Wolves have been attending all the events as well, and they've been doing really, really well for what people have never really considered them favorites from Europe, but they always keep doing pretty decent. Yep. But they have lost their team play, because they're looking, as you said, it's Mowgli and Deadshot show, and that should not be the way it is, especially in a team that we remember from last stage. They played so aggressive, so much together, and we did see a glimpse of it in last play day, but then again, their opponent was probably not up to the standard. There's a really nice kind of juxtaposition of these two teams in this matchup here, in that 
both teams have had a season that's relied on individuals' yep. performances to take them over the line. But actually, who will win this game today will more or less be determined by which team can put in the most complete team performance. So we're looking for, I suppose it's the same story for both teams. And last week as well, we of course saw the interview with Helby saying that, you know, they're happy having that extra day to prepare against G2. The map might be a big part of that as well, what they're going to want to play against G2. I just hope it's no clubhouse because that would be four times clubhouse today. No, it's the other staple in our map pool. We'll be heading to Oregon. Yeah, I think clubhouse was getting put away by G2 pretty early after they've lost a couple of times on it this stage. Both teams have a very, very high preference for Oregon did want to see labs i'm not gonna lie but yeah both teams have a very high preference for oregon it's one that g2 absolutely adore yeah but wolves also love it at the same time as well i mean it's the one that wolves always want to go to and it's the one that g2 pretty much always wants to go to as well the one thing the one thing when wolves last played it um i can't remember the team they played it against but i do remember them um not executing as a team a lot of the time for example kids dorms attack they would do a west clear they would bring the book to move the player out of um, the kid's room and then try and plant on the big window. And the book was just absent. There, there was executes going off while people were still in spawn, all sorts of stuff. So I hope they've improved for their sake from that time because they looked awful the last time they played it. We'll hope so for rules, but our players are ready. The game is ready. So we'll stop talking and directly send you to our casters for one more time. We'll take it away to Ace and Dez for Oregon between G2 and Wolves. Thank you very much, Shannon. The guys on the desk. Yes, last game of the day, Tim, and it feels like a real EUL classic as well. G2 coming up against Wolves, and it has to be on a map like Oregon, of course, right? It certainly does. What better for a classic matchup than a classic map? And that is exactly what we are going to get. Um, I said this to you at the beginning of the day. I'll say it again now. I think this could be um, a real cracker. It wouldn't surprise me to see a little bit of overtime. It wouldn't surprise me to see these two, um, you know, bouncing back and forward. Maybe similar to what we had in the previous match with BDS and Virtus Pro, but just going the entire distance because these two at the minute, they're close to each other in terms of the league. They're on the same number of points. It's just seem to be on very similar sort of stories at the minute in terms of, you know, a little bit of a lack of consistency here and there, maybe not always showing us their best and really needing to make sure that they get that playoff spot locked down, that they're not leaving themselves open to attack from those lower teams. So lots to play for for both of them. Mm, both played this map in the last three weeks. As mentioned, both won it as well. G2, probably the scariest stat to take into this game is their 5-0 and zero on this map in 2024. They love it. Equally, so do Wolves. Not quite the same sort of success record, but no doubt plenty of tape for both teams to have on each other coming in towards this game. And that might be why you're seeing things like the Grim Van coming out from G2. Not exactly a go-to standard van. Occasionally creeps his way through, but just the overwhelming of the bees looking down in towards base from Pillar. That's why you're seeing them, that van come away. So I imagine, Tim, we're going to see a lot of things coming out here, like the Ying really taking over the map, especially in the base and Execute, which of course invites things like the Warden on the other side. So keep a close eye out for that little dance between those operators where they're playing in any of these given rounds. We'll see how things go because fans are done, Tim, and that means our last game of the day is about ready to start. Let's get things underway then. It's going to be G2 versus Wolves to wrap up what has been a fantastic evening of Siege. A little bit of both. Uh, teams being dominant in those first couple of games and then a real close affair between BBS and Virtus Pro sets us up nicely for what could prove to take the title of game of the day here if both of these two teams show up on Oregon. So we're going to kick things off with Wolves on the defense. It's going to be down in the basement. We've got P4 on the Warden. Probably going to be a fairly constant pick given that Ying is available. Obviously, mm. the defenders don't know which attackers are going to be coming along. So you kind of got to just uh, pull the trigger on the warden every time, I think, just to be sure. Ward is always considered quite a strong operator, to be yeah. fair. Even when you aren't seeing a Ying on board, you often see him brought along regardless because when teams don't play, I mean, even with the rim play, you're seeing the exact same thing come out here. Look on G2's side of the screen, how many flashes they're bringing in this round. You don't need Candelas to full white screen people when you've got 12 flashes of which you can basically throw four at the same time. They can be really overwhelming. And where I think we've seen a lot of success back at SI, and it leans in towards why G2 are currently our second best attacking team in EU, comes down to the use of things like these flashbangs. The problem is, Tim, they're coming up against the team with the highest defensive win rate overall in EU. So that's at 80%. Walls are no slouches at dealing with teams that can attack. So it's kind of one of those, 
Unstoppable forces, immovable objects. Who Bring walks away? The loser and Doki's posted a bond too. Doki and Deadshot, no idea. Almost into a third as well, but not quite going to find his man. P4 should be able to slip away here. But my God, has Doki just taken a knife to the back of Wolves, Tim? Yeah, G2 really awake at the start of this one. We saw Alamo getting that early damage done onto um, the person peeking out of armory with Sindoki then doubling up and getting a couple of kills. Uh, and this is this is really strong stuff from G2 to kick things off. And straight away, Wolves find themselves with only three left alive, having to sort of hole up inside a site. And there's more than a minute 30 left to go. This is a long time to try and hold on, but there's not much else mm. that Wolves can do. They can't can't be aggressive now. They can't really take the fight to G2. They're just going to have to wait um, and see what G2 bring to them on the attack. G2, meanwhile, have got all the time in the world to open hatches, to posture, and to make sure that they're in the right position before that final push. I mean, they couldn't really do much in general against the Decavian Alliance coming out, but the drop comes in. They found themselves two kills already. Who knows what the hell is going on? He can see nothing. The FNAT's really coming in clutch here, and suddenly, Tim, a 5v2 has gone down to a round loss. Oh man, Wolves just snapping its shot on them for G2, as you said to me, had a minute and a half to play with, but Hail Marying it through the hatch, and they pay the price. Yeah. Um... <laughs> that happened. Mm, okay. Um, yeah, G2, I've got to, I've got to be critical there to say, you know, don't get me wrong. You know, sometimes a little bit of a push, a little bit of aggression, it wins. It, you know, it, it works. It gets you the round. But you've got a minute thirty. You're opening hatches. You've got drones. You've got utility. If they're playing behind all those things there. I just can't help but see that they win the round. You know, I can't see any other way that that goes. But instead, just dropping the hatch, it's like they didn't know there was somebody at Pillar because Benja just dies immediately, of course, because there's somebody stood at Pillar. And then the swing from the ward, and they just, there was nobody then there able to trade it, nobody able to do anything. And I just think, you know, it's round one. It's not the end of the world, but it just feels a little bit haphazard, a little bit silly from G2. And what really gets me is, again, we were speaking about the number Five of flashes they brought along in that round designed to overwhelm. They had the Decabian and the Lion for the roam yeah, to force the Wolves back to sight. Bottom. And of course, they did wonderfully. They got those two entries. They had a minute and a half to play against two players. They had the whole world laid out before them, but just could not coordinate and close. Very perplexing. I can guarantee that the uh, group chat of all working on the show definitely lit up like a firework there as soon as that round went the way that it did. We'll see, of course, if fortunes can change here in round two. Starting things out, Bowley is clearing his way through a few drones, not going to find himself bit off the backside either as a result. So at least for now, playing a little more free. But do know that you're going to see G2 slowly enrapturing in here, closing in anyone that might be playing a bit too far out. Cheeky angle from Virtue, not going to find his man. Going to really try to hard challenge onto that master door from behind the shield. He's going to give the position up, drop back into pit, and just play it from a slightly longer angle there, Morkley. Keep mm. himself um, alive a little bit later. They don't want to be giving anything away. They were three versus five last time. They'll count themselves lucky to have won the round, I think, overall. And not for a G2 mistake, I think that might not have been the case. So Wolves this time not wanting to lose that entry death quite so quickly. Um, instead, we're going to have the pressure now being mounted by G2 as they manage to take over Trophy going in there behind Flashes and it's going to be tricky now for Wolves to play inside of Pit. I'm really making news here with Virtue on the Deimos. Of course, he's not the go-to entry. He's not normally the guy you see charging and looking for kills. So here, it is much more about making use of the information game that comes out of the Deimos. They tried one. It failed onto the mute initially. The second one to the Solus did connect. And here, Ben just starting to work his way through. He's found himself one. Doki into another two. G2 starting to gain some ground here, Tim. Bibu does push forward, though. Looks to get aggressive. And he just to find one before dipping his way back into sight. Diffuser is down, will be collected now. Leaves us three versus three, but it's dead shot to pick up Dorky with a nice headshot. And this site is so defensible with three of your left, especially if you have the advantage. Alamo and Virtue, they're going to have to get something going. They're both kind of on the same side at the minute. Maybe it's a difficult one. Push separately, make them look opposite directions, but then you're not in a position to be able to impact on each other's deaths. It's not going to be an easy finish for them. 45 seconds, so they do at least have time on their side for now. Alamo was below there trying to spray someone out inside a kid's bedroom, but can simply find nobody. 
going to have to try and recover this round somehow. Right sort of idea here in the challenge up towards bedroom. But there's a second player holder side of trophy. Virtue's got to be really careful as he tries to round his way through here. Ready and waiting. He knows that there's no okay. doubt someone in behind that shield. But he's managed to get the cross in Tim. He's stuck his way through. But finally he falls down to Bibbo on armory stairs. Nalamau can do nothing but stare skyward thinking, well, what now? The questions will always be around this, you know, why is he sat down here staring at a single vertical angle when Virtue fighting for his life trying to get the diffuser back? Oh, by does go top floor, manages to find one. As you say, unlikely to find another. He's going to air jab off with five seconds left to go. I'm not sure that that's the play. Alamau goes looking for another kill, finds one. Can't get his last man at that point. Wolves decide, yep, you know what? We're out of here. Um, there's going to be no more giving G2 the opportunity to close out the round. I really panicked for a second. I was like, why is the air jabbing the yeah. door? Like, I get it. You don't want to get flanked on, but you've seen the clock, right? Right? Uh, but ultimately, they wouldn't have had time, I think, to flank onto him either way. Almost gets it off as well. Bibu, if he'd really overpicked that one, would have been paying the price. And G2 in for a timeout extremely early on, Tim, because uh, I get it. They've been giving away some real good commanding situations here or just not playing as a team. Like I mentioned, Virtue and Alamo completely on different pages there about what was going on. And with Alamo as the IGL, he should really be the one coordinating those efforts rather than staring at a ceiling for the rest of the round. Absolutely, and it is a, a very quick tactical timeout coming in. Uh, so obviously not happy with how things have gone so far. Managing to not throw away two rounds, but certainly that first round, you've got to ask big questions as we did at the time. Um, you know, there's, there's going to be some corrective action discussed there from G2, I'm certain of it, um, because they can't just be sort of full sending it like that when they've got everything they need to push forward. Um, and again, a, a difficult one for them there. They did get into trophy early, but then they just allowed these flanks to happen and just never really, uh, you know, secured that control. Well, I hope after a tap timeout, we see a very different style of G2 coming out here in round three. Now we go to the offside. This is the best time to come away the winner. I'll come back again to what Fresh was talking about on a previous EU play day. Oregon becomes quite predictable. Or in fact, no, I like wasn't on a play day. I want to say it was his own stream, actually. Oh, no, I've admitted to watching Fresh's stream. I've screwed myself there. But he was talking about how realistically you expect defenders to win downstairs, expect to win top floor, and the offside is where they attackers then win. Rinse and repeat four times over, and that tends to be the flow of a game of Oregon. And so far, it has started out that way. If G2 come in on here, we are on course to have that 4-2 half that many come to expect when on this map. What I do like from G2 is that we're finally seeing that Ying come along. I am all for saying, let's run 12 flashes, and that's our alternative to a Ying. When she's banned, when she's available, you can do a lot with one operator. You can bring her out along a lot of other utilities, such as these smokes, the EMPs, whatever else you might need to get the job done. And so I like it. They have got a change up intact. We've got Uno on the Monty, really trying to uh, force things up here behind the Monty as being their spearhead in this attack. Yeah, definitely a, a different setup here from G2, recognising that there's been some problems. I'd expect Doki to try and open this wall um, pretty quickly. There is somebody on the other side of it. I think they might be aware of that, just with the way that they're shaping up. Benja just dipping himself back from that challenge. And there we go, that comes the Selma, which is going to force Bibu off that angle. Right sort of idea. The first call coming out as well. Should You'd hope at least keep some at bay, but Bibu is moving quite freely at this point. I don't know if he's had a chance to go through a jammer. So might find himself a little bit exposed here with G2 with the right sort of idea. Keeping things nice and simple though. Want this Monty in. Scott free. Opening up the second part of this wall here to get their march on forwards. And really, with two minutes on the clock, they can still engineer this out the way they want. I just worry, Tim, that they're leaving so much map control in, the, in favor of walls here. But they can play these on angles if they want and just torch them from there. Yeah, exactly that. I'm not really sure what the uh, the plan is for getting a plant down at the minute. Uno is there in the corner, um, but the Ying is not with them. So it's not like they can just flash everybody out, for example. They're going to need to deal with these operators. Uno goes to drop the shield. Can he find a kill? Yes, he can. But there's two coming in for Wolves. Make that three as Mowgli finds the impact okay. nade finish onto the Monte. And again, G2's ideas have just crumbled in front of them. One versus four. Deadshot picking up Alamo. And this is not likely to be anything other than a complete defensive sweep for Wolves. And that's exactly what will happen. 3-0. Three, three, three rounds on the bounce. And I mentioned, you know, G2's punishment here might be that they haven't got a lot of map control and Wolves exploit it to the max. That flank coming up basement, even with the air jab in place, just goes to show you can't always rely on the air jabs to do the work for you. And they get the punishment off on the flank as well. The insight plays too. Fantastic stuff. 
And Virtue's the one forced to try and make something happen by coming back down Armory Stairs. Just a little bit too direct to sight there, fear. but Wolves have played the game before them. They've played the map very, very well and have really made use of that control. So no win after attack timeout, Tim. Now we go back down to the basement. This could be a concern. It definitely could be. Um, you know, you, you know, after you win that third choice side, um, you're now looking at a position where Wolves are thinking, we could have five defenses here. You know, even if we lose the third choice side on the second attempt, we're still going to go 5-1. They're going to expect to lock out basement and to lock out dorms. The question for me, or the, the point that G2 need to prove here, is they made a mistake in round one. They had a great start. They were five versus three. My concern for G2 is they're not going to get as good a start this time. It's unlikely that Doki goes in and just picks up a double to start the round off, and they're five versus three with all the time in the world. That's probably not going to be the case. Wolves aren't going to allow that to happen again. And if that's not the case, have G2 got what it takes in the locker to be able to get this round? round done or do Wolves close it out a little bit easier than they did last time? This here we are seeing that Ying outside. They know I keep on like sticking all the cards on the Ying. It's not bad pick it. It's, it's not always that straightforward. I said we've seen them try a couple of things and even here there's nine flashes on side once again. So there is a lot of ability to overwhelm. The one thing I'm looking at here and I'm a little bit concerned about Tim is the mirror. That's on side for P4. And knowing the kind of disruptive play that we've seen coming out of walls, like Mowgli, your warden is up pushing on green. Okay, that's the thing. Really trying to find out drones more than anything else here and slow them down. But if Alamal falls here, they could be in real trouble in trying to deal with those mirror windows because they have no smokes on side to play behind, for example. No Twitch has come along to help get rid of them either. And so everything rides on Alamo here. He has to be the one to get in a good position to chew them away. And they've already lost their hard breach. That is a stinger because how many hatches are opened up at this point, Tim? Anything else that's left, they can get one open. They've got a second. I think they'll be okay. Ben just should be able to get the last one, but that could have been horrible for them. Yeah, it certainly could have gone wrong quickly there, but as you say, they will be able to have all three open, which is what they're going to need. But we still can't ignore the fact that the entry kill has gone to Wolves. The manpower is now in their advantage. Basement is a, a tough site to take off defenders when they've got more men than you because you can't really use any verticals. You can't move them around other than coming down and fighting them laterally. And if they've got the man over, they can just hold more angles. They're going to take away the mirror, which is going to allow Alamau a little bit more freezer uh, freedom if he wants to get in there and play from that side but one minute 15 wolves they've got themselves locked down at this point they're just waiting for the storm to arrive benji really becomes that man here with all these candelas in back pocket as well like we've got alamo doing all the work getting rid of the mirrors and doing a I want to say a good job with it overall. I didn't see if that second one got caught out by one of the Wamai magnets. But you're looking towards Benji here to make this one happen. It's down to those candelas. It's down to the dump. And it's the EE1Ds coming out as well. It's going to be a flood in towards the site. Certainly looks that way. Benja is going to be just on top of that hatch. Down go the Candelas. More likely to have success with this because they've dealt with Pillar this time. However, it's Mowgli on the Warden that's there and still waiting for the drop as it doesn't come after the Candela. He's going to save the glasses. They go back on as Shinka manages to find Dorky. Mowgli needs to be careful from rear stage stairs. Doesn't want to give himself away. Goes in and gets almost a freebie onto Virtue. And it's falling apart for G2 here. This could be a flawless round. It is indeed. And that's Wolves 4-0 punishing G2 right now. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. They don't know the left hand from the right at this point, Tim. It's absolutely crumbling. And I think someone's got a few words to say. Fabian, what you got for us? Yeah. I mean, if you look at that last execute, right? They're in a 4 versus 5, and they're trying to do a utility execute into their opponents. They know they're coming, so there's no surprises whatsoever. They lose that round. First round on basement attack, they are five versus three manpower advantage. And at that point, they go with no utility to try to do a surprise attack on the basement. Where is the logical sense in this? There is absolutely none. G2 have lost all of their win conditions, and they're not figuring out the new ones, and they keep messing up round after round, and it's not looking good for them. Thank you very much, Fabi. And it's one of those I'm looking at too. I'm thinking even with the tag timeout coming in early on, it's on the boys to figure this one out. And often a criticism levied against G2 is when Alamau is not being that on-form IGL, the one leading the boys through the troublesome times, it's very hard for them to get back on track. And I don't want to put all the blame on him here. It's a team game after all, but we are seeing the team, as Fabian said, just making these really logical decisions and crumbling when it looks like they should be thriving, Tim. Five seconds. 
seconds yeah, remaining. Yeah, they should. Uh, it, it, there's been rounds that they absolutely should have won. There's been yeah, rounds that, you know, we can't just all put it on G2, you know, sort of throwing the rounds away. Wolves have been setting themselves up well. They've been taking advantage of mistakes. If they're going to be offered a flank, you better believe that Wolves are going to take it and they're going to find some kills from it. So, uh, you know, on the positive side, Wolves really are winning uh, these rounds and taking them away from G2 at the same time. So G2 here in round five, going to be attacking onto Doams this time. And again, last time it was kind of a close round. It was back and forward, but it was the round that I was referring to where BB was just allowed to play through Master Closet, pick up a kill, dip back inside a site and just level things up at three versus three on site. And then Wolves were just able to sort of win out by attrition at that point. And you picked up on it. Alamo, Virtue not really working together in the 2v3. And so I'm just looking for some better cohesion, better teamwork from G2. And as Fabian said, some better decision making overall. I mean, you started by not losing someone too early on. You're bringing a lion, you're bringing a decay beyond side. Like, you have the tools here to suppress the would-be roamers from shooting you in the back or catching you off guard here. That's what started out so well for them in round one. I know Doki got the 2k in towards kitchen by pushing into dining, but it was off the back of the call coming in from the Decay and really starting to light things up for them. We started strong and we can do so again. They're really going hunting here. Piranha's pit being opened up in kitchen by Alamar, but simply not going to find his man. Shinka is down to half HP. EE1Ds are coming out. Scans are coming on through. But once more, keep an eye on Doki with those Candelas because that should be the utility focus execute that we need. And he's gone with all four Candelas in back pocket. What a pickup from Deadshot on the entry there. Finding the headshot onto Dorky. Alamau, I was just going to say, is doing some great work below. He's making the defenders so uncomfortable inside a site, opening up so many of those key spots. But at the minute, they just haven't been able to get anything out of it. I always say this, what are you getting for your utility? And the skeleton key is utility in itself. What are you getting for it so far? Nothing. G2 are giving it away for free. P4 picks up Alamo with the shot here. That's going to leave us now. Five versus three. And it's looking dire for G2 at the moment. We'll be rounding himself in as well. Right sort of idea. It's going to force him away. And Benja runs straight into the waiting arms of the enemy team. It's crumbling here. It's one by one. G2 are just falling apart. Deadshot really fancied his chances for a second on towards Virtue. He's been penned in by two players down here as well. So you've got one rocket challenge around satellite windows slash bottom of white stairs. One on double window and that's all they've got. Deadshot will hit the deck. Not bad Changing for Uno, max. but they've got to convert the round somehow to him. And against four, with 20 seconds on the clock, it feels impossible. <laughs> yeah, it certainly does. Uno's going to pick up Morkley there, so that leaves them effectively two versus three. But oh, they're taking shots from above every angle, yeah, being utilised by Wolves here, and that is why this site can be so difficult to aggress Five onto if there are more men alive than you have, because they can just use so many angles against you. And that is exactly what Wolves take advantage of. Five zero i doubt that wolves could have dared to dream of a start like this they probably came into this thinking they were in for a real battle des and it's no wonder that the wolves players are smiling and happy away because right now the game is a landslide in their favor as much as g2 are absolutely crumbling on the attacking side again we can't ignore that stat line from earlier wolves 80 percent attack rate they beat that here in this game so far. If they lose this next round, they're still above that point. And that will push them into the mid-80s compared to everyone else in the competition. For comparison about how different it is here between two teams, one at the top, one at the bottom, Wild are on a 37% defensive win rate. Wolves have more than doubled that. They are very, very good at defending in Rainbow Six Siege. On the attacking side, a few questions maybe to be asked. We'll see what happens on the second half. But with G2 this out of sorts right now, I think even when things flip over, it could still be a very similar story. And dare I say it, Tim, we could be in for Wolves 7-0 over G2. 10 seconds remaining. Oh, we definitely could. Let's not get ahead of, ahead of ourselves Five just yet. There's two rounds for G2 to stop that from happening. But honestly, with the attacks that we've seen so far, I think it might be time for G2 to surrender, Des. You know what is a bit crazy? G2 have only got one game to play after this, and that's tomorrow. They have the last day of the stage off. Yep. They don't have a chance to get any points. They play against Wild tomorrow. They might, they might have the playoffs off at this rate. 
Well, they will. That's it. As it currently stands, they are in seventh place and not making it to the playoffs because Fnatic won earlier on. Wolves, if they win this game, push themselves way up towards 11, for example. And G2's round difference is taking an absolute hammering in this game. Like, I cannot stress enough that all those okay, it's a few rounds, one, whatever. It's a write-off, it's three points. No, that round difference is the main tiebreaker and it will mean a world of difference when it comes round to that final play day, regardless of where G2 might finish. They need something from this game, Tim. Otherwise, we have Manchester without G2 and Alamal has been caught fast asleep. Like, how does this even happen? What? Like, two players are pushing towards basement, hunted him down. He's had no idea it's coming, completely unsupported. And now he's down as well. This is a car crash for G2. I'd be interested to see um, who he'd been tracking at that time uh, and, and where the sort of um, information was coming from because, of course, when Deimos tracks uh, an enemy player, his location is given away as well. So it just shows, again, good comms, good teamwork um, from Wolves. It may well be that Deadshot was the one being hunted. It may not. He may well have been getting fed that information from another. This is just... It's, it's turning into men against boys. There's, there's, there's not even any any contest in a lot of these gunfights. You know, wolves are just popping up from all over the place, taking absolute freebies one, one after another. And Deadshot's going to have another. He could well find himself oh. two. He does get closed <laughs> down, but it doesn't matter because he just beats him into a double nitro from Mowgli. Six zero. Wolves already on map point. It just feels like they've got eyes in every single wall there, Wall Starting down in the basement, finding Alamal, the double C4 at the end, just everything was orchestrated so ridiculously well. What a half that's been. Six rounds in a row. I know it's Oregon. I know it's the defensive side, but against a team like G2, again, second best attacking team in all of EUL right now, they have absolutely crumbled before the French side. I think G2 will get a few rounds here on the defense. Do I think they're going to get a six? Do I think they're going to get a six in a row? Absolutely not. No chance. Um, you know, I, I'll write it off now and I will eat my words. I, I will watch the clips me, back of me saying that if G2 run it all the way back in. <laughs> With the way that they've played so far, and this, I don't say that because of the score. I say it because of the way that G2 have played. They have made so many fundamental mistakes, so many silly decisions that I would be astounded if they are able to turn it round into a flawless defensive half. Are they capable yeah, of getting some rounds? Of course they are. They have to take one at a time at the minute, but are they capable Five of running six back to back with the way things have been so far? I'm not Attack sure that that is going to be the case. Just bonkers. Uh, honestly, I expect them to get absolutely cheese the pants off here in this round. Looking at it, yeah, it's in the basement. Ying on side, Kapital on side. In case of Zamira, we've got a Twitch as well. They've just got everything they need to feel to deal with this round. They can get rid of all the Goyos early on, then get rid of the Fnats, for example. Wolves are coming with the right set of tools here. This is looking dangerous, I'll tell you that now, though. There's two players looking for a double swing out here, and Uno almost lost his life there. Shield gone. I imagine they'll be forced to back away. But at this point, G2, they don't want any of that smoke, Tim. They've backed off. No, I like that G2 have read into the possibility um, of Wolves being 6-0 up and thinking, bring a shield, brute force Trade into elbow, and just like you say, try and cheese the round. I like they've read into that, and they've brought the U utility uh, to challenge it. It's something that we used to see in, in LATAM back in, I'm talking 2020 when I was casting um, at the back end there. It used to be Cyber at the time. Always used to play the Tachanka, the old Tachanka with the turret, but he'd put the shield there on the door, put the turret behind it, and he'd just hold anybody out of bunker. Um, so, you know, to see Alamau involved in bringing that along, getting the shield on the bunker there, is not too much of a surprise. It's from his home region that we used to see it years ago, and it's done it it's job it's really backed wolves off we got rid of the shield and just thought you know what we'll leave this one it's not worth trying to crack it with the utility that we've got instead putting their efforts into the rest of the map getting all these hatches opened up for example making sure there are no roamers around not the right sort of thing because there are none left here chewing through barbed wire for example again making sure that sight is as ready for them as could be the key one for me is dead shot he's only just thrown out his shot drone mind you and that needs to be getting out on the field here and looking to get rid of as many of those goyo canisters as possible and that's going to be two of them gone as the Rotero drone goes down and claims both of them inside a freezer. We also see the main lobby as well. One left to go. That will be taken down. So the path is clear for Wolves at least. The majority of utility has gone. The one thing they don't have so far, Des, is kills. They haven't managed to find anybody yet. 55 seconds left to go and that could prove a real sticking point for them. 
I really don't think they care to. They've done all the setup for the balls they need to. They've got rid of bulletproofs, barbed wires, shields, Goyo canisters. They've chewed through as much as they can, including trying to get rid of those my magnets as well. So here they can start trying to just dump utility in, working their way through. This could be massive for them, but the drop behind them is going to be the big one. Watch dead shot at the top of the screen here with Mowgli. In they come. Mowgli hits the deck. Dead shot hits the deck. They've cleaned them up at this point, Tim. They've held on well. Only one left standing, and G2 are going to hold on for a flawless round. It was all about that drop, and they read them like a book. Yep, G2 were well prepared for that. They got themselves set up despite all the utility being cleared. They knew what was going to come and they were able to get the job done flawlessly. And I mean, what a difference. What a difference between G2 on defense and G2 on attack that we have just seen. They just looked calm. They made good decisions. They read into what Wolves was going to do. And all of a sudden, they look like the G2 that we expected to play into this game. I'll stand by what I said. Are they going to win six rounds back to back? I don't think that's going to be the case. But come and prove me wrong. Get it. Uh, get another one and another one and another one. Third choice site. This is a gamble. Oh. Okay. All right. <laughs> yes. Very apt. Never surrender, boys. You've only got five more rounds to go. It's a big climb to keep things going, but we're trying the offsite here now. This is a spicy one. Not really opposed to trying something a little bit different and mixing things up. You'll have to play the sites at some point, no doubt. But rather than playing off towards meeting that it feels has been growing in popularity, it's off towards this dining side. Instead, Tim, I feel like I haven't seen the classic execute on here for a while. I'm thinking about Thermite up, for example, in Small Tower, getting things opened up. But Wolves aren't going to even bother with that. Instead, got themselves a very different style of setup coming in here. Instead, the only R breach coming along is going to be that ace. There's going to be a fight over top floor, I would expect, uh, given the lineup, particularly the book on side. Try and get P4 in there, working through kid storms and dorms, opening up the ceiling above, force them out of kitchen, maybe go for a little plant on kitchen to meeting wall, maybe go for a little plant on kitchen door, rather than trying to play it into dining. It's all going to depend whether they can get that top floor control or not. They don't have any hard breach at all, so if I was going to say if Attic's been reinforced, they won't be able to get in through there. It hasn't, so that is at least going to give them a method of ingress to get in towards pit and be able to start pressuring these top four players. Now at least Mowgli's found himself dug downstairs and if they at least managed for now seeing one slip through. I think it's Uno dancing his way around here as well. Has to be careful at this point because I don't think he realised there was a player still hanging in behind him. Of course they'll have a good idea of where he was with the phone call ringing out of the back of it but he's in a spot here we could get pinched unless he wants to drop away and drop away he shall back down into the basement. Now, where does he reappear? Multiple sets of stairs to work on through. It looks like it'll be freezer up towards Zulu. Maybe want to try and catch someone here out towards the backside of things. Right idea. But can they find anyone? Oh, oh Mowgli almost found one, but he misses the shots. Finally manages to find Benja as he rounds in towards Zulu. G G2 trying to play with a bit too much freedom, Tim. Yeah, I'd like, oh, there we go. Mowgli's going to be taken down in the trade. Alamo picks him up. Shinka's still on board. One Selma used, but they're going to need more because they need to clear out meeting. They need to get themselves into a position to be able to plant, and that might mean just opening that wall up. It isn't reinforced between kitchen and meeting, but it's the rear stage wall particularly that they might want to take down Dorky gives himself away P4 is going to pick up the kill big advantage here for Wolves and they're looking to get this close but they still haven't won that fight over top floor I don't really understand why G2 are so locked into this they're so keen to come swinging in and Wolves are like hey you're not defending top floor fully you've got a reinforcement set up downstairs sure that means top floor's a bit easier to cut through like Swiss cheese Tim and they picked him off one at a time Virtue's down to being the last man it might not be a 7-0 but my god does it feel like it Tim oh, this is going to take a real hero moment now they know that he's in green as well you can see as Bibu's just quick peeking around the corner he's just waiting for that support 30 seconds Wolves just need to get either side of him here and that's exactly what they're going to do Shinka moves around the corner but Bibu he goes too soon they give him virtue the opportunity to hear the challenge comes in he's going to have to make his way back into sight as Shinka looks to put that diffuser down Deadshot's on the cover and Deadshot finds the kill he closes out what has been an emphatic victory for Wolves completely shutting G2 down 7-1 what a result for the French side and a sorely wanted one by them that puts them straight up into third place here jumping ahead of Team Secret 
and they're going to absolutely enjoy these last couple of days where they have a chance to push into even second spot potentially tim it's going to be explosive and a lot of questions will obviously come about g2 from this game we did not see the g2 that we've seen at previous tournaments or in previous stages a very very different affair but you can't take it away from walls they've played a very good game there they defended well they've attacked even better arguably in that second half and they've got it done Absolutely, they smashed them to pieces. There's no other way of putting it. Wolves have come in with a game plan. It's worked perfectly, and G2 have helped them out by making some bad decisions along the way and, you know, not really utilising everything they've got in their hands. Um, but, yeah, a great night for Wolves. They're going to be very happy with that, I've no doubt. They will have expected a tougher game. It didn't come for them, but 7-1, what a result. I imagine there's going to be a host and two ex-G2 members of staff that are going to be scathing on the desk. Let's go over to them now and get their thoughts. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ace and Des, for all the casting today, of course, as well. You know, three times clubhouse, not necessarily easy, um, but you made it easy to listen to for sure. Yes, Wolves, back-to-back -back seven watts for them. Absolutely amazing. Oh, it was incredible from them. Yep. We, you know, we challenged them to step up onto Oregon. That's exactly what they did. Back-to-back -back seven ones, I think. Wolves looked very, very lost about 10, 15 days ago yep. as a team. And they came back and they've now come back with two back to back incredible Reloading. team performances. Not just Mowgli, not just Deadshot. Sure, those guys had good games, but actually, Bibu, P4, Shinka, they were all stepping up in their own way yep. as well. And they operated as a team. That's the Wolves that me and you love, Fabian. That's the Wolves that me and you will talk about forever. Yeah, I mean, we did that last stage. I think every single game last stage, you and me said, we love this Wolves. We love this Wolves. We love this Wolves. And this stage has been, where are our Wolves? Where have they gone? <laughs> where have, have they they've gone to a new territory? We don't know. Now we have the Wolves back in the park and they're playing ball. They are. I mean, looking especially with this matchup that was ahead of them today, they started out on the defense. And like you said with the call-in, right? You'll expect to win those first two rounds, yep. then maybe lose that tertiary bomb side. But G2 exactly. really were struggling to find anything today. I mean, they weren't finding anything because they were making so many individual mistakes. And I think that they tilted halfway through that defense or their attacks. Because what what Wolves did there, they, they, they had two and three that's in the first round. And it was like, why have they reinforced the entire CC wall? And then they're dropping kids hatch yeah. and they're running straight into Doki. And I'm like, okay, so Wolf looks really lost in his first round. And then G2 just tries to surprise them when they've already gotten the two entry kills in surprise. What are you doing? I have no idea. Wolves, however, they came back, they played good together, they played with each other, and they played off each other. And it paid off. You said G2 tilted halfway through. Yeah. I think they tilted maybe after that first round. It could have very well happened. Honestly, I mean, they got handed a gift. They got yeah. handed two, not just one, two entry kills on a silver platter. Yep. Loki stood in dining, finds two kills onto Deadshot and Mowgli. And cool. G2, let's just win a five versus three. What do they do? They draw. They, they don't drone sight and they just all drop. And then they execute with utility in a four versus five three rounds later. It's like you're yeah. doing it completely wrong way. You shouldn't have done that at all. But we have to praise Wolves for what how they played. Oh, they, yeah. They Great. looked like a team that communicated and coordinated with each other. And this, what we saw is like, take that double C4. They bait the G2 into that. So it, it's, it's small, small things that Wolves improved on, but they look a lot better. And we should be really happy for Wolves. However, G2, I mean, at this point, you can just pick up me and Fresh to play even because... <laughs> I mean, Last time you said terrible. that, they did pick you up. Yeah, but that was the coach. <laughs> I'm already taken there. Maybe I can play in one team, coach one, and cast an EUL. All right, I see. No. It's been good for Wolves, of course, to have you two be so happy about this. On the other hand, G2, thank you for having my two endless with their hands in their hair currently with what's going on. And usually after a game, we have a player highlight. We're going to yeah. try something different, Fabian. You'll guide us through it. So player highlights are usually what we bring up. But I've done a player slash team low light, I guess. Here you go. Uh, you have five players on my low light. And honestly, I'm just appalled with their entire game plan or their approach to it. I don't know what they were doing. We could have brought any of the Wolves players up here because I think that they had a really good game. All of them, they played really good off each other. But what the hell were G2 up to? All their win conditions completely out the window. They played individually and they lost their round to duels, which then led on to Wolves taking back the rounds and completely dominating them. I think G2 were absolutely domesticated today and they were just, yeah, in the bin. In the bin, unfortunately, for, for G2. But I believe we get to speak to a man who would be very happy about that result from this game, as I believe we have Bibu on the line. Good evening. You get a back-to-back 7-1. -back that must be amazing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, good evening too. Uh, yeah, of, of course, it's amazing. Six points, 14-2 uh, uh, in a round. So yeah, feeling pretty great and we play great. So nothing more.
Yeah, good to hear. Of course, last week during the interview, we had your coach here. They said you were very happy about having an extra day to prepare for G2. How was your preparation for today? Um, I mean, like uh, every everyone, like uh, against every enemy team, like it's just we had one more day. And in these schedules where sometimes you have two games, uh, it's, it's better to have a, one more day of practice when you need to uh, work on communication strategies, prepare some stuff sometimes. And um, also preparing a, a really good, strong team that we know that have uh, good staff and they can prepare also. So uh, having one more day, it's always a, a bonus and we take it uh, very, uh, very good. Bibu, the last time I spoke to you was when you scraped over the line with that victory against Virtus Pro on Oregon. You went back oh, yeah. there again today. Um, what did you change? Because this game today was a lot cleaner than the last time. Um, I mean, since like the, the beginning of the league and now, like uh, we work a lot on our communication and playing together. I heard this on some videos that you and Fabian were trying to find the whole wolf playing together, like the team play and stuff like that. And that we were missing that. We we knew it. We we spotted it. And so we were. It was our main focus because we know that uh, we have some good gunners, but we are not the team like you know known because we have like the best gunner on on every wall, but we. We get known because we had a good team play and we could coordinate everything on every map. So that was our main focus and always work on the communication, like I said, because it was not clear. So yeah, maybe too much energy sometimes. So we, we fixed that and now we, we are back to, at our top form. Do you think, it, it, in a way, it feels for me a little bit like you guys when you were in Atlanta, right? You was kind of, you were struggling a little bit in Atlanta and then you just re-found yourselves again and you became this top team. Obviously, it didn't quite pay out because you, mm. you ended up going out in playoffs, but is it similar, I guess? Yeah, kind of, kind of, yeah. We, in Atlanta, it was also like we didn't play our game. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, today in, in New York, it was more like, um, I mean, this past days was more about, uh, we played our game, but not correctly and not with the clear and good communication we, we used to have. So it was kind of different, but at the end, like it's the same thing that we were not ourselves, totally ourselves, and we fixed that to to become ourselves and just play as as we know and as as good as we know. So yeah, that was kind of the same. Yeah, it's good to see that really in that knowledge of what's been going wrong for you guys and what you can do to change that. Um, but of course, after this victory, anything you want to say to the fans? Feel free to do it in French as well if you want. <laughs> no, it's okay. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the fans. Thanks to Wolves. Um, I mean, every day they are supporting us. Thanks uh, to everyone sending us message. Thanks to you for the interview. Thanks to the casters for the cast. And for the analysis, days, Fabian, I don't forget you. Uh, have a good night and see you soon. Awesome. Thank you so much for the kind words. Always very polite. Have a great night and we'll speak to you very soon. Thank you. I love speaking to people. Yeah. He's always so honest, but he yeah. always thanks everybody that needs to be thanked. Yeah, it's really sweet. Like, very good in-depth of what's been going on, but also, indeed, like, that really nice wholesomeness that he's got around him. But that concludes our final game of the day. We have standings, and I think a lot has changed with a few teams. Fabian, if you could please take us through it. No, I won't, Dan. Sorry. I just refuse to. <laughs> okay, let's get back on that. BDS at the top of the scoreboard. Obviously, we all expected this. They just keep chugging games, and they keep taking over and dominating. It's just what we expected. Into the Breach have now climbed up to the second spot, which is looking really good for them, and something that I think is a bit of a surprise. At the same time, Wolves has also climbed up to the third spot on 11 points, and they've been looking really, really good the last two play days. Secret had a little bit of a fall off on 10 points. Fnatic is starting to resemble a team now, and I'm really happy to see that, nine points. And then we have Enz, who did not play today. They have fallen down quite far. After that, we have G2 on eight, and Virtus Pro and Wild, both on four points. It's now, it's now out of G2's hands, right? Whether they qualify into playoffs or not. I They've got to win their next game. Yeah. But actually, there are, there are teams above them that get two games. Yeah. They've got to hope that those teams lose, you know, Ents in particular that are right above them. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, it's not the team that should be in G2, there. by the way, sorry, G2 and VP. Potentially two of our three open qualifier teams. <laughs> the teams that finished third <laughs> <Yeah>. and fourth <laughs> at the World more. Championships, like, um, what, two yeah. months ago? Nah. Yeah, two of our SI attending teams. That's a bit of a shame to see that. I think our biggest droppers of today are probably Secret, you know, after not getting that win, um, dropping down pretty far down below, even though they were second. Ents as well, poor Ents didn't even get to defend themselves yeah. for that as well. They dropped from uh, third all the way to sixth. But of course, tomorrow they have a chance to get those points back and to get themselves back into or higher up the standings. We'll have a look at our broadcast schedule for tomorrow. We'll be back at 6 p.m. CEST with our first game of the day.
We'll be starting out with Fnatic versus Virtus Pro. Our second game will be Into the Breach taking on Secret. Then ends get to clinch back some points against the Wolves that is exactly in form as we're seeing right now. And then we're closing off the day between G2 and Wild. I think that might be a very tough matchup. Anything else that we're curious about in particular? I mean, we're looking... All right, quick summary. We're looking for Fnatic yep. to back up that performance that we Definitely. saw today but against VP that actually looked all right. Yep. ITB Secret is potentially a top two battle. Who the hell would have seen that? Nobody before this stage Ents started. Wolves. Ents have been, like, better against the French teams. They beat yep. BDS. They're against another French team. It's then, the smallest brother against the middle brother. And then the oh. bottom of the league. Yeah, I mean, it, that's literally a low off. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> I mean, like I said, G2 have to win it. Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean uh, they potentially couldn't. I mean, they, they, there are some clear things you can do against Wild. For example, Bandermonte. If they don't do that, and then they go to a map where Monte has big impact, I wouldn't be surprised if they somehow managed to lose it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to call the newspapers right now. Fabian said something bad about G2 after yeah, he put them that high on the power ranking. <laughs> That's crazy. Honestly, if, if I could be doing that power up. ranking... Oh, come on, uh, talk uh, So, me and Anna are sitting pretty. No, no, we've kind okay, of got, I see we, what it we, is. We're more or less the same, me and Anna. Oh, exactly no, the same. I know what it is. Talk look, through your power ranking. Look, Stop our me. producer, Tommy, he's mistaken that seven for... Uh, it was a one. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> you gave G2 oh, a 1.4. Yeah, I okay. gave G2 a 1.4. It was Fnatic oh. of a, a five instead of an eight. Yeah, you know, this is a production error. You guys can <laughs> look away from this. <laughs> Honestly, it's, it's all them. Anything you'd like to add to that for today? Of course, we just saw our power rankings. Uh, like you said, we're doing pretty decent, I think. We're pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, can we just but... go back Sorry. now and see? This, yeah. this is like winner's corner over yeah. here. That's loser's corner over there. All right, yeah. you, you want me to just take off my head and leave? Yep. All right, see you, see you tomorrow, guys. Bye. Right. We'll finish the show from here. Yeah, cool. Right, great. It was awesome having you on today. Thank you so much for all the wonderful analysis. And now you, you feeling today? You happy? Yeah, I'm very happy, Anne. I'm very happy. Um, today was great. Fabian got his power rankings wrong. G2 lost. He's, he's, he's about to literally go and cry in the club right now. We saw a lot of club outs <laughs> today. Didn't see any good maps. EOL teams, right? Tomorrow, Nighthaven Labs yes. only. All four, yep. please. Yes. Exactly. This is a written uh, request to all the Europe League teams playing tomorrow. We would really want to see United Haven Labs as it's not been played yet in Europe Leagues. Uh, we're on our knees basically praying at this point for you to bring it out tomorrow. So we're expecting that. Of course, we're expecting you to tune in tomorrow as well. We'll be back at 6 p.m. with our very first game. From now, thank you so much for watching. Have a great rest of your night.